Chapter One of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. Chapter One Characters. Mrs. Stanhope, a well bred woman accomplished in that branch of knowledge which is called the art of rising in the world, had, with but a small fortune, contrived to live in the highest company. She prided herself upon having established half a dozen nieces most happily, that is to say, upon having married them to men of fortunes far superior to their own. One niece still remained unmarried, Belinda Portman, of whom she was determined to get rid with all convenient expedition. Belinda was handsome, graceful, sprightly, and highly accomplished. Her aunt had endeavoured to teach her that a young lady's chief business is to please in society, that all her charms and accomplishments should be invariably subservient to one grand object, the establishing herself in the world. For this hands, lips, and eyes were put to school, and each instructed feature had its rule. Mrs. Stanhope did not find Belinda such a docile pupil as her other nieces, for she had been educated chiefly in the country. She had early been inspired with a taste for domestic pleasures. She was fond of reading, and disposed to conduct herself with prudence and integrity. Her character, however, was yet to be developed by circumstances. Mrs. Stanhope lived at Bath, for she had opportunities of showing her niece off, as she thought, to advantage. But as her health began to decline, she could not go out with her as much as she wished. After manoeuvring with more than her usual art, she succeeded in fastening Belinda upon the fashionable Lady Delacour for the season. Her ladyship was so much pleased by Miss Portman's accomplishments and vivacity as to invite her to spend the winter with her in London. Soon after her arrival in town, Belinda received the following letter from her aunt Stanhope. Crescent, Bath After searching every place I could think of, Anne found your bracelet in your dressing-table amongst a heap of odd things which you left behind you to be thrown away. I have sent it to you by a young gentleman who came to Bath, unluckily, the very day you left me, Mr. Clarence Hervey, an acquaintance and great admirer of my Lady Delacour. He is really an uncommonly pleasant young man, is highly connected, and has a fine independent fortune. Besides, he is a man of wit and gallantry quite a connoisseur in female grace and beauty, just the man to bring a new face into fashion. So, my dear Belinda, I make it a point, look well when he is introduced to you, and remember what I have so often told you, that nobody can look well without taking some pains to please. I see, or at least when I went out more than my health will at present permit, I used to see multitudes of silly girls, seemingly all cut out upon the same pattern, who frequented public places day after day and year after year without any idea farther than that of diverting themselves, or of obtaining transient admiration. How I have pitied and despised the giddy creatures, whilst I have observed them playing off their unmeaning airs, vying with one another in the most obvious, and consequently the most ridiculous manner, so as to expose themselves before the very men they would attract chattering, tittering, and flirting, full at the present moment, never reflecting upon the future, quite satisfied if they got a partner at a hall without ever thinking of a partner for life. I have often asked myself, what is to become of such girls when they grow old or ugly, or when the public eye grows tired of them? If they have large fortunes, it is all very well. They can afford to divert themselves for a season or two without doubt. They are sure to be sought after and followed, not by mere danglers, but by men of suitable views and pretensions. But nothing in my mind can be more miserable than the situation of a poor girl, who, after spending not only the interest, but the solid capital of her small fortune in dress and frivolous extravagance, fails in her matrimonial expectations, as many do merely, from not beginning to speculate in time. She finds herself at five or six-and-thirty a burden to her friends, 
destitute of the means of rendering herself independent, for the girls I speak of never think of learning to play cards, de trop in society, yet obliged to hang upon all her acquaintance, who wish her in heaven because she is unqualified to make the expected return for civilities, having no home, I mean, no establishment, no house, etc., fit for the reception of company of a certain rank. My dearest Belinda, may this never be your case. You have every possible advantage, my love. No pains have been spared in your education, and, which is the essential point, I have taken care that this should be known, so that you have the name of being perfectly accomplished. You will also have the name of being very fashionable, if you go much in public, as doubtless you will with Lady Delacour. Your own good sense must make you aware, my dear, that from her ladyship's situation and knowledge of the world, it will always be proper, upon all subjects of conversation, for her to lead and you to follow. It would be very unfit for a young girl like you to suffer yourself to stand in competition with Lady Delacour, whose high pretensions to wit and beauty are indisputable. I need say no more to you upon this subject, my dear. Even with your limited experience, you must have observed how foolish young people offend those who are the most necessary to their interests by an imprudent indulgence of their vanity. Lady Delacour has an incomparable taste in dress. Consult her, my dear, and do not by an ill-judged economy counteract my views. Apropos, I have no objection to your being presented at court. You will, of course, have credit with all her ladyship's tradespeople, if you manage properly. To know how and when to lay out money is highly commendable, for in some situations people judge of what one can afford by what one actually spends. I know of no law which compels a young lady to tell what her age or her fortune may be. You have no occasion for caution yet on one of these points." I have covered my old carpet with a handsome green baize, and every stranger who comes to see me, I observe, takes it for granted that I have a rich carpet under it. Say everything that is proper in your best manner for me to Lady Delacour. Adieu, my dear Belinda. Yours, very sincerely, Selina Stanhope. It is sometimes fortunate that the means which are taken to produce certain effects upon the mind have the tendency directly opposite to what is expected. Mrs. Stanhope's perpetual anxiety about her niece's appearance, manners, and establishment had completely worn out Belinda's patience. She had become more insensible to the praises of her personal charms and accomplishments than young women of her age usually are because she had been so much flattered and shown off, as it is called, by her matchmaking aunt. Yet Belinda was fond of amusement, and had imbibed some of Mrs. Stanhope's prejudices in favor of rank and fashion. Her taste for literature declined in proportion to her intercourse with the fashionable world, as she did not in this society perceive the least use in the knowledge that she had acquired. Her mind had never been roused to much reflection. She had, in general, acted but as a puppet in the hands of others. To her aunt Stanhope, she had hitherto paid unlimited, habitual, blind obedience. But she was more undesigning, and more free from affectation and coquetry than could have been expected after the course of documenting which she had gone through. She was charmed with the idea of a visit to Lady Delacour, whom she thought the most agreeable—no, that is too feeble an expression— the most fascinating person she had ever beheld. Such was the light in which her ladyship appeared, not only to Belinda, but to all the world, that is to say, all the world of fashion, and she knew of no other. The newspapers were full of Lady Delacour's parties, and Lady Delacour's dresses, and Lady Delacour's bon mots. Everything that her ladyship said was repeated as witty, Everything that her ladyship wore was imitated as fashionable. Female wit sometimes depends on the beauty of its possessor for its reputation, and the reign of beauty is proverbially short, and fashion often capriciously deserts her favorites even before nature withers their charms. Lady Delacour seemed to be a fortunate exception to these general rules. Long after she had lost the bloom of youth, she continued to be admired as a fashionable belle esprit. 
and long after she had ceased to be a novelty in society, her company was courted by all the gay, the witty, and the gallant. To be seen in public with Lady Delacour, to be a visitor at her house, were privileges of which numbers were vehemently ambitious. And Belinda Portman was congratulated and envied by all her acquaintance for being admitted as an inmate. How could she avoid thinking herself singularly fortunate? A short time after her arrival at Lady Delacour's, Belinda began to see through the thin veil with which politeness covers domestic misery. Abroad and at home, Lady Delacour was two different persons. Abroad she appeared all life's spirit and good humour, at home listless, fretful, and melancholy. She seemed like a spoiled actress off the stage, overstimulated by applause and exhausted by the exertions of supporting a fictitious character. When her house was filled with well-dressed crowds, when it blazed with lights and resounded with music and dancing, Lady Delacour, in the character of Mistress of the Revels, shone the soul and spirit of pleasure and frolic. But the moment the company retired, when the music ceased and the lights were extinguishing, the spell was dissolved. She would sometimes walk up and down the empty, magnificent saloon, absorbed in thoughts seemingly of the most painful nature. For some days after Belinda's arrival in town, she heard nothing of Lord Delacour. His lady never mentioned his name, except once accidentally, as she was showing Miss Portman the house, she said, "'Don't open that door. Those are only Lord Delacour's apartments.' The first time Belinda ever saw his lordship, he was dead drunk in the arms of two footmen who were carrying him upstairs to his bedchamber. His lady, who had just returned from Ranelagh, passed by him on the landing-place with a look of sovereign contempt. "'What is the matter? Who is this?' said Belinda. "'Only the body of my Lord Delacour,' said her ladyship. "'His bears have brought it up the wrong staircase. Take it down again, my good friends. Let his lordship go his own way. Don't look so shocked and amazed, Belinda. Don't look so new, child.' This funeral of my lord's intellects is to me a nightly or, added her ladyship, looking at her watch and yawning, I believe I should say a daily ceremony. Six o'clock, I protest. The next morning, as her ladyship and Miss Portman were sitting at the breakfast table, after a very late breakfast, Lord Delacour entered the room. Lord Delacour sober, my dear, said her ladyship to Miss Portman, by way of introducing him. Prejudiced by her ladyship, Belinda was inclined to think that Lord Delacour sober would not be more agreeable or more rational than Lord Delacour drunk. "'How old do you take my lord to be?' whispered her ladyship, as she saw Belinda's eye fixed upon the trembling hand which carried his teacup to his lips. "'I'll lay you a wager,' continued she aloud. I'll lay your birthnight dress, gold fringe, and laurel wreaths into the bargain that you don't guess right. I hope you don't think of going to this birthnight, Lady Delacour, said his lordship. I'll give you six guesses, and I'll bet you don't come within sixteen years, pursued her ladyship, still looking at Belinda. You cannot have the new carriage you have bespoken, said his lordship. Will you do me the honour to attend to me, Lady Delacour? "'Then you won't venture to guess, Belinda,' said her ladyship, without honouring her lord with the smallest portion of her attention. "'Well, I believe you are right, for certainly you would guess him to be six and sixty instead of six and thirty. But then he can drink more than any two-legged animal in his majesty's dominions, and you know that is an advantage which is well worth twenty or thirty years of a man's life, especially to persons who have no other chance of distinguishing themselves.' "'If some people had distinguished themselves a little less in the world,' retorted his lordship, "'it would have been as well.' "'As well? How flat!' "'Flatly, then, I have to inform you, Lady Delacour, "'that I will neither be contradicted nor laughed at. "'You understand me. "'It would be as well, flat or not flat, my Lady Delacour, if your ladyship would attend more to your own conduct and less to others. 
To that of others, his lordship means, if he means anything. Apropos, Belinda, did not you tell me Clarence Hervey is coming to town? You have never seen him. Well, I'll describe him to you by negatives. He is not a man who ever says anything flat. He is not a man who must be wound up with half a dozen bottles of champagne before he can go. He is not a man who, when he does go, goes wrong and won't be set right. He is not a man whose whole consequence, if he were married, would depend on his wife. He is not a man who, if he were married, would be so desperately afraid of being governed by his wife that he would turn gambler, jockey, or sot merely to show that he could govern himself. "'Go on, Lady Delacour,' said his lordship, who had been in vain attempting to balance a spoon on the edge of his teacup during the whole of this speech, which was delivered with the most animated desire to provoke. "'Go on, Lady Delacour. All I desire is that you should go on. Clarence Hervey will be much obliged to you, and I am sure so shall I. Go on, my Lady Delacour, go on, and you'll oblige me.' "'I never will oblige you, my lord. That you may depend upon,' cried her ladyship, with a look of indignant contempt. His lordship whistled, rang for his horses, and looked at his nails with a smile. Belinda, shocked and in a great confusion, rose to leave the room, dreading the gross continuance of this matrimonial dialogue. "'Mr. Hervey, my lady,' said a footman, opening the door, and he was scarcely announced when her ladyship went forward to receive him with an air of easy familiarity. "'Where have you buried yourself, Hervey, this age past?' cried she, shaking hands with him. "'There's absolutely no living in this most stupid of all worlds without you, Mr. Hervey, Miss Portman. "'But don't look as if you were half asleep, man. "'What are you dreaming of, Clarence? "'Why looks your grace so heavily to-day?' "'Oh, I have passed a miserable night,' replied Clarence, throwing himself into an actor's attitude and speaking in a fine tone of stage declamation. "'What was your dream, my lord? I pray you, tell me,' said her ladyship in a similar tone. Clarence went on. "'Oh, lord, methought what pain it was to dance, what dreadful noise of fiddles in my ears, what sights of ugly bells within my eyes!' Then came wandering by a shadow like a devil with red hair, dizened with flowers, and she bawled out aloud, Clarence is come, false, fleeting, perjured Clarence. Oh, Mrs. Luttridge, to the life, cried Lady Delacour. I know where you have been now, and I pity you. But sit down, said she, making room for him between Belinda and herself upon the sofa. Sit down here and tell me what could take you to that odious Mrs. Luttridge's. Mr. Hervey threw himself on the sofa. Lord Delacour whistled as before, and left the room without uttering a syllable. "'But my dream has made me forget myself strangely,' said Mr. Hervey, turning to Belinda and producing her bracelet. "'Mrs. Stanhope promised me that if I delivered it safely, I should be rewarded with the honour of putting it on the owner's fair arm.' A conversation now took place on the nature of ladies' promises— on fashionable bracelets, on the size of the arm of the Venus de' Medici, on Lady Delacour's and Miss Portman's, on the thick legs of ancient statues, and on the various defects and absurdities of Mrs. Luttridge and her wig. On all these topics Mr. Hervey displayed much wit, gallantry, and satire, with so happy an effect, that Belinda, when he took leave, was precisely of her aunt's opinion— that he was a most uncommonly pleasant young man. Clarence Hervey might have been more than a pleasant young man if he had not been smitten with the desire of being thought superior in everything, and of being the most admired person in all companies. He had been early flattered with the idea that he was a man of genius, and he imagined that, as such, he was entitled to be imprudent, wild, and eccentric. He affected singularity in order to establish his claims to genius. He had considerable literary talents, by which he was distinguished at Oxford. But he was so dreadfully afraid of passing for a pedant, that when he came into the company of the idle and the ignorant, 
he pretended to disdain every species of knowledge. His chameleon character seemed to vary in different lights, and according to the different situations in which he happened to be placed, he could be all things to all men, and to all women. He was supposed to be a favorite with the fair sex, and of all his various excellencies and defects, there was none on which he valued himself so much as his gallantry. He was not profligate. He had a strong sense of honor and quick feelings of humanity. But he was so easily led, or rather so easily excited by his companions, and his companions were now of such a sort that it was probable he would soon become vicious. As to his connection with Lady Delacour, he would have started with horror at the idea of disturbing the peace of a family. But in her family, he said, there was no peace to disturb. He was vain of having it seen by the world that he was distinguished by a lady of her wit and fashion, and he did not think it incumbent on him to be more scrupulous or more attentive to appearances than her ladyship. By Lord Delacour's jealousy he was sometimes provoked, sometimes amused, and sometimes flattered. He was constantly of all her ladyship's parties in public and private. Consequently he saw Belinda almost every day, and every day he saw her with increasing admiration for her beauty, and with increasing dread of being taken in to marry a niece of the Catch Matchmaker, the name by which Mrs. Stanhope was known amongst the men of his acquaintance. Young ladies who have the misfortune to be conducted by these artful dames are always supposed to be partners in all the speculations, though their names may not appear in the firm. If he had not been prejudiced by the character of her aunt, Mr. Hervey would have thought Belinda an undesigning, unaffected girl. But now he suspected her of artifice in every word, look, and motion, and even when he felt himself most charmed by her powers of pleasing, he was most inclined to despise her for what he thought such premature proficiency in scientific coquetry. He had not sufficient resolution to keep beyond the sphere of her attraction, but frequently, when he found himself within it, he cursed his folly, and drew back with sudden terror. His manner towards her was so variable and inconsistent that she knew not how to interpret its language. Sometimes she fancied that with all the eloquence of eyes he said, I adore you, Belinda. At other times she imagined that his guarded silence meant to warn her that he was so entangled by Lady Delacour that he could not extricate himself from her snares. Whenever this last idea struck her, it excited in the most edifying manner her indignation against coquetry in general, and against her ladyships in particular. She became wonderfully clear-sighted to all the improprieties of her ladyship's conduct. Belinda's newly acquired moral sense was so much shocked that she actually wrote a full statement of her observations and her scruples to her aunt Stanhope concluding by a request that she might not remain under the protection of a lady of whose character she could not approve, and whose intimacy might perhaps be injurious to her reputation, if not to her principles. Mrs. Stanhope answered Belinda's letter in a very guarded style. She rebuked her niece severely for her imprudence in mentioning names in such a manner in a letter sent by the common post, assured her that her reputation was in no danger, that she hoped no niece of hers would set up for a prude, a character more suspected by men of the world than even that of a coquette, that the person alluded to was a perfectly fit chaperone for any young lady to appear with in public, as long as she was visited by the first people in town, that as to anything in the private conduct of that person, and as to any private brouilleries between her and her lord, Belinda should observe on these dangerous topics a profound silence, both in her letters and her conversation, that as long as the lady continued under the protection of her husband, the world might whisper, but would not speak out, that as to Belinda's own principles, she would be utterly inexcusable if, after the education she had received, they could be hurt by any bad examples that she could not be too cautious in her management of a man of blank's character, that she could have no serious cause for jealousy in the quarter she apprehended, as marriage there could not be the object, and there was such a difference of age that no permanent influence could probably be obtained by the lady, 
that the most certain method for Miss Portman to expose herself to the ridicule of one of the parties, and to the total neglect of the other, would be to betray anxiety or jealousy, that, in short, if she were fool enough to lose her own heart, there would be little chance of her being wise enough to win that of blank, who was evidently a man of gallantry rather than of sentiment, and who was known to play his cards well, and to have good luck wherever hearts were trumps. Belinda's fears of Lady Delacour as a dangerous rival were much quieted by the artful insinuations of Mrs. Stanhope, with respect to her age, etc., and in proportion as her fears subsided, she blamed herself for having written too harshly of her ladyship's conduct. The idea that whilst she appeared as Lady Delacour's friend, she ought not to propagate any stories to her disadvantage, operated powerfully upon Belinda's mind, and she reproached herself for having told even her aunt what she had seen in private. She thought she had been guilty of treachery, and she wrote again immediately to Mrs. Stanhope, to conjure her to burn her last letter, to forget, if possible, its contents, and to believe that not a syllable of a similar nature should ever be heard from her. She was just concluding with the words, I hope my dear aunt will consider all this as an error of my judgment and not of my heart, when Lady Delacour burst into the room, exclaiming in a tone of gaiety, Tragedy or comedy, Belinda, the masquerade dresses are come. "'But how's this?' added she, looking full in Belinda's face. "'Tears in the eyes, blushes in the cheeks, tremors in the joints, and letters shuffling away. But you novice of novices, how awkwardly shuffled! A niece of Mrs. Stanhope's, and so unpractised a shuffler! And is it credible she should tremble in this ridiculous way about a love-letter or two? "'No love-letters, indeed, Lady Delacour,' said Belinda, holding the paper fast, as her ladyship, half in play, half in earnest, attempted to snatch it from her. "'No love-letters? Then it must be treason, and see it I must, by all that's good, or by all that's bad. I see the name of Delacour!' And her ladyship absolutely seized the letters by force, in spite of all Belinda's struggles and entreaties. "'I beg, I request, I conjure you not to read it cried Miss Portman, clasping her hands. Read mine, read mine, if you must, but don't read my aunt Stanhope's. Oh, I beg, I entreat, I conjure you. And she threw herself upon her knees. You beg, you entreat, you conjure. Why, this is like the Duchess de Brinvilliers, who wrote on her paper of poisons, Whoever finds this, I entreat, I conjure them, in the name of more saints than I can remember, not to open the paper any farther. What a simpleton to know so little of the nature of curiosity! As she spoke, Lady Delacour opened Mrs. Stanhope's letter, read it from beginning to end, folded it up coolly when she had finished it, and simply said, The person alluded to is almost as bad as her name at full length. Does Mrs. Stanhope think no one can make out an innuendo in a libel, or fill up a blank but an attorney general? pointing to a blank in Mrs. Stanhope's letter left for the name of Clarence Hervey. Belinda was in too much confusion either to speak or think. "'You are right to swear they were not love-letters,' pursued her ladyship, laying down the papers. "'I protest. I snatched them by way of frolic. I beg pardon. All I can do now is not to read the rest. "'Nay, I beg, I wish, I insist upon your reading mine,' said Belinda." When Lady Delacour had read it, her countenance suddenly changed. "'Worth a hundred of your aunts, I declare,' said she, patting Belinda's cheek. "'What a treasure to meet with anything like a new heart! All hearts nowadays are second-hand at best.' Lady Delacour spoke with a tone of feeling which Belinda had never heard from her before, and which at this moment touched her so much that she took her ladyship's hand and kissed it. End of chapter 1. Recording by Mimi Wong. Chapter 2 of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. Belinda 
by Maria Edgeworth. Chapter Two Masks. Where were we when all this began? cried Lady Delacour forcing herself to resume an air of gaiety. Oh, masquerade was the order of the day. Tragedy or comedy? Which suits your genius best, my dear? Whichever suits your ladyship's taste least. Why, my woman, Marriott, says I ought to be tragedy, and upon the notion that people always succeed best when they take characters diametrically opposite to their own, Clarence Hervey's principle. Perhaps you don't think that he has any principles, but there you are wrong, I do assure you. He has sound principles of taste. Of that, said Belinda, with a constrained smile, he gives the most convincing proof by his admiring your ladyship so much. And by his admiring Miss Portman so much more. But whilst we are making speeches to one another, poor Marriott is standing in distress, like Garrick, between tragedy and comedy. Lady Delacour opened her dressing-room door and pointed to her as she stood with the dress of the comic muse on one arm and the tragic muse on the other. I'm afraid I have not spirits enough to undertake the comic muse, said Miss Portman. Marriott, who was a personage of prodigious consequence, and the judge in the last resort at her mistress's toilette, looked extremely out of humor at having been kept waiting so long, and yet more so at the idea that her appellant jurisdiction could be disputed. "'Your ladyship's taller than Miss Portman by half a head,' said Marriott and to be sure will best become tragedy with this long train. Besides, I had settled all the rest of your ladyship's dress. Tragedy, they say, is always tall, and no offence your ladyship's taller than Miss Portman by half a head. For head read inch, said Lady Delacour, if you please. When things are settled, one can't bear to have them unsettled, but your ladyship must have your own way to be sure. I'll say no more, she cried, throwing down the dresses. Stay, Marriott, said Lady Delacour, and she placed herself between the angry waiting maid and the door. Why will you, who are the best creature in the world, put yourself into these theories about nothing? Have patience with us, and you shall be satisfied. That's another affair, said Marriott. Miss Portman, continued her ladyship, don't talk of not having spirits. You that are all life. What say you, Belinda? Oh, yes, you must be the comic muse, and I, it seems, must be tragedy, because Marriott has a passion for seeing me come sweeping by, and because Marriott must have her own way in everything. She rules me with a rod of iron, my dear, so tragedy I needs must be. Marriott knows her power. There was an air of extreme vexation in Lady Delacour's countenance as she pronounced these last words, in which evidently more was meant than met the ear. Upon many occasions Miss Portman had observed that Marriott exercised despotic authority over her mistress, and she had seen with surprise that a lady who would not yield an iota of power to her husband submitted herself to every caprice of the most insolent of waiting women. For some time Belinda imagined that this submission was merely an air, as she had seen some of the other fine ladies proud of appearing to be governed by a favorite maid. But she was soon convinced that Marriott was no favorite with Lady Delacour, that her ladyship's was not proud humility, but fear. It seemed certain that a woman 
extravagantly fond of her own will, would never have given it up without some very substantial reason. It seemed as if Marriott was in a position of some secret, which should for ever remain unknown. This idea had occurred to Miss Portman more than once, but never so forcibly as upon the present occasion. There had always been some mystery about her ladyship's toilet. At certain hours doors were bolted, and it was impossible for anybody but Marriott to obtain admission. Miss Portman at first imagined that Lady Delacour dreaded the discovery of her cosmetic secrets, but her ladyship's ruse was so glaring, and her pearl powder was so obvious, that Belinda was convinced there must be some other cause for this toilette secrecy. There was a little cabinet beyond her bedchamber, which Lady Delacour called her boudoir, to which there was an entrance by a back staircase, but no one ever entered there but Marriott. One night, Lady Delacour, after dancing with great spirit at a ball at her own house, fainted suddenly. Miss Portman attended her to her bedchamber, but Marriott begged that her lady might be left alone with her, and she would by no means suffer Belinda to follow her into the boudoir. All these things Belinda recollected in the space of a few seconds, as she stood contemplating Marriott and the dresses. The hurry of getting ready for the masquerade, however, dispelled these thoughts, and by the time she was dressed the idea of what Clarence Hervey would think of her appearance was uppermost in her mind. She was anxious to know whether he would discover her in the character of the comic muse. Lady Delacour was discontented with her tragic attire, and she grew still more out of humor with herself when she saw Belinda. "'I protest Marriott has made a perfect fright of me,' said her ladyship as she got into her carriage." and I'm positive my dress would become you a million times better than your own. Miss Portman regretted that it was too late to change. Not at all too late, my dear, said Lady Delacour. Never too late for women to change their minds, their dress, or their lovers. Seriously, you know, we are to call at my friend Lady Singleton's. She sees masks to-night. I'm quite intimate there. I'll make her let me step up to her own room, where no soul can interrupt us, and there we can change our dresses, and Marriott will know nothing of the matter. Marriott's a faithful creature and very fond of me, fond of power, too. But who is not? We must all have our faults. One would not quarrel with such a good creature as Marriott for a trifle. Then suddenly changing her tone, she said, Not a human being will find us out at the masquerade, for no one but Miss Freck knows that we are the two muses. Clarence Harvey swears he should know me in any disguise, but I defy him. I shall take special delight in puzzling him. Harriet Freck has told him in confidence that I'm to be the widow Brady in man's clothes. Now that's to be Harriet's own character, so Hervey will make fine confusion. As soon as they got to Lady Singleton's, Lady Delacour and Miss Portman immediately went upstairs to exchange dresses. Poor Belinda! Now she felt herself in spirits to undertake the comic muse, was rather vexed to be obliged to give up her becoming character. But there was no resisting the polite energy of Lady Delacour's vanity. Her ladyship ran as quick as lightning into a closet within the dressing-room, saying to Lady Singleton's woman, 
who attempted to follow, with, "'Can I do anything for your ladyship?' "'No, no, no, nothing, nothing. Thank ye, thank ye. I want no assistance. I never let anybody do anything for me but Marriott.' And she bolted herself in the closet. In a few minutes she half opened the door, threw out her tragic robes, and cried, "'Here, Miss Portman, give me yours, quick, and let's see whether comedy or tragedy will be ready first. "'Lord bless and forgive me,' said Lady Singleton's woman, when Lady Delacour at last threw open the door, when she was completely dressed. "'But if your layship has not been dressing all this time in that den, without anything in the shape of a looking-glass, and not to let me help, I that should have been so proud. Lady Delacour put a half a guinea into the waiting maid's hand, laughed affectedly at her own whimsicalities, and declared that she could dress herself better without a glass than with one. All this went off admirably well with everybody but Miss Portman. She could not help thinking it extraordinary that a person who was obviously fond of being waited upon, would never suffer any person to assist her at her toilet, except Marriott, a woman of whom she was evidently afraid. Lady Delacour's quick eye saw curiosity painted in Belinda's countenance, and for a moment she was embarrassed. But she soon recovered herself and endeavoured to turn the course of Miss Portman's thoughts by whispering to her some nonsense about Clarence Hervey, a cabalistical name, which she knew had the power, when pronounced in a certain tone, of throwing Belinda into confusion. The first person they saw, when they entered into the drawing-room at Lady Singleton's, was this very Clarence Hervey, who was not in a masquerade dress. He had laid a wager with one of his acquaintance that he could perform the part of the serpent, such as he is seen in Fuseli's well-known picture. For this purpose he had exerted much ingenuity in the invention and execution of a length of coiled skin, which he maneuvered with great dexterity by means of internal wires. His grand difficulty had been to manufacture the rays that were to come from his eyes. He had contrived a set of phosphoric rays, which he was certain would charm all the fair daughters of Eve. He forgot, it seems, that phosphorus could not well be seen by candlelight. When he was just equipped as a serpent, his rays set fire to a part of his envelope, and it was with the greatest difficulty that he was extricated. He escaped unhurt, but his serpent skin was utterly consumed. Nothing remained but the melancholy spectacle of its skeleton. He was obliged to give up the hopes of shining at the masquerade but he resolved to be at Lady Singleton's that he might meet Lady Delacour and Miss Portman. The moment that the tragic and comic muse appeared, he invoked them with much humor and mock pathos, declaring that he knew not which of them could best sing his adventure. After a recital of his misfortune had entertained the company, and after the muses had performed their parts to the satisfaction of the audience and their own, the conversation ceased to be supported in masquerade character. Muses and harlequins, gypsies and Cleopatras, began to talk of their private affairs, and of the news and the scandal of the day. A group of gentlemen, amongst whom was Clarence Harvey, gathered round the tragic muse. As Mr. Hervey had hinted that he knew she was a person of distinction, though he would not tell her name, 
after he had exercised his wit for some time, without obtaining from the tragic muse one single syllable, he whispered, Lady Delacour, why this unnatural reserve? Do you imagine that, through this tragical disguise, I have not found you out? The tragic muse appeared absorbed in meditation. Beauchamp made no reply. The devil a word can you get for your pains, Hervey, said a gentleman of his acquaintance, who joined the party at this instant. Why didn't you stick to other muse, who, to do her justice, is as errant a flirt as your heart could wish for? There's danger in flirting, said Clarence, with an errant flirt of Miss Stanhope's training. There's a kind of electricity about that girl. I have a sort of cobweb feeling, an imaginary net coming all over me. Forewarned is forearmed, replied his companion. A man must be a novice indeed that could be taken in at this time of day by a niece of Mrs. Stanhope's. That Mrs. Stanhope must be a good, clever dame faith, said a third gentleman. There's no less than six of her nieces whom she has got off within these four winters. Not one of them now that has not made a catch match. There's the eldest of the set, Mrs. Tolomach. What had she in the devil's name to set up with in the world? but a pair of good eyes, her aunt, to be sure, taught her to use them early enough. They might have rolled to all eternity before they would have rolled me out of my senses. But you see, they did Tolmache's business. However, they are going to part now, I hear. Tolmache was tired of her before the honeymoon was over, as I foretold. Then there's the musical girl, Jodrell, who has no more ear than a post, went and married her, because he had a mind to set up for a connoisseur in music, and Mrs. Stanhope flattered him that he was one. The gentleman joined in the general laugh. The tragic muse sighed. Even were she at the school for scandal, the tragic muse dare not laugh except behind her mask, said Clarence Hervey. Far be it from her to laugh at those follies which she must for ever deplore, said Belinda in a feigned voice. What miseries spring from these ill-suited marriages? The victims are sacrificed before they have sense enough to avoid their fate. Clarence Hervey imagined that this speech alluded to Lady Delacour's own marriage. Damn me if I know any woman, young or old, that would avoid being married, if she could, though, cried Sir Philip Baddeley, a gentleman who always supplied each vacuity of sense with an oath. But Roqueford didn't Valentine marry one of these nieces? Yes, she was a mighty fine dancer and had good legs enough, Mrs. Stanhope got poor Valentin to fight a duel about her place in a country dance, and then he was so pleased with himself for his prowess that he married the girl. Belinda made an effort to change her seat, but she was encompassed so that she could not retreat. As to Jenny Mason, the fifth of the nieces, continued the witty gentleman, she was as brown as mahogany, and had neither eyes, nose, mouth, nor legs. What Mrs. Stanhope could do with her, I often wondered. But she took courage, rogued her up, set her a-going as a dasher, and she dashed herself into Tom Levitt's circle, and Tom couldn't get her out again till she was the Honorable Mrs. Levitt. She then took the reins into her own hands, and I hear she's driving him and herself the road to ruin as fast as they can gallop. As for this Belinda Portman, t'was a good hit to send her to Lady Delacour's. But I take it she hangs upon hand. For last winter, when I was at Bath, 
She was hawked about everywhere, and the aunt was puffing her with might and main. You heard of nothing, wherever you went, but of Belinda Portman, and Belinda Portman's accomplishments, Belinda Portman, and her accomplishments, I'll swear, were as well advertised as Packwood's razor strops. Mrs. Stanhope overdid the business, I think, resumed the gentleman who began the conversation. The girls brought to hammer this way don't go off well, it's true. Christy himself, is no match for Dame Stanhope. Many of my acquaintance were tempted to go and look at the premises, but not one, you may be sure, had a thought of becoming a tenant for life. "'That's an honor reserved for you, Clarence Hervey,' said another, tapping him upon the shoulder. "'Give ye joy, Hervey, give ye joy.' "'Me,' said Clarence, starting, "'I'll be hanged if he didn't change color,' said his facetious companion, and all the young men again joined in laugh. "'Laugh on, my merry men,' cried Clarence. "'But the devil's in it if I don't know my own mind better than any of you. You don't imagine I go to Lady Delacour's to look for a wife? Belinda Portman's a good, pretty girl. But what then? Do you think I'm an idiot?' Do you think I could be taken in by one of the Stanop school? Do you think I don't see as plainly as any of you that Belinda Portman's a composition of art and affection? Hush! Not so loud, Clarence. Here she comes, said his companion, the comic muse. Is not she? Lady Delacour at this moment came lightly tripping towards them, and addressing herself in the character of the comic muse, to Hervey, exclaimed, "'Hervey, my Hervey, most favorite of my votaries, why do you forsake me? Why mourns my friend, why weeps his downcast eye, that I where mirth and fancy used to shine? Though you have lost your serpent's form, Yet you may please any of the fair daughters of Eve in your own. Mr. Hervey bowed. All the gentlemen who stood near him smiled. The tragic muse gave an involuntary sigh. Could I borrow a sigh or a tear from my tragic sister? pursued Lady Delacour. However unbecoming to my character, I would if only sighs or tears can win the heart of Clarence Hervey. Let me practice. And her ladyship practiced, sighing with much comic effect. Persuasive words and more persuasive sighs, said Clarence Hervey. A good, bold, stanop case of net faith, whispered one of his companions. Malpomen, has thou forgot thyself to marble? pursued Lady Delacour. I am not very well, whispered Miss Portman to her ladyship. Could we get away? Get away from Clarence Hervey, do you mean? replied her ladyship in a whisper. Tis not easy, but we'll try what can be done, if it is necessary. Belinda had no power to reply to this raillery. Indeed, she scarcely heard the words that were said to her. But she put her arm within Lady Delacour's, who, to her great relief, had the good nature to leave the room with her immediately. Her ladyship, though she would sacrifice the feelings of others, without compunction, to her vanity, whenever the power of her wit was disputed. Yet towards those by whom it was acknowledged, she showed some mercy. "'What is the matter with the child?' she said, as she went down the staircase. "'Nothing, if I could have air,' said Belinda. There was a crowd of servants in the hall. "'Why does Lady Delacour avoid me so perniciously?' What crime have I committed that I was not favored with one word? said Clarence Hervey, who had followed them down the stairs and overtook them in the hall. 
"'Do see if you can find any of my people,' cried Lady Delacour. "'Lady Delacour, the comic muse!' exclaimed Mr. Hervey. "'I thought—' "'No matter what you thought,' interrupted her ladyship, "'let my carriage draw up, for here's a young friend of yours trembling so about nothing, "'that I am half afraid she will faint, and you know it would not be so pleasant to faint here amongst the footmen. "'Stay, this room is empty. "'Oh, I did not mean to tell you to stay.' she said to Hervey, who involuntarily followed her in the utmost consternation. "'I'm perfectly well now, perfectly well,' said Belinda. "'Perfectly a simpleton, I think,' said Lady Delacour. "'Nay, my dear, you must be ruled. Your mask must come off. "'Didn't you tell me you wanted air? "'What now?' This is not the first time Clarence Hervey has ever seen your face without a mask, is it? It's the first time, indeed, he or anybody else ever saw it of such a color, I believe. When Lady Delacour pulled off Belinda's mask, her face was, during the first instant, pale, the next moment crimsoned over with a burning blush. What is the matter with ye both? How he stands, said Lady Delacour, turning to Mr. Hervey. Did you ever see a woman blush before? Or did you never say or do anything to make a woman blush before? Will you give Miss Portman a glass of water? There's some behind you on that sideboard, man. But he has neither eyes, ears, nor understanding. "'Do go about your business,' said her ladyship, pushing him towards the door. "'Do go about your business, for I haven't common patience with you. "'On my conscience, I believe the man's in love, and not with me. "'That's sal volatile for you, child, I perceive,' continued she to Belinda. "'Oh, you can walk now, but remember you are on slippery ground.' Remember, Clarence Hervey is not a marrying man, and you are not a married woman. It is perfectly indifferent to me, madam, Belinda said, with a voice and a look of proud indignation. Lady Delacour, your carriage has drawn up, said Clarence Hervey, returning to the door, but without entering. Then put this perfectly well and perfectly indifferent lady into it, said Lady Delacour. He obeyed without uttering a syllable. Dumb, absolutely dumb, I protest, said her ladyship, as she handed her in afterwards. Why, Clarence, the casting of your serpent skin seems to have quite changed your nature. Nothing but the simplicity of the dove left and I expect to hear you cooing presently. Don't you, Miss Portman? She ordered the coachman to drive to the Pantheon. To the Pantheon! I was in hopes your ladyship would have the goodness to set me down at home, for indeed I shall be a burden to you and everybody else at the masquerade. If you have made any appointment for the rest of the evening in Berkeley Square, I'll set you down certainly. "'if you insist upon it, my dear, for punctuality is a virtue. "'But prudence is a virtue, too, and a young lady who, as your Aunt Stanhope would say, "'has to establish herself in the world. "'Why these tears, Belinda? "'Or are they tears? "'For by the light of the lamps I can scarcely tell, "'though I'll swear I saw the handkerchief at the eyes.' "'What is the meaning of all this? "'You'd best trust me, "'for I know as much of men and manners "'as your Aunt Stanhope, at least, "'and in one word you have nothing to fear from me "'and everything to hope from yourself, "'if you will only dry up your tears. "'Keep on your mask and take my advice. "'You'll find it as good as your Aunt Stanhope's.' "'My Aunt Stanhope's! "'Oh!' cried Belinda. Never, 
Never more will I take such advice. Never more will I expose myself to be insulted as a female adventurer. Little did I know in what a light I appeared. Little did I know what gentlemen thought of my Aunt Stanhope, of my cousins, of myself. Gentlemen, I presume Clarence Hervey stands at this instant in your imagination as the representative of all the gentlemen in England, and he, instead of Anacharis Clutes, is now, to be sure, la orator du genre humain. Pray, let me have a specimen of the eloquence which, to judge by its effects, must be powerful indeed. Miss Portman, not without some reluctance, repeated the conversation which she had heard. "'And is this all?' cried Lady Delacour. "'Lord, my dear, you must either give up living in the world, or expect to hear yourself, and your aunts, and your cousins, and your friends, from generation to generation, abused every hour in the day, by their friends and your friends. Tis the common course of things. Now you know what a multitude of obedient, humble servants, dear creatures, and very sincere and most affectionate friends, I have in my writing-desk and on my mantelpiece, not to mention the cards which crowd the common rack from intimate acquaintance who cannot live without the honour or favour or pleasure of seeing Lady Delacour twice a week. Do you think I'm fool enough to imagine that they would care the hundredth part of a straw if I were this minute thrown into the red or the black sea? No, I have not one real friend in the world except Harriet Freak. Yet... You see I am the comic muse, and I mean to keep it up, keep it up to the last, on purpose to provoke those who would give their eyes to be able to pity me. I humbly thank them, no pity for Lady Delacour. Follow my example, Belinda. Elbow your way through the crowd. If you stop to be civil and beg pardon and hope I didn't hurt ye, you will be trod under foot. Now, you'll meet those young men continually who took the liberty of laughing at your aunt and your cousins and yourself. They are men of fashion. Show them you've no feeling, and they'll acknowledge you for a woman of fashion. You'll marry better than any of your cousins, Clarence Hervey, if you can, and then it will be your turn to laugh about nets and cages. As to love and all that, the carriage stopped at the Pantheon, just as her ladyship came to the words, love and all that. Her thoughts took a different turn, and during the remainder of the night she exhibited, in such a manner, as to attract universal admiration, all the ease and grace and gaiety of Euphrosyne. To Belinda, the night appeared long and dull. The commonplace wit of chimney-sweepers and gypsies, the antics of harlequins and the graces of flower-girls and Cleopatras, had not the power to amuse her, for her thoughts still recurred to that conversation which had given her so much pain, a pain which Lady Delacour's raillery had failed to obliterate. "'How happy you are, Lady Delacour,' she said when they got into the carriage to go home. "'How happy you are to have such an amazing flow of spirits!' "'Amazing, you might well say, if you knew all.' said Lady Delacour, and she heaved a deep sigh, threw herself back in the carriage, let fall her mask, and was silent. 
It was broad daylight, and Belinda had a view of her countenance, which was the picture of despair. She uttered not one syllable more, nor had Miss Portman the courage to interrupt her meditations, till they came within sight of Lady Singleton's, when Belinda ventured to remind her that she had resolved to stop there and change dresses before Marriott saw them. "'No, it's no matter,' said Lady Delacour. "'Marriott will leave me at last, like all the rest. "'Tis no matter.' Her ladyship sunk back into her former attitude. But after she had remained silent for some minutes, she started up and exclaimed, "'If I had served myself with half the zeal that I served the world, I should not now be thus forsaken. I have sacrificed reputation, happiness, everything to the love of frolic. All frolic will soon be at an end with me. I am dying, and I shall die unlamented by any human being. If I were to live my life over again, what a different life it should be. What a different person I would be. But it is all over now. I am dying. Belinda's astonishment at these words and the solemn manner in which they were pronounced was inexpressible. She gazed at Lady Delacour and then repeated the word. Dying. Yes, dying, said Lady Delacour. But you seem to me and to all the world in perfect health, and but half an hour ago in perfect spirits, said Belinda. I seem to you and to all the world what I am not. I tell you I am dying, said her ladyship in an emphatic tone. Not a word more passed till they got home. Lady Delacour hurried upstairs, bidding Belinda follow her to her dressing-room. Marriott was lighting six wax candles on the dressing-table. "'As I live, they have changed dresses after all,' said Marriott to herself, as she fixed her eyes upon Lady Delacour and Miss Portman. "'I'll be burnt if I don't make my lady remember this.' "'Marriott, you need not wait. I'll ring you when I want you,' said Lady Delacour, and taking one of the candles from the table, she passed on hastily with Miss Portman through her dressing-room, through her bedchamber, and to the door of the mysterious cabinet. "'Marriott, the key of this door!' cried she impatiently, after she had in vain attempted to open it. "'Heavenly graciousness!' cried Marriott. "'Is my lady out of her senses?' "'The key, the key, quick, the key!' repeated Lady Delacour in a peremptory tone. She seized it as soon as Marriott drew it from her pocket and unlocked the door. "'Had not I best put the things to right, my lady?' said Marriott, catching fast hold of the opening door. "'I'll ring you when you are wanted, Marriott,' said Lady Delacour. And pushing open the door with violence, she rushed forward to the middle of the room, and turning back, she beckoned to Belinda to follow her. "'Come in. What is it you're afraid of?' said she. Belinda went on, and the moment she was in the room, Lady Delacour shut and locked the door. The room was rather dark, as there was no light in it except what came from the candle which Lady Delacour held in her hand, and which burned but dimly. Belinda, as she looked round, saw nothing but a confusion of linen rags, vials, some empty, some full, and she perceived that there was a strong smell of medicines. Lady Delacour, whose motions were all precipitate, like those of a person whose mind is in great agitation, looked from side to side of the room without seeming to know what she was in search of. She then, with a species of fury, wiped the paint from her face, and returning to Belinda, held the candle so as to throw the light full upon her livid features. 
Her eyes were sunk, her cheeks hollow. No trace of youth or beauty remained on her death-like countenance, which formed a horrid contrast with her gay, fantastic dress. "'You are shocked, Belinda,' said she. "'But as yet you have seen nothing. Look here.' And bearing one half of her bosom, she revealed a hideous spectacle. Belinda sunk back into a chair. Lady Delacour flung herself on her knees before her. "'Am I humbled? Am I wretched enough?' cried she, her voice trembling with agony. "'Yes, pity me for what you have seen, and a thousand times more for that which you cannot see. My mind is eaten away like my body by incurable disease, inveterate remorse.' remorse for a life of folly, of folly which has brought on me all the punishments of guilt. My husband, continued she, and her voice suddenly altered from the tone of grief to that of anger, my husband hates me. No matter, I despise him. His relations hate me. No matter, I despise them. My own relations hate me, no matter, I never wish to see them more. Never shall they see my sorrow. Never shall they hear a complaint, a sigh from me. There is no torture which I could not more easily endure than their insulting pity. I will die as I have lived, the envy and admiration of the world. When I am gone, let them find out their mistake and moralize, if they will, over my grave. She paused. Belinda had no power to speak. Promise, swear to me, resumed Lady Delacour vehemently, seizing Belinda's hand, that you will never reveal to any mortal what you have seen and heard this night. No living creature suspects that Lady Delacour is dying by inches, except Marriott, and that woman whom but a few hours ago I thought my real friend, to whom I trusted every secret of my life, every thought of my heart. Fool, idiot, dupe that I was to trust the friendship of a woman who I knew to be without principle. But I thought she had honor. I thought she could never betray me. Oh, Harriet, Harriet, you to desert me. Anything else I could have borne but you, who I thought would have supported me in the tortures of mind and body which I am to go through. You that I thought would receive my last breath. You desert me. Now I am alone in the world, left to the mercy of an insolent waiting woman. Lady Delacour hid her face in Belinda's lap, and almost stifled by the violence of contending emotion, she last gave vent to them and sobbed aloud. Trust to one, said Belinda, pressing her hand with all the tenderness which humanity could dictate, who will never leave you at the mercy of an insolent waiting woman. Trust to me. Trust to you, said Lady Delacour, looking up eagerly in Belinda's face. Yes, I think I may trust to you, for though a niece of Mrs. Stanhope's, I have seen this day, and have seen with surprise, symptoms of artless feeling about you. This was what tempted me to open my mind to you, when I found that I had lost the only friend. But I will think no more of that. If you have a heart, you must feel for me. Leave me now. Tomorrow you shall hear my whole history. Now I am quite exhausted. Ring for Marriott. Marriott appeared 
with a face of constrained civility and latent rage. "'Put me to bed, Marriott,' said Lady Delacour, with a subdued voice. "'But first, light Miss Portman to her room. She need not, yet, see the horrid business of my toilette.' Belinda, when she was left alone, immediately opened her shutters and threw up the sash to refresh herself with the morning air. She felt excessively fatigued, and in the hurry of her mind she could not think of anything distinctly. She took off her masquerade dress and went to bed in hopes of forgetting for a few hours what she felt indelibly impressed upon her imagination but it was in vain that she endeavored to compose herself to sleep. Her ideas were in too great and painful confusion. For some time, whenever she closed her eyes, the face and form of Lady Delacour, such as she had just beheld them, seemed to haunt her. Afterwards, the idea of Clarence Hervey and the painful recollection of the conversation she had overheard recurred to her. The words, Do you think I don't know that Belinda Portman is a composition of art and affection? Fixed in her memory, she recollected with the utmost minuteness every look of contempt which she had seen in the faces of the young men, whilst they spoke Mrs. Stanhope, the matchmaker. Belinda's mind, however, was not yet sufficiently calm to reflect. She seemed only to live over again the preceding night. At last, the strange, motley figures which she had seen at the masquerade flitted before her eyes, and she sunk into an uneasy slumber. End of chapter 2 Chapter Three of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. Chapter Three. Lady Delacourt's History. Miss Portman was awakened by the ringing of Lady Delacour's bedchamber bell. She opened her eyes with the confused idea that something disagreeable had happened, and before she had distinctly recollected herself, Marriott came to her bedside with a note from Lady Delacour. It was written with a pencil. Delacour, my lord, is to have to-day what Garrick used to call a gander-feast. Will you dine with me, tete-a-tete, and I'll write an excuse, alias a lie, to Lady Singleton, in the form of a charming note. I pique myself, sur la eloquence du billet. Then we shall have the evening to ourselves. I have much to say as people usually have when they begin to talk of themselves. I have taken a double dose of opium, and am not so horribly out of spirits as I was last night, so you need not be afraid of another scene. Let me see you in my dressing-room, dear Belinda, as soon as you have adored. With head uncovered, the cosmetic powers. But you don't paint... No matter, you will, you must, everybody must, sooner or later. In the meantime, whenever you want to send a note that shall not be opened by the bearer, put your trust neither in wafer nor wax, but twist it as I twist mine. You see, I wish to put you in possession of some valuable secrets before I leave this world. This, by the by... I don't, upon second thoughts, which are always best, mean to do yet. There certainly were such people as Amazons, I hope you admire them, 
or who could live without the admiration of Belinda Portman. Not Clarence Hervey, assuredly, nor yet T. C. H. Delacour. Belinda obeyed the summons to her ladyship's dressing-room. She found Lady Delacour with her face completely repaired with paint, and her spirits with opium. She was in high consultation with Marriott and Mrs. Franks, the milliner, about the crape petticoat of her birth-night dress, which was extended over a large hoop in full state. Mrs. Franks descanted long and learnedly upon festoons and loops, knots and fringes, submitting all the time everything to her ladyship's better judgment. Marriott was sulky and silent. She opened her lips but once upon the question of laburnum or no laburnum flowers. Against them she quoted the memoirs and the authority of the celebrated Mrs. Bellamy, who has a case in point to prove that straw color must ever look like dirty white by candlelight. Mrs. Franks, to compromise the matter, proposed gold laburnums, because nothing can look better by candlelight, or any light, than gold. And Lady Delacour, who was afraid that the milliner's imagination, now that it had once touched upon gold, might be led to a vulgar idea of ready money, suddenly broke up the conference by exclaiming, "'We shall be late at Philip's exhibition of French China. Mrs. Franks must let us see her again to-morrow to take into consideration your court dress, my dear Belinda. Miss Portman, presented by Lady Delacour. Mrs. Franks, let her dress, for heaven's sakes.' Be something that will make a fine paragraph. I give you four and twenty hours to think of it. I have done a horrid act this day, continued she, after Mrs. Franks had left the room, absolutely written a twisted note to Clarence Hervey, my dear. But why did I tell you that? Now your head will run upon the twisted note all day, instead of upon the life and opinions of a lady of quality, related by herself. After dinner, Lady Delacour, having made Belinda protest and blush and blush and protest that her head was not running upon the twisted note, began the history of her life and opinions in the following manner. I do nothing by halves, my dear. I shall not tell you my adventures, as Gil Blas told his to the court de Oliveres, skipping over the useful passages. I am no hypocrite, and have nothing worse than folly to conceal. That's bad enough, for a woman who is known to play the fool is always suspected of playing the devil. But I begin where I ought to end, with my moral, which I dare say you are not impatient to anticipate. I never read or listened to a moral at the end of a story in my life. Manners for me, and morals for those that like them. My dear, you will be woefully disappointed if in my story you expect anything like a novel. I once heard a general say that nothing was less like a review than a battle, and I can tell you that nothing is more unlike a novel than real life. Of all lives, mine has been the least romantic, no love in it, but a great deal of hate. I was a rich heiress. I had, I believe, a hundred thousand pounds, or more, and twice as many capris. I was handsome and witty, or, to speak with that kind of circumlocution which is called humility, the world, the partial world, thought me a beauty and a bel esprit. Having told you my fortune, 
need I add that I, or it, had lovers in abundance of all sorts and degrees, not to reckon those, it may be presumed, who died of concealed passions for me? I had sixteen declarations and proposals in form. Then what in the name of wonder or of common sense, which, by the by, is the greatest of wonders, what in the name of common sense made me marry Lord Delacour? Why, my dear, you, no, not you, but any girl who is not used to have a parcel of admirers, would think it the easiest thing in the world to make her choice. But let her judge by what she feels when a dexterous mercer or linen draper produces pretty thing after pretty thing, and this is so becoming. And this will wear forever, as he swears. But then that's so fashionable. The novice stands in a charming perplexity, and after examining and doubting and tossing over half the goods in the shop, it's ten to one when it begins to get late. The young lady, in a hurry, pitches upon the very ugliest and worst thing she has seen. Just so it was with me and my lovers, and just so sad was the hour and luckless was the day. I pitched upon Viscount Delacour for my lord and judge. He had just at that time lost at New Market more than he was worth in every sense of the word, and my fortune was the most convenient thing in the world to a man in his condition. Lozenges are of sovereign use in some complaints. The heiress lozenge is a specific in some consumptions. You are surprised that I can laugh and jest about such a melancholy thing as my marriage with Lord Delacour, and so I am especially when I recollect all the circumstances, for though I bragged of there being no love in my history, there was when I was a goose or a gosling of about eighteen, just your age, Belinda, I think, something very like love playing about my heart or my head. There was a certain Henry Percival, a Clarence Hervey of a man. No, he had ten times the sense, begging your pardon, of Clarence Hervey. His misfortune, or mine, was that he had too much sense. He was in love with me, but not with my faults. Now I, wisely considering that my faults were the greatest part of me, insisted upon his being in love with my faults. He wouldn't or couldn't. I said wouldn't, and he said couldn't. I had been used to see the men about me lick the dust at my feet, for it was gold dust. Percival made wry faces. Lord Delacour made none. I pointed him out to Percival as an example. It was an example he would not follow. I was provoked, and I married in hopes of provoking the man I loved. The worst of it was, I did not provoke him as much as I expected. Six months afterwards I heard of his marriage with a very amiable woman. I hate those very amiable women. Poor Percival. I should have been a very happy woman. I fancy if I had married you, for I believe you were the only man who ever really loved me. But all that is over now. Where were we? Oh, I married Lord Delacour, knowing him to be a fool, and believing that for this reason I should find no trouble in governing him. But what a fatal mistake! A fool, of all animals in the creation, is the most difficult to govern. We set out in the fashionable world with a mutual desire to be as extravagant as possible. Strange that with this similarity of taste, we could never agree. Strange that this similarity of taste was the cause of our perpetual quarrels. 
during the first year of our marriage. I had always the upper hand in these disputes, and the last word, and I was content. Stubborn as the brute was, I thought I should in time break him in. From the specimens you have seen, you may guess that I was even then a tolerable proficient in the dear art of tormenting. I had almost gained my point, just broken my lord's heart, when one fair morning I unluckily told his man, Champfort, that he knew no more how to cut hair than a sheep shearer. Champfort, who was a conceit personified, took mortal offense at this, and the devil, who was always at hand to turn anger into malice, put into Champfort's head to put it into my lord's head that the world thought my lady governed him. My lord took fire. They say the torpedo, the coldest of cold creatures, sometimes gives out a spark, I suppose when electrified with anger. The next time that innocent I insisted upon my lord Delacourt's doing or not doing, I forget which, the most reasonable thing in the world, my lord turns short round and answers, My lady Delacour, I am not a man to be governed by a wife. And from that time to this, the words, I am not a man to be governed by a wife, have been written in his obstinate face, as all the world who can read the human countenance may see. My dear, I laugh, but even in the midst of laughter there is sadness. But you don't know what it is. I hope you never may to have an obstinate fool for a bosom friend. At first I flattered myself that my lord's was not an inveterate, incurable malady. But from his obvious weakness I might have seen that there was no hope for cases of obstinacy are always dangerous in proportion to the weakness of the patient. My lord's case was desperate. Kill or cure was my humane or prudent maxim. I determined to try the poison of jealousy by way of an alternative. I had long kept it in petto as my ultimate remedy. I fixed upon a proper subject, a man with whom I thought that I could coquette to all eternity without any danger to myself, a certain Colonel Lawless, as empty as a coxcomb as you would wish to see. The world, said I to myself, can never be so absurd as to suspect Lady Delacour with such a man as this though her lord may and will, for nothing is too absurd for him to believe. Half my theory proved just. That is saying a great deal for any theory. My lord swallowed the remedy that I had prepared for him with an avidity and a bonhomme, which it did me good to behold. My remedy operated beyond my most sanguine expectations. The poor man was cured of his obstinacy, and became stark mad with jealousy. Then indeed I had some hopes of him, for a handman can be managed, a fool cannot. In a month's time I made him quite docile, with a face longer than the weeping philosophers. He came to me one morning, and assured me he would do everything I pleased provided I would consult my own honor and his, and give up Colonel Lawless. Give up! I could hardly forbear laughing at the expression. I replied that as long as my lord treated me with becoming respect, I had never in thought or deed given him just cause of complaint, but that I was not a woman to be insulted or to be kept as I had hitherto been, in leading strings by a husband. 
My lord flattered, as I meant he should be with the idea that it was possible he should be suspected of keeping a wife in leading strings, fell to making protestations. He hoped his future conduct would prove, etc. Upon this hint, I gave the reins to my imagination, and full drive I went into a fresh career of extravagance. If I were checked, it was an insult, and I began directly to talk of leading strings. This ridiculous game I played successfully enough for some time, till at length, though naturally rather slow at calculation, he actually discovered that if we lived at the rate of twenty thousand a year, and had only ten thousand a year to spend, we should in due time have nothing left. This notable discovery he communicated to me one morning after a long preamble. But when he had finished prosing, I agreed that it was demonstrably just that he should retrench his expenses but that it was equally unjust and impossible that I could make any reformation in my civil list. That economy was a word which I had never heard of in my life till I married his lordship. That, upon second recollection, it was true, I had heard of such things as national economy, and that it would be very pretty, though rather hackneyed topic, of declamation for a maiden speech in the House of Lords. I therefore advised him to reserve all he had to say upon the subject for the noble lord upon the woolsack. Nay, I very graciously added that upon this condition I would go to the House myself to give his arguments and eloquence a fair hearing, and that I would do my best to keep myself awake. This was almighty playful and witty, but it happened that my lord Delacour, who never had any great taste for wit, could not this unlucky morning at all relish it. Of course I grew angry and reminded him with an indelicacy which his want of generosity justified that an heiress who had brought a hundred thousand pounds into this family had some right to amuse herself, and that it was not my fault if elegant amusements were more expensive than others. Then came a long, criminating and recriminating chapter. It was, My Lord, your Newmarket blunders, My Lady, your cursed theatricals. My Lord, I have surely a right, and My Lady, I have surely as good a right. But, my dear Belinda, however we might pay one another, we could not pay all the world with words. In short, after running through thousands and tens of thousands, we were actually in distress for money. Then came selling of lands, and I don't know what devices for raising money, according to the modes of lawyers and attorneys. It was quite indifferent to me how they got money, provided they did get it. By what art these gentlemen raised money, I never troubled myself to inquire. It might have been the black art for anything I know to the contrary. I know nothing of business. So I signed all the papers they brought to me, and I was mighty well pleased to find that by so easy an expedient as writing T. C. H. Delacour. I could command money at will. I signed and signed, till at last I was with all due civility informed that my signature was no longer worth a farthing, and when I came to inquire into the cause of this phenomenon, I could no wise understand what my Lord Delacour's lawyer said to me. He was a prig and I had not patience either to listen to him or to look at him. I sent for an old uncle of mine, who used to manage all my money matters before I was married. I put the uncle and the lawyer into a room together with their parchments to fight the matter out, or to come to a right understanding if they could. 
The last, it seems, was quite impossible. In the course of half an hour, out comes my uncle in such a rage. I never shall forget his face. All the bile in his body had gotten into it. He had literally no whites to his eyes. My dear uncle, I said, what is the matter? Why, you are absolutely gold stick in waiting. No matter what I am, child, said the uncle, I'll tell you what you are, with all your wit, a dupe. "'Tis a shame for a woman of your sense to be such a fool, and to know nothing of business. And if you knew nothing yourself, could not you send for me? "'I was too ignorant to know that I knew nothing,' said I. "'But I will not trouble you with all the said eyes and said he's. I was made to understand.' that if Lord Delacour were to die the next day, I should live a beggar. Upon this I grew serious, as you may imagine. My uncle assured me that I had been grossly imposed upon by my lord and his lawyer, and that I had been swindled out of my senses and out of my dower. I repeated all that my uncle said, very faithfully to Lord Delacour, and all that he or his lawyer could furnish out by way of answers was that necessity had no law. Necessity it must be allowed, though it might be the mother of law, was never with my lord the mother of invention. Having now found out that I had a good right to complain, I indulged myself in it most gloriously. In short, my dear, we had a comfortable family quarrel. Love quarrels are easily made up, but of money quarrels there is no end. From the moment these money quarrels commenced, I began to hate Lord Delacour. Before I had only despised him, you can have no notion to what meanness extravagance reduces men. I have known Lord Delacour shirk, and look so shabby, and tell so many lies to people about a hundred guineas, a hundred guineas. What do I say? About twenty, ten, five. Oh, my dear, I cannot bear the thoughts of it. But I was going on to tell you that my good uncle and all my relations quarrelled with me for having ruined myself, as they say. But I said they quarrelled with me for fear I should ask them for some of their vile trash. Accordingly, I abused and ridiculed them, one and all. And for my pains, all my acquaintance said that Lady Delacour was a woman of a vast deal of spirit. We were relieved from our money embarrassments by the timely death of a rich nobleman to whose large estate my Lord Delacour was heir at law. I was intoxicated with the idle compliments of all my acquaintance, and I endeavored to console myself for misery at home by gaiety abroad ambitions of pleasing universally. I became the worst of slaves, a slave to the world. Not a moment of my time was at my own disposal, not one of my actions. I may say, not one of my thoughts was my own. I was obliged to find things charming every hour, which tired me to death and every day it was the same dull round of hypocrisy and dissipation. You wonder to hear me speak in this manner, Belinda. But one must speak the truth sometimes, and this is what I have been saying to Harriet Freke continually for these ten years past. Then why persist in the same kind of life, you say? Why, my dear, because I could not stop. I was fit for this kind of life, and for no other. I could not be happy at home, 
for what sort of a companion could I have made for Lord Delacour? By this time he was tired of his horse potato, and his horse high flyer, and his horse eclipse, and Goliath, and Jenny Gray, etc., and he had taken to hard drinking, which soon turned him, as you see, quite into a beast. End of chapter three. Lady Delacour History, Part One. Section Four, Lady Delacour's History, Part Two, of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sandra Estenson. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. Section Four. I forgot to tell you that I had three children during the first five years of my marriage. The first was a boy. He was born dead, and my lord and all his odious relations laid blame upon me because I would not be kept prisoner half a year by an old mother of his, a vile Cassandra, who was always prophesying that my child would not be born alive. My second child was a girl, but a poor, diminutive, sickly thing. It was the fashion at this time for fine mothers to suckle their own children. So much the worse for the poor brats. Fine nurses never made fine children. There was a prodigious rout made about the matter, a vast deal of sentiment and sympathy and compliments and inquiries. But after the novelty was over, I became heartily sick of the business, and at the end of about three months my poor child was sick, too. I don't much like to think of it. It died. If I had put it out to nurse, I should have been thought by my friends as an unnatural mother. But I should have saved its life. I should have bewailed the loss of the infant more. Lord de la Cour's relations and my own had not made such lamentations upon the occasion that I was stunned. I couldn't or wouldn't shed a tear. And I left it to the old dowager to perform in public as she wished the part of the chief mourner and to comfort herself in private by lifting up her hands and eyes and railing at me as the most insensible of mothers. All this time I suffered more than she did. But that is what she shall never have the satisfaction of knowing. I determined that if I ever had another child, I would not have the barbarity to nurse it myself. Accordingly, when my third child, a girl, was born, I sent it off immediately to the country, to a stout, healthy, broad-faced nurse under whose care it could grow and be flourished. So that at three years old, when it was brought back to me, I could scarcely believe the chubby little thing was my own child. The same reasons which convinced me I ought not to nurse my own child determined me a pris fort raison not to undertake its education. Lord Delacour could not bear the child, because it was not a boy. The girl was put under the care of a governess, who plagued my heart out with her airs and tracasseries for three or four years, at the end of which time, as she turned out to be Lord Delacour's mistress in form, I was obliged in form to beg she would leave my house, and I put her pupil into better hands, I hope, at a celebrated academy for young ladies. There she will, at any rate, be better instructed than she could be at home. I beg your pardon, my dear, for this digression on nursing and schooling, but I only wanted to explain to you why it was that, when I was weary of the business, I still went on in a course of dissipation. You see, I had nothing at home, either in the shape of husband or children, to engage my affections. I believe it was this aching void in my heart which made me, 
after looking abroad some time for a bosom friend, take such a prodigious fancy to Mrs. Frick. She was just then coming into fashion. She struck me the first time I met her, as being downright ugly. There was a wild oddity in her countenance, which made one stare at her, and she was delighted to be stared at, especially by me. So we were mutually agreeable to each other, I as starer, and she as starey. Harriet Freck had, without comparison, more assurance than any man or woman I ever saw. She was downright brass but of the finest kind, Corinthian brass. She was one of the first who brought what I call harem-scarum manners into fashion. I told you that she had insurance. Impudence, I should have called it, for no other word is strong enough. Such things as I have heard Harriet Freck say, you will not believe it, but her conversation at first absolutely made me, like an old-fashioned fool, wish I had a fan to play with. But to my astonishment, all this took, surprisingly, with a set of fashionable young men. I found it necessary to reform my manners. If I had not taken heart of grace— and publicly abjured the heresies of false delicacy, I should have been excommunicated. Lady Delacour's sprightly elegance, allow me to speak of myself in the style in which the newspaper writers talk of me, Lady Delacour's sprightly elegance was pale, not to say faded, pink, compared with the scarlet of Mrs. Freck's dashing audacity. As my rival, she would on certain ground have beat me hollow. It was therefore good policy to make her my friend. We joined forces, and nothing could stand against us. But I have no right to give myself credit for good policy in forming this intimacy. I really followed the dictates of my heart or my imagination, there was a frankness in Harriet's manner, which I mistook for artlessness of character. She spoke with such unbounded freedom on certain subjects, that I gave her credit for unbounded sincerity on all subjects. She had the talent of making the world believe that virtue to be invulnerable by nature, which disdained the common outworks of art for its defense. I, amongst others, took it for granted that the woman who could make it her sport to touch the brink of all we hate must have a stronger head than other people. I have since been convinced, however, of my mistake. I am persuaded that few can touch the brink without tumbling headlong down the precipice. Don't apply this, my dear, literally, to the person of whom we are speaking. I am not base enough to betray her secrets. However, I may have been provoked by her treachery. Of her character and history you shall hear nothing but what is necessary for my own justification. The league of amity between us was scarcely ratified before my Lord Delacour came, with his wise remonstrating face, to beg me to consider what was due to my honor and his. Like the cosmogony man and the vicar of Wakefield, he came out over and over with this cant phrase, which had once stood him instead. Do you think, my lord, said I, that because I gave up poor Lawless to oblige you, I shall give up all common sense to suit myself to your taste? Harriet Freck is visited by everybody but old dowagers and old maids. I am neither an old dowager nor an old maid. 
The consequence is obvious, my lord. Pertness in dialogue, my dear, often succeeds better with my lord than wit. I therefore saved the sterling gold, and bestowed upon him nothing but counters. I tell you this to save the credit of my taste and judgment. But to return to my friendship for Harriet Freck, I, of course, repeated to her every word which had passed between my husband and me. She out heroded Herod upon the occasion, and laughed so much at what she called my folly in pleading guilty in the lawless cause, that I was downright ashamed of myself, and purely to prove my innocence, I determined, upon the first convenient opportunity, to renew my intimacy with the colonel. The opportunity which I so ardently desired of redeeming my independence was not long wanting. Lawless, as my stars, which you know are always more in fault than ourselves, would have it, returned just at this time from the continent, where he had been with his regiment. He returned with a wound across his forehead and a black fillet, which made him look something more like a hero and ten times more like a coxcomb than ever. He was in fashion at all the events, and amongst other ladies. Mrs. Luttridge, odious Mrs. Luttridge, smiled upon him. The colonel, however, had taste enough to know the difference between smile and smile. He laid himself and his laurels at my feet, and I carried him and them about in triumph. Wherever I went, especially to Mrs. Luttridge's envy and scandal, joined hands to attack me, and I heard wondering and whispering wherever I went. I had no object in view but to provoke my husband. Therefore, conscious of the purity of my intentions, it was my delight to brave the opinion of the wondering world. I gave myself no concern about the effect my coquetry might have upon the object of this flirtation. Poor Lawless! Heart, I took it for granted, he had none. How should a coxcomb come by a heart? Vanity, I knew he had in abundance. But this gave me no alarm, as I thought that if it should ever make him forget himself, I mean, forget what was due to me, I could, by one flash of my wit, strike him to the earth, or blast him for ever. One night we had been together at Mrs. Luttridge's. She, amongst other things, kept a faro bank, and, I am convinced, cheated. Be that as it may, I lost an immensity of money, and it was my pride to lose with as much gaiety as anybody else could win. So I was, or it appeared to be, in uncommonly high spirits, and Lawless had his share of my good humor. We left Mrs. Luttridge's together early, about half-past one. As the colonel was going to hand me to my carriage, a smart-looking young man, as I thought, came up close to the coach door and stared me full in the face. I was not a woman to be disconcerted at such things as this, but I really was startled when the young fellow jumped into the carriage after me. I thought he was mad. I had only courage enough to scream. The lawless seized hold of the intruder to drag him out and he dragged the youth, exclaiming in a high tone, "'What is the meaning of all this, sir? Who the devil are you? My name's Lawless. Who the devil are you?' The answer to this was a convulsion of laughter. By the laugh, I knew it to be Harriet Freck. "'Who am I? Only a Freck!' 
cried she, shake hands. I gave her my hand into the carriage she sprang, and desired the colonel to follow her. Lawless laughed, we all laughed, and drove away. Where do you think I've been? said Harriet, in the gallery of the House of Commons, almost squeezed to death these few hours. But I swore I'd hear Sheridan's speech to-night, and I did. Betted fifty guineas I would with Mrs. Luttridge, and have won. Fun and freck for ever, huzzah! Harriet was mad with spirits, and so noisy and unmanageable, that, as I told her, I was sure she was drunk. Lawless, in his silly way, laughed incessantly, and I was so taken up with her oddities that for some time I did not perceive we were going the Lord knows where, till at last, when the larum of Harriet's voice ceased for an instant, I was struck with the strange sound of the carriage. "'Where are we? Not upon the stones, I'm sure,' said I, and putting my head out of the window, I saw we were beyond the turnpike. "'The coachman's drunk as well as you, Harriet,' said I, "'and I was going to pull the string to stop him. "'But Harriet had hold of it. "'The man is going very right,' she said. "'I've told him where to go. "'Now don't fancy that Lawless and I are going to run away with you. "'All this is unnecessary nowadays, thank God.' To this I agreed, and laughed, for fear of being ridiculous. "'Guess where you are going,' said Harriet. I guessed and guessed, but could not guess right, and my merry companions were infinitely diverted with my perplexity and impatience, more especially, as I believe, in spirit of all my efforts. I grew rather graver than usual, we went on to the end of Sloane Street, and quite out of town. At last we stopped. It was dark. The footman's flame was out. I could only just see by the lamps that were at the door of a lone, odd-looking house. The house door opened, and an old woman appeared with a lantern in her hand. "'Where is this farce, or freak, or whatever you call it, to end?' said I, as Harriet pulled me into the dark passage along with her. "'Alas, my dear Belinda,' said Lady Delacour, pausing, "'I little foresaw where or how it was to end, but I am not come yet to the tragical part of my story.' and as long as I can laugh, I will, as the old woman and her miserable light went on before us, I could almost have thought of Sir Bertrand, or of some German horrifications. But I heard Lawless, who never could help laughing at the wrong time, bursting behind me with a sense of his own superiority. "'Now you will learn your destiny, Lady Delacour,' said Harriet, in a solemn tone. "'Yes, from the celebrated Mrs. W., the modern dealer in art magic,' I said, laughing. "'For now I guess whereabouts I am.' Colonel Lawless's laugh broke the spell. "'Harriet Freck.' Never whilst you live expect to succeed in the sublime. Harriet swore at the colonel for the veriest spoil-sport she had ever seen, and she whispered to me, The reason he laughs is because he is afraid of our suspecting the truth of him, that he believes tout est bon in conjuration and the devil and all that. The old woman, whose cue I found was to be dumb, opened a door at the top of a narrow staircase, and pointing to a tall figure, completely enveloped in fur, 
left us to our fate. I will not trouble you with a pompous description of all the mummery of the scene, my dear, as I despair of being able to frighten you out of your wits. I should have been downright angry with Harriet Freck for bringing me to such a place, but that I knew women of the first fashion had been with Mrs. W. before us, some in sober sadness, some by way of frolic, so as there was no fear of being ridiculous, there was no shame, you know, and my conscience was quite at ease. Harriet had no conscience. She was always at ease, and never more so than in male attire, which she had been told became her particularly. She supported the character of a young Greek with such spirit and truth that I am sure no common conjurer could have discovered anything feminine about her. She rattled on with a set of nonsensical questions, and among other things she asked, How soon will Lady Delacour marry again, after her lord's death? She will never marry after her lord's death, answered the oracle, then she will marry during his lifetime, said Harriet. True, answered the oracle. Colonel Lawless laughed. I was angry, and the colonel would have been quiet, for he was a gentleman. But there was no such thing as managing Mrs. Frack, who, though she had laid aside the modesty of her own sex, had not acquired the decency of the other. Who is to be Lady Delacour's second husband? cried she. You'll not offend any of the present company by naming the man. Her second husband I cannot name, replied the oracle, but let her beware of a lawless lover. Mrs. Freck and Colonel Lawless, encouraged by her, triumphed over me without mercy, I may say without shame. Well, my dear, I'm in a hurry to have done with all this though I doted upon folly, yet I was terrified at the thoughts of anything worse. The idea of a divorce, the public brand of a shameful life, shocked me in spite of all my real and my assumed levity. Oh, that I had, at this instant, dared to be myself! But my fear of ridicule was greater than my fear of vice, "'Bless me, my dear Lady Delacour,' whispered Harriet as we left the house. "'What can make you in such a desperate hurry to get home?' "'You gape and fidget. "'One would think you had never sat up a night before in your life. "'I verily believe you are afraid to trust yourself with us. "'Which of us are you afraid of? "'Lawless? "'Or me?' For yourself. There was a tone of contempt in the last words which piqued me to the quick, and however strange it may seem, I was now anxious only to convince Harriet that I was not afraid of myself. False shame made me act as if I had no shame. You would not suspect me of knowing anything of false shame. But depend on it, my dear, many, who appear to have as much assurance as I have, are secretly its slaves. I moralize, because I am come to the part of my story, which I should almost be glad to omit. But I promised you that there should be no sins of omission. It was light, but not broad daylight when we got to Kingsbridge. Lawless, encouraged, for I cannot deny it, by the levity of my manner as well as of Harriet's, was in higher and more familiar spirits than I ever saw him. Mrs. Freck desired me to set her down at her sister's, who lived in Grosvenor Place. So I did, and I beg you to believe 
that I was in an agony to get rid of my colonel at the same time. But you know I could not, before Harriet Freak, absolutely say to him, get out. Indeed, to tell things as they were, it was scarcely possible to guess by my manner that I was under anxiety. I acted my part so well, or so ill, as Harriet Freak jumped out of the coach, a cock crowned in the area of her sister's house. There, cried Harriet, do you hear the cock crow, Lady Delacour? Now it's to be hoped your fear of goblins is over, else I would not be so cruel as to leave the pretty dear all alone. All alone, answered I. Your friend, the colonel, is much obliged to you for making nobody of him. My friend, the colonel, whispered Harriet, leaning with her bold, masculine arms on the coach door. My friend, the colonel, is much obliged to me, I'm sure, for remembering what the cunning or the knowing woman told us just now. So when I said I left you alone, I was not guilty of a bull, was I? I had the grace to be heartily ashamed of this speech, and called out in utter confusion, To Berkeley Square! But where shall I set you down, Colonel? Harriet, good morning. Don't forget you are in man's clothes. I did not dare to repeat the question of where shall I set you down, Colonel, at this instant, because Harriet gave me such an arch, sneering look, as much as to say, still afraid of yourself. We drove on. I am persuaded that the confusion which, in spite of all my efforts, broke through my affected levity, encouraged lawless, who was naturally a coxcomb and a fool, to believe that I was actually his, else he never could have been so insolent. In short, my dear, before we got through the turnpike, I was downright obliged to say to him, Get out, which I did with a degree of indignation that quite astonished him. He muttered something about ladies knowing their minds, and I own, though I went off with flying colors, I secretly blamed myself as much as I did him. And I blamed Harriet more than I did either. I sent for her the next day as soon as I could to consult her. She expressed such astonishment and so much concern at this catastrophe of our night's frolic, and blamed herself with so many oaths, and execrated lawless for a coxcomb, so much to the ease and satisfaction of my conscience, that I was confirmed in my good opinion of her, and indeed felt for the most lively affection and esteem, for observe, with me esteem ever followed affection, instead of affection following esteem. Woe be to all who in morals preposterously put the cart before the horse. But to proceed with my history, all fashionable historians stop to make reflections, supposing that no one else can have the sense to make any. My esteemed friend agreed with me that it would be best for all parties concerned to hush up this business, that as Lawless was going out of town in a few days to be elected for a borough, we should get rid of him in the best possible way, without more last words, that he had been punished sufficiently on the spot, and that to punish twice for the same offence, once in private, and once in public, would be contrary to the laws of English men and English women, and in my case would be contrary to the evident dictates of prudence, because I could not complain without calling upon Lord Delacour to call Lawless out. 
this i could not do without acknowledging that his lordship had been in the right in warning me about his honour and my own which old phrase i dreaded to hear for the ninety-ninth time besides lord delacour was the last man in the world i should have chosen for my knight though unluckily he was my lord besides all things considered i thought the whole story might not tell so well in the world for me tell it which way i would we therefore agreed that it would be most expedient to hold our tongues we took it for granted that lawless would hold his as for my people they knew nothing i thought or if they did i was sure of them how the thing got abroad i could not at the time conceive though now i am well acquainted with the baseness and treachery of the woman i called my friend the affair was known and talked of everywhere the next day and the story was told especially at odious mrs luttridge's with such exaggerations as drove me almost mad i was enraged inconceivably enraged with lawless for whom i imagined the reports originated i was venting my indignation against him in a room full of company where i had just made my story good when a gentleman to whom I was a stranger came in breathless with the news that Colonel Lawless was killed in a duel by Lord Delacour, that they were carrying him home to his mother's, and that the body was just going by the door. The company all crowded to the windows immediately, and I was left standing alone till I could stand no longer. What was said or done after this I do not remember. I only know that when I came to myself, the most dreadful sensation I ever experienced was the certainty that I had the blood of a fellow creature to answer for. I wonder said lady delacour breaking off at this part of her history and rising suddenly i wonder what has become of marriott surely it is time for me to have my drops miss portman have the goodness to ring for i must have something immediately belinda was terrified at the wildness of her manner Lady Delacour became more composed, or more constrained upon herself, at the sight of Marriott. Marriott brought from the closet in her lady's room the drops, which Lady Delacour swallowed with precipitation. Then she ordered coffee, and afterwards chase café, and at last, turning to Belinda with a forced smile, she said, Now, shall the Princess Scheherazade go on with her story? End of section four. Lady Delacour's History. Part two. Recording by Sandra Estenson. Chapter Four of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. Chapter Four. Lady Delacour's history continued. I left off 
with the true skill of a good storyteller at the most interesting part a duel and yet duels are so common now that they are really vulgar incidents but we think that a duel concerning ourselves must be more extraordinary than any other we hear of men being shot in duels about nothing every day so it's really a weakness in me to think so much about poor lawless's death as harriet freak said to me at the time she expected to see me show sorrow in public but very fortunately for me she roused my pride which was always stronger than my reason and i behaved myself upon the occasion as became a fine lady there were some things however i could hardly stand you must know that lawless fool and coxcomb as he was had some magnanimity and showed it as some people do from whom it is least expected on his deathbed the last words he said were lady delacour is innocent i charge you don't prosecute lord delacour this he said to his mother who to complete my misery is one of the most respectable women in england and was most desperately fond of lawless who was an only son she never has recovered his loss do you remember asking me who a tall elderly lady in mourning was that you saw getting into her carriage one day at south audley street chapel as we passed by in our way to the park that was lady lawless i believe i didn't answer you at the time i meet her every now and then to me a spectre of dismay but as harriet freak said certainly such a man as poor lawless was a useless being in society however he may be regretted by a doting mother we should see things in a philosophical light if we can i should not have suffered half as much as i did if he had been a man of a stronger understanding but he was a poor vain weak creature that i actually drew on and duped with my own coquetry whilst all the time i was endeavouring only to plague lord delacour i was punished enough by the airs his lordship doubly gave himself upon the strength of his valour and his judgment they roused me completely and i blamed him with all my might and got an enormous party of my friends i mean my acquaintance to run him down full cry for having fought for me it was absurd it was rash it was want of proper confidence in his wife thus we said lord delacour had his partisans it is true amongst whom the loudest was odious mrs luttridge i embraced the first opportunity i met with of retaliation you must know that mrs luttridge besides being a great faro player was a great dabbler in politics for she was almost as fond of power as of money she talked loud and fluently and had somehow or other partly by intriguing partly by relationship connected herself with some of the leading men in parliament there was to be a contested election in our country mr luttridge had a good estate there next to lord delacour's and being of an ancient family and keeping a good table the luttridges were popular enough at the first news of an election out comes a flaming advertisement from mr luttridge away posted mrs luttridge to begin her canvas and away posted lady delacour after her to canvas for a cousin of harriet freak this was a new scene for me but i piqued myself on the versatility of my talents and i laid myself out in please all the squires and what was more difficult all the squires ladies in the shire i was ambitious to have it said of me that i was the finest figure that ever appeared upon a canvas o oh, ye shirens how hard did i work to obtain your praise all that the combined force of vanity and hatred could inspire i performed and with success you have but little curiosity i presume to know how many hogsheads of port went down the throat of john bull or how many hecatombs were offered up to the genius of english liberty 
my hatred to mrs luttridge was of course called love of my country lady delacour was defied by all true patriots and luckily a handsome legacy left me for my spirit by an uncle who died six weeks before the election enabled us to sustain the expense of my apotheosis the day of election came harriot freak and i made our appearance on the hustings dressed in splendid party uniforms and before us our knights and squires held two enormous panniers full of ribbons and cockades which we distributed with a grace that won all hearts if not all votes mrs luttridge thought the panniers would carry the election and forthwith she sent off an express for a pair of panniers twice as large as ours i took out my pencil and drew a caricature of the ass and her panniers wrote an epigram at the bottom of it and the epigram and the caricature was soon in the hands of half the shire the verses were as bad as impromptus usually are and the drawing was not much better than the writing but the good will of the critics supplied all my deficiencies and never was more praise bestowed upon the pen of burke or the pencil of reynolds than was lavished upon me by my honest friends my dear belinda if you will not quarrel with the quality you may have what quantity of praise you please mrs luttridge as i hoped and expected was beyond measure enraged at the sight of the caricature and epigram she was besides being a gamester and a politician what do you think an excellent shot she wished she said to be a man that she might be qualified to take proper notice of my conduct the same kind friends who showed her my epigram repeated to me her observation upon it harriot freak was at my elbow and offered to take any message i might think proper to mrs luttridge i scarcely thought her in earnest till she added that the only way left nowadays for a woman to distinguish herself was by spirit as everything else was grown cheap and vulgar in the eyes of men that she knew one of the cleverest young men in england and a man of fashion into the bargain who was just going to publish a treatise upon the propriety and necessity of female duelling and that he had demonstrated beyond a possibility of doubt that civilized society could not exist half a century longer without this necessary improvement i had prodigious deference for the masculine superiority as i thought it of harriot's understanding she was a philosopher and a fine lady i was only a fine lady i had never fired a pistol in my life and i was a little inclined to cowardice but harriot offered to bet any wager upon the steadiness of my hand and assured me that i should charm all beholders in male attire in short as my second if i would furnish her with proper credentials she swore she would undertake to furnish me with clothes and pistols and courage and everything i wanted i sat down to pen my challenge when i was writing it my hand did not tremble much not more than my lord delacour's always does the challenge was very prettily worded i believe i can repeat it lady delacour presents her compliments to mrs luttridge she is informed that mrs luttridge wishes she were a man that she might be qualified to take proper notice of lady delacour's conduct lady delacour begs leave to assure mrs luttridge that though she has the misfortune to be a woman she is willing to account for her conduct in any manner mrs luttridge may think proper and at any hour and place she may appoint lady delacour leaves the choice of the weapons to mrs luttridge mrs harriot freak who has the honour of presenting this note is lady delacour's friend upon this occasion i cannot repeat mrs luttridge's answer all i know is it was not half as neatly worded as my note but the essential part of it was that she accepted my challenge with pleasure and should do herself the honour of meeting me at six o'clock the next morning that miss honor o'grady would be her friend upon the occasion 
and that pistols were the weapons she preferred. The place of appointment was behind an old barn about two miles from the town. The hour was fixed to be early in the morning, to prevent all probability of interruption. In the evening Harriet and I rode to the ground. There were several bullets sticking in the posts of the barn. This was the place where Mrs. Luttridge had been accustomed to exercise herself in firing at a mark. I own my courage oozed out a little at this sight. The Duke de la Rochefoucauld, I believe, said truly that many would be cowards if they dared. There seemed to me to be no physical and less moral necessity for my fighting this duel, but I did not venture to reason on a point of honour with my spirited second. I bravadoed to Harriet most magnanimously, but at night, when Marriott was undressing me, I could not forbear giving her a hint which I thought might tend to preserve the king's peace, and the peace of the county. I went to the ground in the morning in good spirits, and with a safe conscience. Harriet was in admiration of my lion-port, and to do her justice, she conducted herself with great coolness upon the occasion. But then it may be observed that it was I who was to stand fire, and not she. I thought of poor Lawless a billion of times, at least as we were going to the ground, and I had my presentiments and my confused notions of poetic justice. But poetic justice and all other sorts of justice went clear out of my head when I saw my antagonist and her friend, actually pistol in hand, waiting for us. They were both in men's clothes. I secretly called upon the name of Marriott with fervency, and I looked round with more anxiety than ever Bluebeard's wife, or Anne, sister Anne, looked to see if anybody was coming. Nothing was to be seen but the grass blown by the wind. No Marriott to throw herself to éplore between the combatants, no peace officers to bind us over to our good behaviour, no deliverance at hand and Mrs. Luttridge, by all the laws of honour, as challenged, was to have the first shot. Oh, those laws of honour! I was upon the point of making an apology, in spite of them all, when, to my inexpressible joy, I was relieved from the dreadful alternative of being shot through the head, or of becoming a laughing-stock for life, by an incident less heroic, I'll grant you, than opportune but you shall have the whole scene as well as I can recollect it, as well, for those who for the first time go into a field of battle do not, as I am credibly informed and internally persuaded, always find the clearness of their memories improved by the novelty of their situation. Mrs. Luttridge, when we came up, was leaning with a truly martial negligence against the wall of the barn with her pistol as I told you, in her hand. She spoke not a word, but her second, Miss Honor O'Grady, advanced towards us immediately, and taking off her hat, very manfully addressed herself to my second. Mistress Harriet Freak, I presume, if I mistake not, Harriet bowed slightly and answered. Miss Honor O'Grady, I presume, if I mistake not? The same at your service, replied Miss Honor. I have a few words to suggest that may save a great deal of noise and bloodshed and ill-will. As to noise, said Harriot, it is a thing in which I delight, therefore I beg that mayn't be spared on my account. As to bloodshed, I beg that may not be spared on Lady Delacour's account, for her honour, I am sure, is dearer to her than her blood. And as to ill-will, I should be concerned to have that saved on Mrs. Luttridge's account. As we all know, it is a thing in which she delights, even more than I do in noise, or Lady Delacour in blood. But pray proceed, Miss Honor O'Grady. You have a few words to suggest. Yes, I would willingly observe, as it is my duty to my principal, said Honor, that one who is compelled to fire her pistol with her left hand, though ever so good a shot, naturally— is by no means on a footing with one who has the advantage of her right hand. 
Harriet rubbed my pistol with the sleeve of her coat, and I, recovering my wit with my hopes of being witty with impunity, answered, Unquestionably, left-handed wisdom and left-handed courage are neither of them the very best of their kinds. But we must content ourselves with them if we can have no other. That if, cried Honor O'Grady, is not like most of the family of the ifs a peacemaker. My Lady Delacour, I was going to observe that my principal has met with an unfortunate accident in the shape of a whitlow on the forefinger of her right hand, which incapacitates her from drawing a trigger. But I am at your service, ladies, either of you, that can put up with a disappointment with good humour. I never during the whole course of my existence was more disposed to bear a disappointment with good humour, to prove that I was incapable of bearing malice, and to oblige the seconds for form's sake. I agreed that we should take our ground and fire our pistols into the air. Mrs. Luttridge, with her left-handed wisdom, fired first, and I, with great magnanimity, followed her example. I must do my adversaries, second Miss Honor O'Grady, the justice to observe, that in this whole affair she conducted herself not only with a spirit, but with a good nature and generosity characteristic of her nation. We met enemies and parted friends. Life is a tragic comedy, though the critics will allow of no such thing in their books. It is a true representation of what passes in the world, and of all lives mine has been the most grotesque mixture or alternation, I should say, of tragedy and comedy. All this is apropos to something I have not told you yet. This comic duel ended tragically for me. How, you say? Why, tis clear that I was not shot through the head, but it would have been better, a hundred times better for me, if I had. I should have been spared in this life at least the torments of the damned. I was not used to priming and loading. My pistol was overcharged. When I fired it, it recoiled, and I received a blow on my breast, the consequences of which you have seen. The pain was nothing at the moment compared with what I have since experienced, but I will not complain till I cannot avoid it. I had not, at the time, I received the blow, much leisure for lamentation, for I had scarcely discharged my pistol when we heard a loud shout on the other side of the barn and a crowd of townspeople, country people, and haymakers came pouring down the lane towards us, with rakes and pitchforks in their hands. An English mob is really a formidable thing. Marriott had mismanaged her business most strangely. She had indeed spread a report of a duel, a female duel, but the untutored sense of propriety amongst these rustics was so shocked at the idea of a duel fought by women in men's clothes, that I verily believed they would have thrown us into the river with all their hearts. Stupid blockheads! I am convinced that they would not have been half so much scandalized if we had boxed in petticoats. The want of these petticoats had nearly proved our destruction, or at least our disgrace. A peeress, after being ducked, could never have held her head above water again with any grace. The mob had just closed round us, crying, Shame! 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 Duck him! Duck him! Gentle or simple! Duck him! Duck him! When their attention was suddenly turned towards a person who was driving up the lane a large herd of squeaking, grunting pigs. The person was clad in splendid regimentals, and he was armed with a long pole, to the end of which hung a bladder. And his pigs were frightened, and they ran squeaking from one side of the road to the other. And the pig-driver in regimentals, in the midst of the noise, could not without difficulty make his voice heard. But at last he was understood to say that a bet of a hundred guineas depended upon his being able to keep these pigs ahead of a flock of turkeys that were following them and he begged the mob to give him his pig's fair play. 
at the news of this wager and at the sight of the gentleman turned pig driver the mob were in raptures and at the sound of his voice harriot freke immediately exclaimed clarence hervey by all that's lucky clarence hervey interrupted belinda clarence hervey my dear said lady delacour coolly he can do everything you know even drive pigs better than anybody else but let me go on harriot freke shouted in a stentorian voice which actually made your pig driver start she explained to him in french our distress and the cause of it clarence was as i suppose you have discovered long ago that cleverest young man in england who had written on the propriety and necessity of female duelling he answered harriot in french to attempt your rescue by force would be vain but i will do better i will make a diversion in your favour immediately our hero addressing himself to the sturdy fellow who held me in custody exclaimed hussa my boys old england for ever yonder comes a frenchman with a flock of turkeys my pigs will beat them for a hundred guineas old england for ever hussa as he spoke the french officer with whom clarence hervey had laid the wager appeared at the turn of the lane his turkeys half flying half hobbling up the road before him the frenchman waved a red streamer over the heads of his flock clarence shook a pool from the top of which hung a bladder full of beans the pigs grunted the turkeys gobbled arid the mob shouted eager for the fame of old england the crowd followed clarence with loud acclamations the french officer was followed with groans and hisses so great was the confusion and so great the seal of the patriots that even the pleasure of ducking the female duelists was forgotten in the general enthusiasm all eyes and all hearts were intent upon the race and now the turkeys got foremost and now the pigs but when we came within sight of the horse pond i heard one man cry don't forget the ducking how i trembled but our knight shouted to his followers for the love of old england my brave boys keep between my pigs and the pond if our pigs see the water they'll run to it and england's undone the whole fury of the mob was by this speech conducted away from us on on my boys into town to the market-place whoever gains the market-place first wins the day our general shook the rattling bladder in triumph over the heads of the swinish multitude and we followed in perfect security in his train into the town men women and children crowded to the windows and doors retreat into the first place you can whispered clarence to us we were close to him harriot freke pushed her way into a milliner's shop i could not get in after her for a frightened pig turned back suddenly and almost threw me down clarence harvey caught me and favoured my retreat into the shop but poor clarence lost his bet by his gallantry whilst he was manoeuvring in my favour the turkeys got several yards ahead of the pigs and reaching the market-place first won the race the french officer found great difficulty in getting safe out of the town but clarence represented to the mob that he was a prisoner on his parole and that it would be unlike englishmen to insult a prisoner so he got off without being pelted and they both returned in safety to the house of general y where they were to dine and where they entertained a large party of officers with the account of this adventure mrs freke and i rejoiced in our escape and we thought that the whole business was now over but in this we were mistaken the news of our duel which had spread in the town raised such an uproar as had never been heard even at the noisiest election would you believe it the fate of the election turned upon this duel the common people one and all declared that they would not vote either for mr luttridge or mr freak because as how but i need not repeat all the platitudes that they said in short neither ribbons nor brandy could bring them to reason 
With true English pig-headedness, they went every man of them and polled for an independent candidate of their own choosing, whose wife, forsooth, was a proper behaved woman. The only thing I had to console me for all this was Clarence Harvey's opinion that I looked better in man's clothes than my friend Harriot Freak. Clarence was charmed with my spirit and grace, but he had not leisure at that time to attach himself seriously to me or to anything. He was then about nineteen or twenty. He was all vivacity, presumption, and paradox. He was enthusiastic in support of his opinions, but he was at the same time the most candid man in the world, for there was no set of tenets which could be called exclusively his. He adopted in liberal rotation every possible absurdity, and, to do him justice, defended each in his turn with the most ingenious arguments that could be devised and with a flow of words which charmed the ear, if not the sense. His essay on female duelling was a most extraordinary performance. It was handed about in manuscript till it was worn out. He talked of publishing it and dedicating it to me. However, this scheme, amongst a million of others, he talked of, but never put into execution. Luckily for him, many of his follies evaporated in words. I saw but little either of him or his follies at this time. All I know about him is that after he had lost his bet of a hundred guineas as a pig-driver, by his knight-errantry in rescuing the female duelists from a mob, he wrote a very charming copy of verses upon the occasion and that he was so much provoked by the stupidity of some of his brother officers, who could not understand the verses, that he took a disgust to the army, and sold his commission. He set out upon a tour to the continent, and I returned with Harriet Freak to London, and forgot the existence of such a person as Clarence Hervey for three or four years. Unless people can be of some use, or unless they are actually present, let them be ever so agreeable or meritorious, we are very apt to forget them. One grows strangely selfish by living in the world. It is a perfect cure for romantic notions of gratitude, and love, and so forth. If I had lived in the country, in an old manor-house, Clarence Harvey would have doubtless reigned paramount in my imagination, as the deliverer of my life, etc. But in London one has no time for thinking of deliverers. And yet what I did with my time I cannot tell you. Tis gone, and no trace left. One day after another went, I know not how. Had I wept for every day I lost, I am sure I should have cried my eyes out before this time. If I had enjoyed any amusement in the midst of this dissipation, it would all have been very well. But I declare to you, in confidence, I have been tired to death. Nothing can be more monotonous than the life of a hackneyed fine lady. I question whether a dray-horse or a horse in a mill would willingly exchange places with one if they could know as much of the matter as I do. You are surprised at hearing all this from me? My dear Belinda, how I envy you! You are not yet tired of everything. The world has still the gloss of novelty for you. But don't expect that can last above a season. My first winter was certainly entertaining enough. One begins with being charmed with the bustle and glare, and what the French call spectacle. This is over. I think in six months. I can but just recollect having been amused at the theatres and the opera and the Pantheon and Ranelagh, and all those places for their own sakes. Soon, very soon, we go out to see people, not things. Then we grow tired of seeing people. Then we grow tired of being seen by people. And then we go out merely because we can't stay at home. 
a dismal story, and a true one. Excuse me for showing you the simple truth. Well-dressed falsehood is a personage much more presentable. I am now come to an epoch in my history in which there is a dearth of extraordinary events. What shall I do? Shall I invent? I would if I could, but I cannot. Then I must confess to you that during these last four years I should have died of ennui if I had not been kept alive by my hatred of Mrs. Luttridge and of my husband. I don't know which I hate most. Oh, yes, I do. I certainly hate Mrs. Luttridge the most, for a woman can always hate a woman more than she can hate a man, unless she has been in love with him which I never was with poor Lord Delacour. Yes, I certainly hate Mrs. Luttridge the most. I cannot count the number of extravagant things I have done on purpose to eclipse her. We have had rival routs, rival concerts, rival galas, rival theatres. She has cost me more than she's worth. But then I certainly have mortified her once a month at least. My hatred to Mrs. Luttridge, my dear, is the remote cause of my love for you, for it was the cause of my intimacy with your Aunt Stanhope. Mrs. Stanhope is really a clever woman. She knows how to turn the hatred of all her friends and acquaintance to her own advantage. To serve lovers is a thankless office compared with that of serving haters, polite haters, I mean. It may be dangerous, for aught I know, to interpose in the quarrels of those who hate their neighbors, not only with all their souls, but with all their strength. The barbarians fight it out, kiss and are friends. The quarrels which never come to blows are safer for a go-between, but even these are not to be compared to such as never come to words. Your true silent hatred is that which lasts for ever. The moment it was known that Mrs. Luttridge and I had come to the resolution never to speak to one another, your Aunt Stanhope began to minister to my hatred, so that she made herself quite agreeable. She one winter gave me notice that my adversary had set her heart upon having a magnificent entertainment on a particular day. On that day I determined, of course, to have a rival gala. Mrs. Stanhope's maid had a lover, a gardener, who lived at Chelsea, and the gardener had an aloe, which was expected soon to blow. Now a plant that blows, but once in a hundred years, is worth having. The gardener intended to make a public exhibition of it, by which he expected to gain about a hundred guineas. Your Aunt Stanhope's maid got it from him for me for fifty, and I had it whispered about that an aloe in full blow would stand in the middle of one of Lady Delacour's supper-tables. The difficulty was to make Mrs. Luttridge fix upon the very day we wanted, for, you know, we could not possibly put off the blowing of our aloe. Your Aunt Stanhope managed the thing admirably by means of a common friend who was not a suspected person with the Luttridges. In short, my dear, I gained my point. Everybody came from Mrs. Luttridges to me, or to my aloe. She had a prodigiously fine supper, but scarcely a soul stayed with her. They all came to see what could be seen but once in a hundred years. Now the aloe, you know, is of a cumbersome height for a supper ornament. My saloon luckily has a dome, and under the dome we placed it. Round the huge china vase in which it was planted, we placed the most beautiful, or rather the most expensive, hothouse plants we could procure. After all, the aloe was an ugly thing, but it answered my purpose. It made Mrs. Luttridge, as I am credibly informed, absolutely weep with vexation. I was excessively obliged to your Aunt Stanhope, and I assured her that if ever it were in my power she might depend upon my gratitude. 
pray when you write repeat the same thing to her and tell her that since she has introduced belinda portman to me i am a hundred times more obliged to her than ever i was before but to proceed with my important history i will not tire you with fighting over again all my battles in my seven years war with mrs luttridge i believe love is more to your taste than hatred therefore i will go on as fast as possible to clarence hervey's return from his travels he was much improved by them or at least i thought so for he was heard to declare that after all he had seen in france and italy lady delacour appeared to him the most charming woman of her age in europe the words of her age piqued me and i spared no pains to make him forget them a stupid man cannot readily be persuaded out of his senses what he sees he sees and neither more nor less but this the easiest thing in the world to catch hold of a man of genius you have nothing to do but to appeal from his senses to his imagination and then he sees with the eyes of his imagination and hears with the ears of his imagination and then no matter what the age beauty or wit of the charmer may be nor matter whether it be lady delacour or belinda portman i think i know clarence hervey's character au fin fond and i could lead him where i pleased but don't be alarmed my dear you know i can't lead him into matrimony you look at me and from me and you don't well know which way to look you are surprised perhaps after all that passed all that i felt and all that i still feel about poor lawless i should not be cured of coquetry so am i surprised but habit fashion the devil i believe lead us on and then lord delacour is so obstinate and jealous you can't have forgotten the polite conversation that passed one morning at breakfast between his lordship and me about clarence hervey but neither does his lordship know nor does clarence hervey suspect that my object with him is to conceal from the world what i cannot conceal from myself that i am a dying woman i am and i see you think me a strange weak inconsistent creature i was intended for something better but now it is too late a coquette i have lived and a coquette i shall die i speak frankly to you let me have the glory of leading clarence hervey about with me in public for a few months longer then i must quit the stage as to love you know with me that is out of the question all i ask or wish for is admiration lady delacour paused and leaned back on the sofa she appeared in great pain oh i am sometimes resumed she as you see in terrible pain for two years after i gave myself that blow with a pistol i neglected the warning twings that i felt from time to time at last i was terrified marriott was the only person to whom i mentioned my fears and she was profoundly ignorant she flattered me with false hopes till alas it was in vain to doubt of the nature of my complaint then she urged me to consult a physician that i would not do i could not i never will consult a physician i would not for the universe have my situation known you stare you cannot enter into my feelings why my dear if i lose admiration what have i left would you have me live upon pity consider what a dreadful thing it must be to me who have no friends no family to be confined to a sick room a sick bed tis what i must come to at last but not yet not yet i have fortitude i should despise myself if i had no species of merit besides it is still some occupation to me to act my part in public and bustle noise nonsense if they do not amuse or interest me yet they stifle reflection 
may you never know what it is to feel remorse the idea of that poor wretch lawless whom i actually murdered as much as if i had shot him haunts me whenever i am alone it is now between eight and nine years since he died and i have lived ever since in a constant course of dissipation but it won't do conscience conscience will be heard since my health has been weakened i believe i have acquired more conscience i really think that my stupid lord who has neither ideas nor sensations except when he is intoxicated is a hundred times happier than i am but i will spare you belinda i promise that you should not have a scene and i will keep my word it is however a great relief to open my mind to one who has some feeling harriot freak has none i am convinced that she has no more feeling than this table i have not yet told you how she has used me you know that it was she who led or rather dragged me into that scrape with lawless for that i never reproached her you know it was she who frightened me into fighting that duel with mrs luttridge for this i never reproached her she has cost me my peace of mind my health my life she knows it and she forsakes betrays insults and leaves me to die i cannot command my temper sufficiently to be coherent when i speak of her i cannot express in words what i feel how could that most treacherous of beings for ten years make me believe that she was my friend whilst i thought she really loved me i pardoned her all her faults all what a comprehensive word all all i forgave and continually said but she has a good heart a good heart she has no heart she has no feeling for any living creature but herself i always thought that she cared for no one but for me but now i find she can throw me off as easily as she would her glove and this too i suppose she calls a frolic or in her own vulgar language fun can you believe it what do you think she has done my dear she has gone over at last to odious mrs luttridge actually she has gone down with the luttridges to the shire the independent member having taken the chiltern hundreds vacates his seat a new election comes on directly the luttridges are to bring in freak not harriet's cousin they have cut him but her husband who is now to commence senator he is to come in for the county upon condition that luttridge shall have freak's borough lord delacour without saying one syllable has promised his interest to this precious junto and lady delacour is left a miserable cipher my lord's motives i can clearly understand he lost a thousand guineas to mrs luttridge this winter and this is a convenient way of paying her why harriot should be so anxious to serve a husband whom she hates bitterly hates might surprise anybody who did not know les dessous des cartes as well as i do you are but just come into the world belinda the world of wickedness i mean my dear or you would have heard what a piece of work there was a few years ago about harriot freak and this cousin of hers without betraying her confidence i must tell you what is known to everybody that she went so far that if it had not been for me not a soul would have visited her she swam in the sea of folly out of her depth the tide of fashion ebbed and there was she left sticking knee-deep in the mud a ridiculous scandalous figure i had the courage and foolish good nature to hazard myself for her and actually dragged her to terra firma how she has gone on since i cannot tell you precisely because i am in the secret but the catastrophe is public 
To make her peace with her husband, she gives up her friend. Well, that I could have pardoned, if she had not been so base as to go over to Mrs. Luttridge. Mrs. Luttridge offered, I've seen the letter and Harriet's answer, to bring in Freak the husband, and to make both a county and a family peace, on condition that Harriet should give up all connection with Lady Delacour. Mrs. Luttridge knew this would provoke me beyond measure, and there is nothing she would not do to gratify her mean, malevolent passions. She has succeeded for once in her life. The blame of the duel, of course, is all thrown upon me. And, would you believe it, Harriot Freak, I am credibly informed, throws all the blame of Lawless's business on me. Nay, hints that Lawless's deathbed declaration of my innocence was very generous. Oh, the treachery, the baseness of this woman! and it was my fate to hear all this last night at the masquerade. I waited and waited and looked everywhere for Harriet. She was to be the widow Brady, I knew. At last the widow Brady made her appearance, and I accosted her with all my usual familiarity. The widow was dumb. I insisted upon knowing the cause of this sudden loss of speech. The widow took me into another apartment, unmasked, and there I beheld Mr. Free, the husband. I was astonished, had no idea of the truth. Where is Harriet, I believe, were the first words I said. Gone to the country. To the country? Yes, to the shire, with Mrs. Luttridge. Mrs. Luttridge, odious oh, Mrs. Luttridge! I could scarcely believe my senses. But Freak, who always hated me, believing that I led his wife instead of her leading me into mischief, would have enjoyed my astonishment and my rage. So I concealed both, with all possible presence of mind. He went on overwhelming me with explanations and copies of letters, and declared it was at Mrs. Freak's request he did and said all this and that he was to follow her early the next morning to the shire. I broke from him, simply wishing him a good journey, and as much family peace as his patience merited. He knows that I know his wife's history, and though she has no shame, he has some. I had the satisfaction to leave him blushing with anger, and I supported the character of the comic muse a full hour afterwards, to convince him that all their combined malice would fail to break my spirit in public. What I suffer in private is known only to my own heart. As she finished these words, Lady Delacour rose abruptly, and hummed a new opera air. Then she retired to her boudoir, saying with an air of levity to Belinda as she left the room, "'Good-bye, my dear Belinda.' I leave you to ruminate sweet and bitter thoughts, to think of the last speech and confession of Lady Delacour, or what will interest you much more, the first speech and confession of Clarence Harvey. End of chapter 4 Read by Lars Rolander Chapter Five of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. Chapter Five. Birthday dresses. Lady Delacour's history and the manner in which it was related excited in Belinda's mind astonishment, pity, admiration, and contempt, astonishment at her inconsistency, pity for her misfortunes, admiration of her talents, and contempt for her conduct. 
To these emotions succeeded the recollection of the promise which she had made, not to leave her in her last illness at the mercy of an insolent attendant. This promise Belinda thought of with terror. She dreaded the sight of sufferings which she knew must end in death. She dreaded the sight of that affected gaiety, and of the real levity which so ill became the condition of a dying woman. She trembled at the idea of being under the guidance of one who was so little able to conduct herself, and she could not help blaming her aunt Stanhope severely for placing her in such a perilous situation. It was obvious that some of Lady Delacour's history must have been known to Mrs. Stanhope and belinda the more she reflected was the more surprised at her aunt's having chosen such a chaperon for a young woman just entering into the world when the understanding is suddenly roused and forced to exert itself what a multitude of deductions it makes in a short time belinda saw things in a new light and for the first time in her life she reasoned for herself upon what she saw and felt. It is sometimes safer for young people to see than to hear of certain characters. At a distance Lady Delacour had appeared to Miss Portman, the happiest person in the world. Upon a nearer view she discovered that her ladyship was one of the most miserable of human beings. To have married her niece to such a man as Lord Delacour, Mrs. Stanhope would have thought the most fortunate thing imaginable. But it was now obvious to Belinda that neither the title of Viscountess nor the pleasure of spending three fortunes could ensure felicity. Lady Delacour confessed that in the midst of the utmost luxury and dissipation she had been a constant prey to ennui, that the want of domestic happiness could never be supplied by that public admiration of which she was so ambitious, and that the immoderate indulgence of her vanity had led her, by inevitable steps, into follies and imprudences, which had ruined her health and destroyed her peace of mind. If Lady Delacour, with all the advantages of wealth, rank, wit, and beauty, has not been able to make herself happy in this life of fashionable dissipation, said Belinda to herself. Why should I follow the same course, and expect to be more fortunate? It is singular that the very means which Mrs. Stanhope had taken to make a fine lady of her niece tended to produce an effect diametrically opposite to what might have been expected. The result of Belinda's reflections upon Lady Delacour's history was a resolution to benefit by her bad example, but this resolution it was more easy to form than to keep. Her ladyship, where she wished to please or to govern, had fascinating manners, and could alternately use the sarcastic powers of wit and the fond tone of persuasion to accomplish her purposes. It was Belinda's intention, in pursuance of her new plans of life, to spend, whilst she remained in London, as little money as possible upon superfluities and dress. She had at her own disposal only hundred pounds per annum, the interest of her fortune. But besides this, her aunt, who was desirous that she should go to court, and make a splendid figure there, had sent her a draught on her banker for two hundred guineas. "'You will, I trust,' said her aunt, at the conclusion of the letter, "'repay me when you are established in the world, as I hope and believe, from what I hear from Lady Delacour of the power of your charms. You will soon be, to the entire satisfaction of all your friends. Pray do not neglect to mention my friend Clarence Harvey particularly, when you write next, I understand, from one who is well acquainted with him, and who has actually seen his rent-roll, that he has a clear ten thousand pounds a year. Belinda resolved neither to go to court, nor to touch her aunt's two hundred guineas, and she wrote a long letter to her, in which she explained her feelings and views at large. 
In this letter she meant to have returned Mrs. Stanhope's draft, but her feelings and views changed between the writing of this epistle and the going out of the post. Mrs. Franks, the milliner, came in the interim, and brought home Lady Delacour's beautiful dress. It was not the sight of this, however, which changed Belinda's mind, but she could not resist Lady Delacour's raillery. "'Why, my dear,' said her ladyship, after having listened to all Miss Portman could say about her love of independence and the necessity of economy to preserve that independence. "'All this is prodigiously fine, but shall I translate it into plain English? You were mortally wounded the other night by some random reflections of a set of foolish young men, Clarence Harvey amongst the number, and instead of punishing them, you sagely and generously determined to punish yourself.' then to convince this youth that you have not a thought of those odious nets and cages that you have no design whatever upon his heart and that he has no manner of influence on yours you very judiciously determine at the first hint from him to change your dress your manners and your character and thus to say to him in as plain terms as possible you see sir a word to the wise is enough. I understand you disapprove of showy dress and coquetry, and therefore, as I dressed and coquetted only to please you, now I shall lay aside dress and coquetry, since I find that they are not to your taste. And I hope, sir, you like my simplicity. Depend upon it, my dear, Clarence Harry understands simplicity as well as you or I do. All this would be vastly well if he did not know that you overheard that conversation. But as he does know it, trust me, he will attribute any sudden change in your manners and appearance, right or wrong, to the motives I have mentioned. So don't, novice as you are, set about to maneuver you for yourself. Leave all that to your Aunt Stanhope, or to me. And then— you know your conscience will be all the time as white as your hands, which, by the by, Clarence Harvey the other day said were the whitest hands he had ever seen. Perhaps all this time you have taken it into your head that full dress will not become you, but I assure you that it will. You look well in anything." but from the hoops bewitching round the very shoe has power to wound. So come down to Mrs. Franks and order your birth-night dress like a reasonable creature. Like a reasonable creature, Miss Portman followed Lady Delacour, and bespoke, or rather let her ladyship bespeak for her, fifty guineas worth of elegance and fashion. You must go to the drawing-room with me next week, and be presented said lady delacour and then as it is the first time you must be elegantly dressed and you must not wear the same dress on the birth night so mrs franks let this be finished first as fast as you can and by that time perhaps we shall think of something superlatively charming for the night of nights mrs franks departed and belinda sighed a silver penny for your thoughts, cried Lady Delacour. You are thinking that you are like Camilla, and I like Mrs. Mitten. Novel reading, as I dare say you have been told by your governess, as I was told by mine, and she by hers, I suppose. Novel reading for young ladies is the most dangerous. Oh, Clarence Hireway, I protest cried Lady Delacour, as he at this instant entered the room. "'Do pray, Clarence, help me out, for the sake of this young lady, with a moral sentence against novel-reading. But that might go against your conscience or your interest. So we'll spare you. How I regret that we had not the charming serpent at the masquerade the other night!' The moment her ladyship mentioned the masquerade, the conversation which had passed at Lady Singleton's came full into Clarence Harvey's recollection, 
and his embarrassment was evident. Not indeed to Belinda, who had turned away to look over some new music that lay upon a stand at the farthest end of the room, and she found this such a wonderfully interesting occupation that she did not for some minutes hear or appear to hear one word of the conversation which was going on between Mr. Harvey and Lady Delacour. At last her ladyship tapped her upon the shoulder, saying in a playful tone, "'Miss Portman, I rest your attention at the suit of Clarence Hervey. This gentleman is passionately fond of music, to my curse, for he never sees my harp, but he worries me with reproaches for having left off playing upon it. Now he has just given me his word that he will not reproach me again for a month to come, if you will favour us with one air. I assure you, Clarence, that Belinda touches a harp divinely. She would absolutely charm. Your ladyship should not waste such valuable praise, interrupted Belinda. Do you forget that Belinda Portman and her accomplishments have already been as well advertised as Packwood's razor strops? The manner in which these words were pronounced made a great impression upon Clarence Harvey, and he began to believe it was possible that a niece of the matchmaking Mrs. Stanhope might not be a compound of art and affection. Though her aunt has advertised her, said he to himself, she seems to have too much dignity to advertise herself, and it would be very unjust to blame her for the faults of another person. I will see more of her. Some morning visitors were announced, who, for the time, suspended Clarence Harvey's reflections. The effect of them, however, immediately appeared, for, as his good opinion of Belinda increased, his ambition to please her was strongly excited. He displayed all his powers of wit and humour, and not only Lady Delacour, but everybody present observed that Mr. Harvey, who was always the most entertaining man in the world, this morning surpassed himself, and was absolutely the most entertaining man in the universe. He was mortified notwithstanding, for he distinctly perceived that whilst Belinda joined with ease and dignity in the general conversation, her manner towards him was grave and reserved. The next morning he called earlier than usual, but though Lady Delacour was always at home to him, she was then unluckily dressing to go to court. He inquired whether Miss Portman would accompany her ladyship, and he learned from his friend Marriott that she was not to be presented this day, because Mrs. Franks had not brought home her dress. Mr. Hervey called again two hours afterwards. Lady Delacour was gone to court. He asked for Miss Portman. Not at home, was the mortifying answer, though, as he had passed by the windows, he had heard the delightful sound of her harp. He walked up and down in the square impatiently, till he saw Lady Delacour's carriage appear. The drawing-room has lasted an unconscionable time this morning, said he, as he handed her ladyship out of her coach. "'Am not I the most virtuous of virtuous women,' said Lady Delacour, "'to go to court such a day as this? "'But,' whispered she as she went upstairs, "'like all other amazingly good people, "'I have amazingly good reasons for being good. "'The Queen is soon to give a charming breakfast at Frogmore, "'and I am paying my court with all my might in hopes of being asked, for Belinda must see one of their galas before we leave town. That I am determined upon. But where is she? Not at home, said Clarence, smiling. Oh, not at home is nonsense, you know. Shine out, appear, be found, my lovely Zara, cried Lady Delacour, opening the library door. Here she is. What doing I know not, studying Harvey's meditations on the tombs, I should guess, by the sanctification of her looks. 
if you be not totally above all sublunary considerations admire my lilies of the valley and let me give you a lecture not upon heads or upon hearts but on what is of much more consequence upon hoops everybody wear hoops but how few tis a melancholy consideration how very few can manage them there's my friend lady c in an elegant undress she passes for very genteel but put her into a hoop and she looks as pitiable a figure as much a prisoner and as little able to walk as a child in a go-cart she gets on i grant you and so does the poor child but getting on you know is not walking oh clarence i wish you had seen the two lady r's sticking close to one another their father pushing them on together like two decanters in a bottle coaster with such magnificent diamond labels round their necks encouraged by clarence harvey's laughter lady delacour went on to mimic what she called the hoop awkwardness of all her acquaintance and if these could have failed to divert belinda it was impossible for her to be serious when she heard clarence harvey's declare that he was convinced he could manage a hoop as well as any woman in england except lady delacour now here said he is the purblind dowager lady boucher just at the door lady delacour she would not know my face she would not see my beard and i will bet fifty guineas that i come into a room in a hoop and that she does not find me out by my air that i do not betray myself in short by my masculine awkwardness i hold you to your word clarence cried lady delacour they have let the purblind dowager in i hear her on the stairs here through this way you can go as you do everything quicker than anybody else in the world you will certainly be full dressed in a quarter of an hour i'll engage to keep the dowager in scandal for that time go marriott has old hoops and old finery of mine and you have all powerful influence i know with marriott so go and use it and let us see you in all your glory though i vow i tremble for my fifty guineas lady delacour kept the dowager in scandal according to her engagement for a good quarter of an hour then the dresses at the drawing-room took up another quarter and at last the dowager began to give an account of sundry wonderful cures that had been performed to her certain knowledge by her favourite concentrated extract of anima and quassia she entered into the history of the negro slave named quassi who discovered this medical wood which he kept a close secret till mr dalberry a magistrate of surinam wormed it out of him brought a branch of the tree to europe and communicated it to the great linnaeus when clarence harway was announced by the title of the countess de pomenars an emigre a charming woman whispered lady delacour she was to have been at the drawing-room to-day but for a blunder of mine ready dressed she was and i didn't call for her oh, ah madame de pomenars i am actually ashamed to see you continued her ladyship and she went forward to meet clarence harvey who really made his entree with very composed assurance and grace he managed his hoop with such skill and dexterity that he well deserved the praise of being a universal genius the countess de pomenar spoke french and broken english incomparably well and she made out that she was descended from the pomenars of the time of madame de sevigny she said that she had in her possession several original letters of madame de sevigny and a lock of madame de grignon's fine hair i have sometimes fancied but i believe it is only my fancy said lady delacour that this young lady turning to belinda is not unlike your madame de grignon i have seen a picture of her at strawberry hill madame de pomenars acknowledged that there was a resemblance but added that it was flattery in the extreme to madame de grignon to say so 
"'It would be a sin, undoubtedly, to waste flattery upon the dead, my dear countess,' said Lady Delacour. "'But here, without flattery to the living, as you have a lock of Madame de Grignan's hair, you can tell us whether la belle Chevelleur, of which Madame de Sévigny talked so much, was anything to be compared to my Belinda's. As she spoke, Lady Delacour, before Belinda was aware of her intentions, dexterously let down her beautiful tresses, and the Countess de Pomenars was so much struck at the sight, that she was incapable of paying the necessary compliments. "'Nay, touch it,' said Lady Delacour. It is so fine and so soft. At this dangerous moment her ladyship artfully let drop the comb. Clarence Hervey suddenly stooped to pick it up, totally forgetting his hoop and his character. He threw down the music stand with his hoop. Lady Delacour exclaimed, Bravissima! and burst out a laughing. Lady Boucher, in amazement, looked from one to another for an explanation and was a considerable time before, as she said, she could believe her own eyes. Clarence Harvey acknowledged he had lost his bet, joined in the laugh, and declared that fifty guineas was too little to pay for the sight of the finest hair that he had ever beheld. "'I declare he deserves a lock of la belle chevelleur for that speech, Miss Portman,' cried Lady Delacour. "'I'll appeal to all the world.' Madame de Pomenars must have a lock to measure with Madame de Grignan's. Come, a second rape of the lock, Belinda. Fortunately for Belinda, the glittering forfex was not immediately produced, as fine ladies do not now, as in former times, carry any such useless implements about with them. Such was the modest, graceful dignity of Miss Portman's manners, that she escaped without even the charge of prudery. She retired to her own apartment as soon as she could. "'She passes on in unblenched majesty,' said Lady Delacour. "'She is really a charming woman,' said Clarence Harvey in a low voice to Lady Delacour, drawing her into a recessed window. He, in the same low voice, continued, could I obtain a private audience, or a few minutes, when your ladyship is at leisure? I have—I um, I am never at leisure, interrupted Lady Delacour. But if you have anything particular to say to me, as I guess you have, by my skill in human nature, come here to my concert to-night, before the rest of the world. Wait patiently in the music-room and perhaps i may grant you a private audience as you have had the grace not to call it a tete-a-tete -tete. in the meantime my dear countess de pomenars had we not better take off our hoops in the evening clarence harvey was in the music-room a considerable time before lady delacour appeared how patiently he waited is not known to any one but himself have not I given you time to compose a charming speech? said Lady Delacour as she entered the room. But make it as short as you can, unless you wish that Miss Portman should hear it, for she will be downstairs in three minutes. In one word, then, my dear Lady Delacour, can you and will you make my peace with Miss Portman? I am much concerned about that foolish razor-stroke dialogue which she overheard at Lady Singleton's. "'You are concerned that she overheard it, no doubt?' "'No,' said Clarence Harvey. "'I am rejoiced that she overheard it, since it has been the means of convincing me of my mistake. But I am concerned that I had the presumption and injustice to judge of Miss Portman so hastily. I am convinced that though she is a niece of Mrs. Stanhope's, she has dignity of mind and simplicity of character. Will you, my dear Lady Delacour, tell her so? Stay, interrupted Lady Delacour. Let me get it by heart. I should have made a terrible bad messenger of the gods and goddesses, for I never in my life could, like Iris, repeat a message in the same words in which it was delivered to me. Let me see. Dignity of mind and simplicity of character, was it not? May not I say at once, my dear Belinda, 
Clarence Harvey desires me to tell you that he is convinced you are an angel. That single word angel is so expressive, so comprehensive, so comprehensible. It contains, believe me, all that can be said or imagined on these occasions. Depart et d'autre. But, said Mr. Harvey, perhaps Miss Portman has heard the song of What Know We of Angels? I spake it in jest. Then you are not in jest, but in downright sober earnest. Ha! said Lady Delacour, with an arch look. I did not know it was already come to this with you. And her ladyship, turning to her piano forte, played. There was a young man in Bellanacracy who wanted a wife to make him an easy, and thus in gentle strains he spoke her, Ara, will you marry me, my dear Ali Crooker? No, no, exclaimed Clarence, laughing. It is not come to that with me yet, Lady Delacour, I promise you. But is not it possible to say that a young lady has dignity of mind and simplicity of character? without having or suggesting any thoughts of marriage. You make a most proper but not sufficiently emphatic difference between having or suggesting such thoughts, said Lady Delacour. A gentleman sometimes finds it for his interest, his honour, or his pleasure, to suggest what he would not for the world promise, I mean perform. A scoundrel! cried Clarence Harvey, not a gentleman may find it for his honour, or his interest, or his pleasure, to promise what he would not perform. But I am not a scoundrel. I never made any promise to man or woman that I did not keep faithfully. I am not a swindler in love. And yet, said Lady Delacour, you would have no scruple to trifle or flatter a woman out of her heart. Cela est selon said clarence smiling a fair exchange you know is no robbery when a fine woman robs me of my heart surely lady delacour could not expect that i should make no attempt upon hers is this part of my message to miss portman said lady delacour as your ladyship pleases said clarence i trust entirely to your discretion why i really have a great deal of discretion said lady delacour but you trust too much to it when you expect that i should execute both with propriety and success the delicate commission of telling a young lady who is under my protection that a young gentleman who is a professed admirer of mine is in love with her but has no thoughts and wishes to suggest no thoughts of marriage in love exclaimed clarence harvey but when did i ever use the expression in speaking of miss portman i simply expressed esteem and ad no additions said lady delacour content yourself with esteem simply and miss portman is safe and you too i presume apropos pray clarence how do your esteem and admiration i may go as far as that may not i of Miss Portman agree with your admiration of Lady Delacour? Perfectly well, replied Clarence, for all the world must be sensible that Clarence Harvey is a man of too much taste to compare a country novice in wit and accomplishments to Lady Delacour. He might, as men of genius sometimes do, look forward to the idea of forming a country novice for a wife. A man must marry some time or other but my hour, thank heaven, is not come yet. Thank heaven, said Lady Delacour, for you know a married man is lost to the world of fashion and gallantry. Not more so, I should hope, than a married woman, said Clarence Harvey. Here a loud knocking at the door announced the arrival of a company to the concert. You will make my peace, you promise me, with Miss Portman? cried Clarence eagerly. Yes, I will make your peace, and you shall see Belinda smile upon you once more, upon condition, continued Lady Delacour, speaking very quickly, as if she was hurried by the sound of people coming upstairs. But we'll talk of that another time. 
"'Nay, nay, my dear Lady Delacour, now, now,' said Clarence, seizing her hand. "'Upon condition, upon what condition?' "'Upon condition that you do a little job for me. Indeed, for Belinda. She is to go with me to the birth night, and she has often hinted to me that our horses are shockingly shabby for people of our condition. I know she wishes that upon such an occasion, her first appearance at court, you know, we should go in style. Now my dear positive lord has said, he will not let us have a pair of the handsomest horses I ever saw, which are at Tattersall's, and on which Belinda, I know, has secretly set her heart, as I have openly in vain. Your ladyship and Miss Portman cannot possibly set your hearts on anything in vain, especially on anything that it is in the power of Clarence Harvey to procure. Then, added he gallantly, kissing her hand, may I thus seal my treaty of peace? What audacity! Don't you see these people coming in? cried Lady Delacour, and she withdrew her hand, but with no great precipitation. She was evidently, at this moment, as in all the past, neither afraid nor ashamed that Mr. Harvey's devotions to her should be paid in public. With much address she had satisfied herself to his views with respect to Belinda. She was convinced that he had no immediate thoughts of matrimony, but that if he were condemned to marry, Miss Portman would be his wife. As this did not interfere with her plans, Lady Delacour was content. End of chapter 5 Read by Lars Rolander Chapter 7 of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evelyn Clark. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. Chapter 7 Ways and means when lady delacour repeated to miss portman the message about simplicity of mind and dignity of character she frankly said belinda notwithstanding all this observe i'm determined to retain clarence hervey among the number of my public worshippers during my life, which, you know, cannot last long. After I am gone, my dear, he'll be all your own, and of that I give you joy. Posthumous fame is a silly thing, but posthumous jealousy detestable. There was one part of the conversation between Mr. Hervey and her ladyship, which she, in her great discretion, did not immediately repeat to Miss Portman, that part which related to the horses. In this transaction, Belinda had no further share than having once, when her ladyship had the handsome horses brought for her to look at, assented to the opinion that they were the handsomest horses she ever beheld. Mr. Hervey, however gallantly he replied to her ladyship, was secretly vexed to find that Belinda had so little delicacy as to permit her name to be employed in such a manner. He repented having used the improper expression of dignity of mind, and he relapsed into his former opinion of Mrs. Stanhope's niece. A relapse is always more dangerous than the first disease. He sent home the horses to Lady Delacour the next day, and addressed Belinda, 
when he met her, with the air of a man of gallantry, who thought that his peace had been chiefly made. But in proportion as his manners became more familiar, hers grew more reserved. Lady Delacour rallied upon her prudery, but in vain. Clarence Hervey seemed to think that her ladyship had not fulfilled her part of the bargain. Is not smiling, he said, the epithet always applied to peace? Yet I have not been able to obtain one smile from Miss Portman since I have been promised peace. Embarrassed by Mr. Hervey's reproaches, and provoked to find that Belinda was proof against all her raillery, Lady Delacour grew quite ill-humoured towards her. Belinda, unconscious of having given any just cause of offence, was unmoved, and her ladyship's embarrassment increased. At last, resuming all her former appearance of friendship and confidence she suddenly exclaimed one night after she had flattered belinda into high spirits do you know my dear that i have been so ashamed of myself for this past week that i have hardly dared to look you in the face i am sensible I was downright rude and cross to you one day, and ever since I have been penitent, and, as all penitents are, very stupid and disagreeable, I am sure. But tell me you forgive my caprice, and Lady Delacour will be herself again. It was not difficult to obtain Belinda's forgiveness. "'Indeed,' continued Lady Delacour, "'you are too good. "'But then, in my own justification, "'I must say that I have more things "'to make me ill-humoured than most people have. "'Now, my dear, that most obstinate of human beings, "'Lord Delacour, has reduced me to the most terrible situation. I have made Clarence Hervey buy a pair of horses for me, and I cannot make my Lord Delacour pay for them. But I forgot to tell you that I took your name, not in vain, indeed, in this business. I told Clarence that upon condition he would do this job for me, you would forgive him for all his sins, and, nay, my dear, why do you look as if I had stabbed you in the heart? After all, I only drew upon your pretty mouth for a few smiles. Pray, let me see whether it has actually forgotten how to smile. Belinda was too vexed at this instant, to understand raillery. She was inspired by anger and unwanton courage, and losing all fear of Lady Delacour's wit, she very seriously expostulated with her ladyship upon having thus used her name without her consent or knowledge. Belinda felt she was now in danger of being led into a situation which might be fatal to her reputation and her happiness, and she was more surprised at her ladyship when she recollected the history she had so lately heard of Harriet Freak and Colonel Lawless. "'You cannot but be sensible, Lady Delacour,' said Belinda, "'that after the contempt I have heard Mr. Hervey express for matchmaking with Mrs. Stanhope's nieces, I should degrade myself by any attempts to attract his attention. No wit, no eloquence 
can change my opinion on this subject, I cannot endure contempt. Very likely, no doubt, interrupted Lady Delacour, but if you would only open your eyes, which heroines make it a principle never to do, or else there would be an end of the novel, if you would only open your eyes, you would see that this man is in love with you, and whilst you are afraid of his contempt, he is a hundred times more afraid of yours, and as long as you are each of you in fear of you know not what you must excuse me if i indulge myself in a little wholesome raillery belinda smiled there now one such smile as that for clarence hervey and i am out of debt and danger said lady delacour oh lady delacour why why will you try your power over me in this manner said belinda you know that i ought not to be persuaded to do what i am conscious is wrong but a few days ago you told me yourself that mr hervey is is not a marrying man and a woman of your penetration must see that that he only means to flirt with me i am not a match for mr hervey in any respect he is a man of wit and gallantry i am unpractised in the ways of the world i was not educated by my aunt stanhope i have only been with her a few years i wish i had never been with her in my life i'll take care mr hervey shall know that said lady delacour but in the meantime i do think any fair appraiser of delicate distresses would decide that i am all the circumstances considered more to be pitied at this present moment than you are for the catastrophe of the business evidently is that i must pay two hundred guineas for the horses somehow or other i can pay for them exclaimed belinda and will with the greatest pleasure i will not go to the birth night my dress is not bespoke will two hundred guineas pay for the horses oh take the money pay mr hervey dear lady delacour and it will be all right you are a charming girl said lady delacour embracing her but how can I answer for it to my conscience, or to your aunt Stanhope, if you don't appear on the birth night? That cannot be, my dear. Besides, you know Mrs. Franks will send home your drawing-room dress today, and it would be so foolish to be presented for nothing, not to go to the birth night afterwards. If you say a... Eh, you must say b then said belinda i will not go to the drawing-room not go my dear what throw away fifty guineas for nothing really i never saw any one so lavish of her money and so economic of her smiles surely said miss portman it is better for me to throw away fifty guineas poor as i am than to hazard the happiness of my life. Your ladyship knows that if I say A to Mr. Hervey, I must say B. No, no, my dear Lady Delacour, here is the draught for two hundred guineas. Pay Mr. Hervey, for heaven's sake, and there is an end of the business. What a positive child it is! Well, then, it shall not be forced to say the A, B, C of Cupid's alphabet to that terrible pedagogue, Clarence Hervey, till it pleases. But seriously, Miss Portman, 
I am concerned that you will make me take this draught. It is absolutely robbing you. But Lord Delacour is the person you must blame. It is all his obstinacy. Having once said he would not pay for the horses, he would see them and me and the whole human race expire before he would change his silly mind. Next month, I shall have it in my power, my dear, to repay you with a thousand thanks, and in a few months more we shall have another birthday, and a new star shall appear in the firmament of fashion, and it shall be called Belinda. In the meantime, my dear, upon second thoughts, perhaps we can get Mrs. Franks to dispose of your drawing-room dress to some person of taste, and you may keep your fifty guineas for the next occasion. I'll see what can be done. Adieu. A thousand thanks, silly child as you are. Mrs. Franks at first declared that it would be an impossibility to dispose of Miss Portman's dress, though she would do anything upon earth to oblige Lady Delacour. However, Ten guineas made everything possible. Belinda rejoiced at having, as she thought, extricated herself at so cheap a rate, and well pleased with her own conduct, she wrote to her aunt Stanhope to inform her of as much of the transaction as she could disclose without betraying Lady Delacour. Her ladyship, she said, had immediate occasion for two hundred guineas, and to accommodate her with this sum she had given up the idea of going to court. The tenor of Miss Portman's letter will be sufficiently apparent from Mrs. Stanhope's answer. Mrs. Stanhope to Miss Portman, Bath, June 2nd. I cannot but feel some astonishment, Belinda, at your very extraordinary conduct and more extraordinary letter. What you can mean by principles and delicacy, I own, I don't pretend to understand. When you see, you not only forget the respect that is due to the opinions and advice of the aunt to whom you owe everything, but you take upon yourself to lavish her money without common honesty. I send you two hundred guineas, and desire you to go to court. You lend my two hundred guineas to Lady Delacour, and inform me that as you think yourself bound in honor to her ladyship, you cannot explain all the peculiars to me, otherwise you are sure I should approve of the reasons which have influenced you? Mighty satisfactory, truly. And then to mend the matter, you tell me that you do not think that in your situation in life it is necessary that you should go to court? Your opinions and mine, you add, differ in many points. Then I must say that you are as ungrateful as you are presumptuous. For I am not such a novice in the affairs of the world as to be ignorant that when a young lady professes to be of a different opinion from her friends, it is only a prelude to something worse. She begins by saying that she is determined to think for herself, and she is determined to act for herself, and then it is all over with her, and all the money, etc., that has been spent on her, education is so much dead loss. 
to her friends. Now I look upon it that a young girl who has been brought up and brought forward in the world as you have been by connections is bound to be guided implicitly by them in all her conduct. What should you think of a man who, after he had been brought into Parliament by a friend, would go and vote against that friend's opinion? You do not want sense, Belinda. You perfectly understand me, and consequently your errors I must impute to the defect of your heart and not of your judgment. I see that on account of the illness of the princess, the king's birthday is put off for a fortnight. If you manage properly, and if unknown to the lady, who certainly has not used you well in this business, and to whom, therefore, you owe no peculiar delicacy, you make lord, sensible how much your aunt Stanhope is disappointed and displeased, as I most truly am, at your intention of missing this opportunity of appearing at court, it is ten to one, but his lordship, who has not made it a point to refuse your request, I suppose, will pay you your two hundred guineas. You, of course, will make proper acknowledgments, but at the same time entreat that his lordship will not commit you with his lady, as he might be offended at your application to him. I understand from an intimate acquaintance of his that you are a great favorite of his lordship, and though an obstinate, he is a good-natured man, and can have no fear of being governed by you. Consequently, he will do just as you would have him. Then you have an opportunity of representing the thing in the prettiest manner imaginable to the lady. As an instance of her lord's consideration for her, so you will oblige all parties, a very desirable thing, without costing yourself one penny and go to the birth night after all, and this only by using a little address, without which nothing is to be done in this world. Yours affectionately, if you follow my advice, Selina Stanhope. Belinda, though she could not consistently with what she thought right follow the advice so artfully given to her in this epistle was yet extremely concerned to find that she had incurred the displeasure of an aunt to whom she thought herself under obligations she resolved to lay by as much as she possibly could from the interest of her fortune and to repay the two hundred guineas to Mrs. Stanhope. She was conscious that she had no right to lend this money to Lady Delacour if her aunt had expressly desired that she should spend it only on her court dress. But this had not distinctly been expressed when Mrs. Stanhope sent her niece the draft the lady was in the habit of speaking and writing ambiguously, so that even those who knew her best were frequently in doubt how to interpret her words. Yet she was extremely displeased when her hints and half-expressed wishes were not understood. Beside, the concern she felt from the thoughts of having displeased her aunt, Belinda was both vexed and mortified to perceive that in Clarence Hervey's manner 
towards her there was not the change which she had expected that her conduct would naturally produce one day she was surprised at his reproaching her for caprice and having given up her intentions of going to court lady delacour's embarrassment whilst mr hervey spoke belinda attributed to her ladyship's desire that clarence should not know that she had been obliged to borrow the money to pay him for the horses belinda thought that this was a species of mean pride but she made it a point to keep her ladyship secret she therefore slightly answered mr hervey that she wondered that a man who was so well acquainted with the female sex should be surprised at any instance of caprice from a woman the conversation then took another turn and whilst they were talking of indifferent subjects in came lord delacour's man champfort with mrs stanhope's draft for two hundred guineas which the coachmaker's man had just brought back because miss portman had forgotten to endorse it belinda's astonishment was almost as great at this instant as lady delacour's confusion come this way my dear and we'll find you a pen and ink you'll need not wait champ for it but tell the man to wait for the draft miss portman will endorse it immediately and she took belinda into another room good heavens has not this money been paid to mr hervey exclaimed belinda no my dear but i will take all the blame upon myself or which will do just as well for you throw it all upon my better half my lord delacour would not pay for my new carriage the coachmaker insolent animal would not let it out of his yard without two hundred guineas in ready money now you know i had the horses and what could i do with the horses without the carriage clarence hervey i knew could wait for his money better than a poor devil of a coachmaker so i paid the coachmaker and a few months sooner or later can make no difference to clarence who rolls in gold my dear if that will be any comfort to you as i hope it will oh what will he think of me said belinda nay what will he think of me child lady delacour said belinda in a firmer tone than she had ever before spoken i must insist upon this draft being given to mr hervey absolutely impossible my dear i cannot take it from the coachmaker he has sent home the carriage the things done and cannot be undone but come since i know nothing else will make you easy i will take this mighty favor from mr hervey entirely upon my own conscience you cannot object to that for you are not the keeper of my conscience i will tell clarence the whole business and do you honor due my dear so endorse the check while i go and sound both the praises of your dignity of mind and simplicity of character etc 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 her ladyship broke away from belinda returned to clarence hervey and told the whole affair with that peculiar grace with which she knew how to make a good story of a bad one clarence was as favorable an auditor at this time as she could possibly have found for no human being could value money less than he did and all sense of her ladyship's meanness was lost in his joy at discovering that belinda was worthy of his esteem now he felt in its fullest extent all the power she had over his heart and he was upon the point of declaring his attachment to her when malheursement sir philip baddely and mr rochfort announced themselves 
by the noise they made on the staircase. These were the young men who had spoken in such a contemptuous manner at Lady Singleton's of the matchmaking Mrs. Stanhope and her nieces. Mr. Hervey was anxious that they should not penetrate into the state of his heart, and he concealed his emotion by instantly assuming that kind of rattling gaiety which always delighted his companions, who were ever in want of someone to set their stagnant ideas in motion. At last, they insisted upon carrying Clarence away with them to taste some wines for Sir Philip Baddeley. End of chapter 7 Recording by Evelyn Clark Chapter 7 of Belinda This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Thompson Belinda by Maria Edgeworth Chapter 7 The Serpentine River In his way to St. James's Street, where the wine merchant lived, Sir Philip Baddeley picked up several young men of his acquaintance, who were all eager to witness a trial of taste, of epicurean taste, between the baronet and Clarence Hervey. Amongst his other accomplishments, our hero piqued himself upon the exquisite accuracy of his organs of taste. He neither loved wine, nor was he fond of eating. But, at fine dinners, with young men who were real epicures, Hervey gave himself the airs of a connoisseur, and asserted superiority even in judging of wine and sauces. Having gained immortal honour at an entertainment by gravely protesting that some turtle would have been excellent if it had not been done a bubble too much, he presumed, elate as he was with the applauses of the company, to assert that no man in England had a more correct taste than himself. Sir Philip Baddeley could not passively submit to this arrogance. He loudly proclaimed that though he would not dispute Mr. Hervey's judgment as far as eating was concerned, yet he would defy him as a connoisseur in wines, and he offered to submit the competition to any eminent wine merchant in London, and to some common friend of acknowledged taste and experience. Mr. Rochfort was chosen as the common friend of acknowledged taste and experience, and a fashionable wine merchant was pitched upon to decide with him the merits of these candidates for bacchanalian fame. Sir Philip, who was just going to furnish his cellars, was a person of importance to the wine merchant, who produced accordingly his choicest treasures. Sir Philip and Clarence tasted of all in their turns, Sir Philip with real, and Clarence with affected gravity, and they delivered their opinions of the positive and comparative merits of each. The wine merchant evidently, as Mr. Hervey thought, leaned towards sir philip upon my word sir philip you are right that wine is the best i have you certainly have a most discriminating taste said the complacent wine merchant i'll tell you what cried sir philip the thing is this by jove now there's no possibility now no possibility now by jove of imposing upon me then said clarence hervey would you engage to tell the differences between these two wines ten times running blindfold? Ten times, that's nothing, replied Sir Philip. Yes, fifty times I would, by Jove. But when it came to the trial, Sir Philip had nothing left but oaths in his own favor. Clarence Hervey was victorious, and his sense of the importance of this victory was much increased by the fumes of the wine, which began to operate upon his brain. His triumph was, as he said it ought to be, back in Allian. He laughed and sang with anacreontic spirit, and finished by declaring that he deserved to be crowned with vine leaves. Dine with me, Clarence, said Rochfort, and we'll crown you with three times three, and, whispered he to Sir Philip, we'll have another trial after dinner. But as it's not near dinner time yet, <sighs> What shall we do with ourselves till dinner-time? 
said Sir Philip, yawning pathetically. Clarence, not being used to drink in the morning, though all his companions were, was much affected by the wine, and Rochfort proposed that they should take a turn in the park to cool Hervey's head. To Hyde Park they repaired, Sir Philip boasting, all the way they walked, of the superior strength of his head. Clarence protested that his own strength was stronger than any man's in England, and observed that at this instant he walked better than any person in company, Sir Philip Baddeley not excepted. Now, Sir Philip Baddeley was a noted pedestrian, and he immediately challenged our hero to walk with him for any money he pleased. Done, said Clarence, for ten guineas, for any money you please. And instantly they set out to walk, as Rochfort cried, One, two, three, and away! Keep the path, and whichever reaches that elm tree first has it. They were exactly even for some yards. Then Clarence got ahead of Sir Philip, and he reached the elm tree first. But as he waved his hat, exclaiming, Clarence has won the day, Sir Philip came up with his companions and coolly informed him that he had lost his wager. Lost, 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 Clarence, fairly lost. Didn't I reach the tree first? said Clarence. Yes, answered his companions. But you didn't keep the path. You turned out of the way when you met that crowd of children yonder. Now I, said Sir Philip, dashed fairly through them, kept the path, and won my bet. But, said Hervey, would you have had me run over that little child who was stooping down just in my way? I, not I, said Sir Philip, but I would have you go through with your civility. If a man will be polite, he must pay for his politeness sometimes. You said you'd lay me any money I pleased, recollect. Now I'm very moderate, and as you are a particular friend, Clarence, I'll only take your ten guineas. A loud laugh from his companions provoked Clarence. They were glad to have a laugh against him, because he excited universal envy by the real superiority of his talents, and by his perpetually taking the lead in those trifles which were beneath his ambition and exactly suited to engage the attention of his associates. Be it so, and welcome. I'll pay ten guineas for having better manners than any of you, cried Hervey, laughing. But remember, though I've lost this bet, I don't give up my pedestrian fame Sir Philip, there are no women to throw golden apples in my way now, and no children for me to stumble over. I dare you to another trial. Double or quit. I'm off, by Jove, said Sir Philip. I'm too hot, damn, to walk with you any more. But I'm your man if you've a mind for a swim. Here's the Serpentine River, Clarence. Hey, damn it, hey. Sir Philip and all his companions knew that Clarence had never learned to swim. You may wink at one another as wisely as you please, said Clarence. But come on, my boys. I am your man for a swim. Hundred guineas upon it. Darest thou, Rochford, now leap in with me into this weedy flood and swim to yonder point? And instantly Hervey, who had in his confused head some recollection of an essay of Dr. Franklin on swimming, by which he fancied that he could ensure at once his safety and his fame, threw off his coat and jumped into the river. Luckily, he was not in boots. Rochfort and all the other young men stood laughing by the riverside. Who the devil are these two that seem to be making up to us? said Sir Philip, looking at two gentlemen who were coming towards them. St. George, hey? You know everybody. The foremost is Percival of Oakley Park, I think, upon my honor, replied Mr. St. George and he then began to settle how many thousands a year Mr. Percival was worth. This point was not decided when the gentleman came up to the spot where Sir Philip was standing. The child for whose sake Clarence Hervey had lost his bet was Mr. Percival's, and he came to thank him for his civility. The gentleman who accompanied Mr. Percival was an old friend of Clarence Hervey's. He had met him abroad, but had not seen him for some years. "'Pray, gentlemen,' said he to Sir Philip and his party, is Mr. Clarence Hervey amongst you? I think I saw him pass by me just now. Damn it, yes, where is Clary, though? exclaimed Sir Philip, suddenly recollecting himself. Clarence Hervey, at this instant, was drowning. He had got out of his depth, and had struggled in vain to recover himself. Curse me if it's not all over with Clary, continued Sir Philip. 
Do any of you see his head anywhere? Damn you, Rochford, yonder it is. Damn, so it is, said Rochford. But he's so heavy in his clothes. He'd pull me down along with him to Davy's locker. Damn if I'll go after him. Damn it, though, can't some of you swim? Can't some of you jump in? cried Sir Philip, turning to his companions. Damn it, Clarence will go to the bottom. And so he inevitably would have done had not Mr. Percival at this instant leaped into the river and seized hold of the drowning Clarence. It was with great difficulty that he dragged him to the shore. Sir Philip's party, as soon as the danger was over, officiously offered their assistance. Clarence Hervey was absolutely senseless. "'Damn it! What shall we do with him now?' said Sir Philip. "'Damn it! We must call some of the people from the boathouse. He's as heavy as lead. Damn me if I know what to do with him!' Whilst Sir Philip was damning himself, Mr. Percival ran to the boathouse for assistance, and they carried the body into the house. The elderly gentleman who had accompanied Mr. Percival now made his way through the midst of the noisy crowd, and directed what should be done to restore Mr. Hervey's suspended animation. Whilst he was employed in this benevolent manner, Clarence's worthy friends were sneering at him and whispering to one another. "'E cod, he talks as if he was a doctor,' said Rochfort. Upon my honour, I do believe, said St. George, he is the famous Dr. X. I met him at a circulating library t'other day. Dr. X, the writer, do you mean? said Sir Philip. Then, damn me, we'd better get out of his way as fast as we can, or he'll have some of us down in black and white, and curse me if I should choose to meet with myself in a book. No danger of that, said Rochfort, for how can one meet with oneself in a book, Sir Philip, if one never opens one? By Jove, that's the true way. But pon my honour, said St. George, I should like, of all things, to see myself in print. T'would make one famously famous. Damn me if I don't flatter myself, though. One can make oneself famous enough to all intents and purposes without having anything to say to these author geniuses. You're a famous fellow, faith, to want to see yourself in print. I'll publish this in Bond Street. Damn it! In point of famousness, I'd sport my random against all the books that ever were read or written, damn me. But what are we doing here? Hervey's in good hands, said Rochfort, and this here's a cursed stupid lounge for us. Besides, it's getting towards dinner time. So my voice is, let's be off, and we can leave St. George, who has such a famous mind to be in the doctor's book, to bring Clary after us when he's ready for dinner in good company again, you know. <laughs> Away the faithful friends went to the important business of their day. When Clarence Hervey came to his senses, he started up, rubbed his eyes, and looked about, exclaiming, What's all this? Where am I? Where's Baddeley? Where's Rochford? Where are they all? Gone home to dinner, answered Mr. St. George, who was a hanger-on of Sir Philip's. But they left me to bring you after them. Faith, Clary, you've had a squeak for your life. Pon my honour, we thought at one time it was all over with you. But you're a rough one. We shan't have to pour over your grave a full bottle of red as yet, my boy. You'll do as well as ever. So I'll step and call a coach for you, Clary, and we shall be at dinner as soon as the best of em after all. By jingo, I leave you in good hands with the doctor here that brought you to life, and the gentleman that dragged you out of the water. Here's a note for you whispered Mr. St. George as he leaned over Clarence Hervey. Here's a note for you from Sir Philip and Rochfort. Read it, do you mind, to yourself. If I can, said Clarence, but Sir Philip writes a bloody bad hand. Oh, he's a baronet, said St. George. <laughs> and charmed with his own wit, he left the boathouse. Clarence, with some difficulty, deciphered the note, which contained these words. Quiz the doctor, Clary, as soon as you're up to it. He's an author, so fair game. Quiz the doctor, and we'll drink your health with three times three in Rochford's Burgundy. Yours, etc. Phil Baddeley. P.S. Burn this when read. With the request contained in the postscript, Clarence immediately complied. He threw the note into the fire with indignation the moment that he had read it. And turning towards the gentleman to whom it alluded, he began to express, in the strongest terms, his gratitude for their benevolence but he stopped short in the midst of his acknowledgments when he discovered to whom he was speaking. "'Dr. X!' cried he. "'Is it possible? 
how rejoiced I am to see you, and how rejoiced I am to be obliged to you. There is not a man in England to whom I would rather be obliged. You are not acquainted with Mr. Percival, I believe, said Dr. X. Give me leave, Mr. Percival, to introduce you to the young gentleman whose life you have saved, and whose life, though by the company in which you found him you might not think so, is worth saving. This, sir, is no less a man than Mr. Clarence Hervey, of whose universal genius you have just had a specimen, for which he was crowned with sedges, as he well deserved, by the god of the Serpentine River. Do not be so unjust as to imagine that he has any of the presumption which is sometimes the chief characteristic of a man of universal genius. Mr. Clarence Hervey is, without exception, the most humble man of my acquaintance, for, whilst all good judges would think him fit company for Mr. Percival, he has the humility to think himself upon a level with Mr. Rochfort and Sir Philip Baddeley. You have lost as little of your satirical wit, Dr. X, as of your active benevolence, I perceive, said Clarence Hervey, since I met you abroad. But as I cannot submit to your unjust charge of humility, will you tell me where you are to be found in town, and to-morrow? To-morrow, and to-morrow, and to-morrow, said Dr. X. Why not to-day? I am engaged, said Clarence, hesitating and laughing. I am unfortunately engaged to-day to dine with Mr. Rochford and Sir Philip Baddeley, and in the evening I am to be at Lady Delacour's. Lady Delacour? Not the same Lady Delacour whom four years ago, when we met at Florence, you compared to the Venus de Medici? No, no, it cannot be the same. A goddess of four years' standing. Incredible! Incredible as it seems, said Clarence, it is true. I admire her ladyship more than ever I did. Like a true connoisseur, said Dr. X, to admire a fine picture the older it grows, I hear that her ladyship's face is really one of the finest pieces of painting extant, with the advantage of every grace which time alone can grant. Come, come, Dr. X, cried Mr. Percival, no more wit at Lady Delacour's expense. I have a fellow feeling for Mr. Hervey. Why? "'You are not in love with her ladyship, are you?' said Dr. X. "'I am not in love with Lady Delacour's picture of herself,' replied Mr. Percival. "'But I was once in love with the original.' "'How? When? Where?' cried Clarence Hervey, in a tone totally different from that in which he had first addressed Mr. Percival. "'Tomorrow you shall know the how, the when, and the where,' said Mr. Percival. "'Here's your friend, Mr. St. George, and his coach.' "'The deuce take him,' said Clarence. "'But tell me, is it possible that you are not in love with her still? "'And why?' "'Why?' said Mr. Percival. "'Why? "'Come to-morrow, as you have promised, to Upper Grosvenor Street, "'and let me introduce you to Lady Anne Percival. "'She can answer your question better than I can, "'if not entirely to your satisfaction, at least entirely to mine, "'which is more surprising, as the lady is my wife.' By this time Clarence Hervey was equipped in a dry suit of clothes, and by the strength of an excellent constitution, which he had never injured, even amongst his dissipated associates, he had recovered from the effects of his late imprudence. "'Clary, let's away! Here's the coach!' said Mr. St. George. "'Why, my boy, that's a famous fellow, Faith. Why, you look the better for being drowned. Pon my honour, if I were you, I would jump into the Serpentine River once a day.' "'If I could always be sure of such good friends to pull me out,' said Hervey. "'Pray, St. George, by the by, what were you and Rochfort and Sir Philip and all the rest of my friends doing whilst I was drowning?' "'I can't say particularly, upon my soul,' replied Mr. St. George. "'For my own part, I was in boots, so you know I was out of the question. But what signifies all that now? Come, come, we had best think of looking after our dinners.' Clarence Hervey who had very quick feelings, was extremely hurt by the indifference which his dear friends had shown when his life was in danger. He was apt to believe that he was really an object of affection and admiration amongst his companions, and that though they were neither very wise nor very witty, they were certainly very good-natured. When they had forfeited, by their late conduct, these claims to his regard, his partiality for them was changed into contempt. 
"'You had better come home and dine with me, Mr. Hervey,' said Mr. Percival, "'if you be not absolutely engaged. "'For here is your physician, who tells me that temperance is necessary for a man just recovered from drowning, "'and Mr. Rochfort keeps too good a table, I am told, for one in your condition.' Clarence accepted of this invitation with a degree of pleasure which perfectly astonished Mr. St. George. "'Every man knows his own affairs best,' said he to Clarence, as he stepped into his hackney-coat. "'But for my share, I will do my friend Rochfort the justice to say that no one lives as well as he does.' "'If to live well mean nothing but to eat,' said Clarence. "'Now,' said Dr. X, looking at his watch, it will be eight o'clock by the time we get to Upper Grosvenor Street, and Lady Anne will probably have waited dinner for us about two hours, which I apprehend is sufficient to try the patience of any woman but Griselda. Do not, continued he, turning to Clarence Hervey, expect to see an old-fashioned, spiritless, patient Griselda in Lady Anne Percival. I can assure you that she is. But I will neither tell you what she is nor what she is not. Every man who has any abilities likes to have the pleasure and honour of finding out a character by his own penetration, instead of having it forced upon him at full length in capital letters of gold, finely emblazoned and illuminated by the hand of some injudicious friend. Every child thinks the violet of his own finding the sweetest. I spare you any farther allusions and illustrations, concluded Dr. X. For here we are, thank God, in Upper Grosvenor Street. End of chapter. Section nine, chapter eight of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tara Mendoza. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. Section 9. Chapter 8. A Family Party. They found Lady Anne Percival in the midst of her children, who all turned their healthy, rosy, intelligent faces towards the door the moment that they heard their father's voice. Clarence Hervey was so much struck with the expression of happiness in Lady Anne's countenance that he absolutely forgot to compare her beauty with Lady Delacour's. Whether her eyes were large or small, blue or hazel, he could not tell. Nay, he might have been puzzled if he had been asked the colour of her hair. Whether she were handsome by the rules of art, he knew not. But he felt that she had the essential charm of beauty, the power of prepossessing the heart immediately in her favour. The effect of her manners, like that of her beauty, was rather to be felt than described. Everybody was at ease in her company, and none thought themselves called upon to admire her. To Clarence Hervey, who had been used to the brilliant and exigeant Lady Delacour, this respite from the fatigue of admiration was peculiarly agreeable. The unconstrained cheerfulness of Lady Anne Percival spoke a mind at ease, and immediately imparted happiness by exacting sympathy. But in Lady Delacour's wit and gaiety there was an appearance of art and effort, which often destroyed the pleasure that she wished to communicate. Mr. Hervey was, perhaps unusually, disposed to reflection, by having just escaped from drowning, for he had made all these comparisons, and came to this conclusion with the accuracy of a metaphysician who has been accustomed to study cause and effect. Indeed, there was no species of knowledge for which he had not taste and talents, though, to please fools, he too often affected the bliss of ignorance. The children at Lady Anne Percival's happened to be looking at some goldfish, which were in a glass bowl, and Dr. X, who was a general favourite with the young children, as well as with the elder part of the family, was seized upon the moment he entered the room. A pretty little girl of five years old took him prisoner by the flap of the coat, whilst two of her brothers assailed him with questions about the ears, eyes, and fins of fishes. One of the little boys filiped the glass bowl, and observed that the fish immediately came to the surface of the water, and seemed to hear the noise very quickly. But his brother doubted whether the fish heard the noise, and remarked that they might be disturbed by seeing or feeling the motion of the water when the glass was struck. Dr. X observed that this was a very learned dispute, 
and that the question had been discussed by no less a person than the Abbé Nollet, and he related some of the ingenious experiments tried by that gentleman to decide whether fishes can or cannot hear. Whilst the doctor was speaking, Clarence Hervey was struck with the intelligent countenance of one of the little auditors, a girl of about ten or twelve years old. He was surprised to discover in her features, though not in their expression, a singular resemblance to Lady Delacour. He remarked this to Mr. Percival, and the child who overheard him blushed as red as scarlet. Dinner was announced at this instant, and Clarence Hervey thought no more of the circumstance attributing the girl's blush to confusion at being looked at so earnestly. One of the little boys whispered as they were going down to dinner, "'Helena, I do believe that this is the good-natured gentleman who went out of the path to make room for us, instead of running over us as the other man did.' The children agreed that Clarence Hervey certainly was the good-natured gentleman, and upon the strength of this observation one of the boys posted himself next to Clarence at dinner, and by all the little playful manoeuvres in his power endeavoured to show his gratitude, and to cultivate a friendship which had been thus auspiciously commenced. Mr. Hervey, who piqued himself upon being able always to suit his conversation to his companions, distinguished himself at dinner by an account of the Chinese fishing-bird, from which he passed to the various ingenious methods of fishing practised by the Russian Cossacks. From modern he went to ancient fish, and he talked of that which was so much admired by the Roman epicures for exhibiting a succession of beautiful colours whilst it is dying, and which was, upon that account, always suffered to die in the presence of the guests, as part of the entertainment. Clarence was led on by the questions of the children, from fishes to birds. He spoke of the Roman aviaries, which were so constructed as to keep from the sight of the prisoners that they contained, the fields, woods, and every object which might remind them of their former liberty. From birds he was going on to beasts, when he was nearly struck dumb by the forbidding severity with which an elderly lady, who sat opposite to him, fixed her eyes upon him. He had not till this instant paid the smallest attention to her, but her stern countenance was now so strongly contrasted with the approving looks of the children who sat next to her that he could not help remarking it. He asked her to do him the honour to drink a glass of wine with him. She declined doing him that honour, observing that she never drank more than one glass of wine at dinner, and that she had just taken one with Mr. Percival. Her manner was well-bred, but haughty in the extreme, and she was so passionate that her anger sometimes conquered even her politeness. Her dislike to Clarence Hervey was apparent, even in her silence. "'If the old gentlewoman has taken an antipathy to me at first sight, I cannot help it.' thought he, and he went on to the beasts. The boy who sat next to him had asked some questions about the proboscis of the elephant, and Mr. Hervey mentioned Ives' account of the elephants in India, who had been set to watch young children, and who draw them back gently with their trunks when they go out of bounds. He talked next of the unicorn, and addressing himself to Dr. X and Mr. Percival, he declared that in his opinion Herodotus did not deserve to be called the father of lies. He cited the mammoth to prove that the apocryphal chapter in the history of beasts should not be contemned, that it would in all probability be soon established as true history. The dessert was on the table before Clarence had done with the mammoth. As the butler put a fine dish of cherries upon the table, he said, "'Milady, these cherries are a present from the old gardener to Miss Delacour.' "'Set them there before Miss Delacour, then,' said Lady Anne. "'Helena, my dear, distribute your own cherries.' At the name of Delacour, Clarence Hervey, though his head was still half full of the mammoth, looked round in astonishment, and when he saw the cherries placed before the young lady, whose resemblance to Lady Delacour he had before observed, he could not help exclaiming, "'That young lady, then, is not a daughter of your ladyship's?' "'No, but I love her as well as if she were,' replied Lady Anne. "'What were you saying about the mammoth?' "'That the mammoth is supposed to be—' But interrupting himself, Clarence said in an inquiring tone, "'Our niece of Lady Delacour's?' "'Her ladyship's daughter, sir,' said the severe old lady, in a voice more terrific than her looks. "'Shall I give you some strawberries, Mr. Hervey?' said Lady Anne. "'Or will you let Helena help you to some cherries?' "'Her ladyship's daughter!' exclaimed Clarence Hervey in a tone of surprise. "'Some cherries, sir?' said Helena but her voice faltered so much that she could hardly utter the words. 
Clarence perceived that he had been the cause of her agitation, though he knew not precisely by what means, and he now applied himself in silence to the picking of his strawberries with great diligence. The ladies soon afterwards withdrew, and as Mr. Percival did not touch upon the subject again, Clarence forbore to ask any further questions, though he was considerably surprised by this sudden discovery. When he went into the drawing-room to tea, he found his friend, the stern old lady, speaking in a high, declamatory tone. The words which he heard as he came into the room were, "'If there were no Clarence Hervey's, there would be no Lady Delacour's." Clarence bowed as if he had received a high compliment. The old lady walked away to an antechamber, fanning herself with great energy. "'Mrs. Margaret Delacour,' said Lady Anne in a low voice to Hervey, "'is an aunt of Lord Delacour's, a woman whose heart is warmer than her temper. "'And that is never cool,' said a young lady who sat next to Lady Anne. "'I call Mrs. Margaret Delacour the volcano. "'I'm sure I'm never in her company without dreading an eruption. "'Every now and then out comes with a tremendous noise, fire, smoke, and rubbish.' "'And precious minerals,' said Lady Anne, "'amongst the rubbish. "'But the best of it is,' continued the young lady, "'that she is seldom in a passion without making a hundred mistakes, "'for which she is usually obliged afterward to ask a thousand pardons.' "'By that account,' said Lady Anne, "'which I believe to be just, "'her contrition is always ten times as great as her offence.' "'Now, you talk of contrition, Lady Anne,' said Mr. Hervey, I should think of my own offences. I am very sorry that my indiscreet questions gave Miss Delacour any pain. My head was so full of the mammoth that I blundered on without seeing what I was about, till it was too late. "'Pray, sir,' said Mrs. Delacour, who now returned and took her seat upon a sofa, with the solemnity of a person who was going to sit in judgment upon a criminal. "'Pray, sir, may I ask how long you have been acquainted with my Lady Delacour?' Clarence Hervey took up a book, and with great gravity kissed it, as if he had been upon his oath in a court of justice, and answered, "'To the best of my recollection, madame, it is now four years since I had first the pleasure and honour of seeing Lady Delacour. And in that time, intimately as you have had the pleasure of being acquainted with her ladyship, you have never discovered that she had a daughter.' "'Never,' said Mr. Hervey. "'There, Lady Anne.' "'There!' cried Mrs. Delacour. "'Will you tell me after this that Lady Delacour is not a monster?' "'Everybody says that she is a prodigy,' said Lady Anne. "'And prodigies and monsters are sometimes thought synonymous terms.' "'Such a mother was never heard of,' continued Mrs. Delacour. "'Since the days of Savage and Lady Macclesfield, I am convinced that she hates her daughter. Why, she never speaks of her. She never sees her. She never thinks of her. Some mothers speak more than they think of their children, and others think more than they speak of them, said Lady Anne. I always thought, said Mr. Hervey, that Lady Delacour was a woman of great sensibility. Sensibility, exclaimed the indignant old lady. She has no sensibility, sir. None. None. She who lives in a constant round of dissipation who performs no one duty, who exists only for herself. How does she show her sensibility? Has she sensibility for her husband, for her daughter, for any one useful purpose upon earth? No, how I hate the cambric handkerchief sensibility that is brought out only to weep at a tragedy. Yes, Lady Delacour has sensibility enough, I grant ye, when sensibility is the fashion. I remember well her performing the part of a nurse, with vast applause, and I remember, too, the sensibility she showed when the child that she nursed fell a sacrifice to a dissipation, the second of her children that she killed. Killed? Oh, surely, my dear Mrs. Delacour, that is too strong a word, said Lady Anne. You would not make a Medea of Lady Delacour? It would have been better if I had cried Mrs. Delacour. I can understand that there may be such a thing in nature as a jealous wife, but an unfeeling mother I cannot comprehend. That passes my powers of imagination. And mine so much, said Lady Anne, that I cannot believe such a being to exist in the world. 
notwithstanding all the descriptions I have heard of it. As you may say, my dear Mrs. Delacour, it passes my powers of imagination. Let us leave it in Mr. Hervey's apocryphal chapter of animals, and he will excuse us if I never admit it into true history, at least without some better evidence than I have yet heard. "'Why, my dear, dear Lady Anne,' cried Mrs. Delacour, "'I've made this coffee so sweet there's no drinking it. "'What evidence would you have?' "'None,' said Lady Anne, smiling. "'I would have none.' "'That is to say you will take none,' said Mrs. Delacour. "'But can anything be stronger evidence than her ladyship's conduct to my poor, poor Helen? "'To your Helen, I should say.' But you have educated, you have protected her, you have been a mother to her. I am an infirm, weak, ignorant, passionate old woman. I could not have been what you have been to that child. God bless you. God will bless you. She rose as she spoke to set down her coffee cup on the table. Clarence Hervey took it from her with a look which said much, and which she was perfectly capable of understanding. Young man, said she. It is very unfashionable to treat age and infirmity with politeness. I wish that your friend Lady Delacour may at my time of life meet with as much respect as she has meant, with admiration and gallantry in her youth. Poor woman, her head has absolutely been turned with admiration, and if fame say true, Mr. Hervey has had his share in turning that head by his flattery. I am sure her ladyship has turned mine by her charms, said Clarence and I certainly am not to be blamed for admiring what all the world admires. I wish, said the old lady, for her own sake, for the sake of her family, and for the sake of her reputation, that my Lady Delacour had fewer admirers and more friends. Women who have met with so many admirers seldom meet with many friends, said Lady Anne. No, said Mrs. Delacour, for they seldom are wise enough to know their value. We learn the value of all things, but especially of friends, by experience, said Lady Anne, and it is no wonder, therefore, that those who have little experience of the pleasures of friendship should not be wise enough to know their value. This is very good-natured sophistry, but Lady Delacour is too vain ever to have a friend, said Mrs. Delacour. My dear Lady Anne, you don't know her as well as I do. She has more vanity than ever woman had. That is certainly saying a great deal, said Lady Anne. But then we must consider that Lady Delacour, as an heiress, a beauty, and a wit, has a right to a triple share at least. Both her fortune and her beauty are gone. And if she had any wit left, it is time it should teach her how to conduct herself, I think, said Mrs. Delacour. But I give her up. I give her up. Oh, no, said Lady Anne. You must not give her up yet. I have been informed, and upon the best authority, that Lady Delacour was not always the unfeeling, dissipated, fine lady that she now appears to be. This is only one of the transformations of fashion. The period of her enchantment will soon be at an end, and she will return to her natural character. I should not be at all surprised if Lady Delacour were to appear at once la femme con il y en pen. Or la bonne mère, said Mrs. Delacour sarcastically, after thus leaving her daughter. Poor bonne bouche, interrupted Lady Anne. When she is tired of the insipid taste of other pleasures, she will have a higher relish for those of domestic life, which will be new and fresh to her. And so you will really think, my dear Lady Anne, that my Lady Delacour will end by being a domestic woman. Well, said Mrs. Margaret, after taking two pinches of snuff, some people believe in the millennium, but I confess I am not one of them. Are you, Mr. Hervey? If it were foretold to me by a good angel, said Clarence, smiling, as his eyes glanced at Lady Anne, if it were foretold to me by a good angel— how could I doubt it? Here the conversation was interrupted by the entrance of one of Lady Anne's little boys, who came running eagerly up to his mother to ask whether he might have the sophist to show to Helena Delacour. I want to show her Vertimones and Pomona, Mamma, said he. Were not the cherries that the old gardener sent very good? 
"'What is this about the cherries and the old gardener, Charles?' said the young lady who sat beside Lady Anne. "'Come here and tell me the whole story.' "'I will, but I shall tell you a great deal better another time,' said the boy, "'because now Helena's waiting for Vertumanus and Pomona.' "'Go then to Helena,' said Lady Anne, "'and I will tell the story for you.' Then, turning to the young lady, she began, "'Once upon a time there lived an old gardener at Kensington, "'and this old gardener had an aloe, which was older than himself, "'for it was very a near hundred years of age, "'and it was just going to blossom, "'and the old gardener calculated how much he might make "'by showing his aloe, when it should be in full blow, "'to the generous public.' and he calculated that he might make a hundred pounds, and with this one hundred pounds he determined to do more than was ever done with a hundred pounds before. But unluckily, as he was thus reckoning his blossoms before they were blown, he chanced to meet with a fair damsel who ruined all his calculations. "'I, Mrs. Stanhope's maid, was not it,' interrupted Mrs. Margaret Delacour. "'A pretty damsel she was, and almost as good a politician as her mistress.' Think of that jilt's tricking this poor old fellow out of his aloe, and oh, the meanness of Lady Delacour to accept of that aloe for one of her extravagant entertainments. But I always understood that she paid fifty guineas for it, said Lady Anne. Whether she did or not, said Mrs. Delacour, her ladyship and Mrs. Stanhope, between them were the ruin of this poor old man. He was taken in to marry that jade of a waiting maid. She turned out just as you might expect from a pupil of Mrs. Stanhope's, the matchmaking Mrs. Stanhope. You know, sir. Clarence Hervey changed colour. She turned out, continued Mrs. Delacour, everything that was bad, ruined her husband, ran away from him, and left him a beggar. Poor man, said Clarence Hervey. But now, said Lady Anne, let's come to the best part of the story. Mark how good comes out of evil. If this poor man had not lost his aloe and his wife, I probably should never have been acquainted with Mrs. Delacour or with my little Helena. About the time that the old gardener was left a beggar, as I happened to be walking one fine evening in Sloane Street, I met a procession of schoolgirls. An old man begged from them in a most moving voice, and as they passed, several of the young ladies threw halfpence to him. One little girl, who observed that the old man could not stoop without great difficulty, stayed behind the rest of her companions and collected the halfpence which they had thrown to him and put them into his hat he began to tell his story over again to her and she stayed so long listening to it that her companions had turned the corner of the street and were out of sight she looked about in great distress and i never shall forget the pathetic voice with which she said oh what will become of me everybody will be angry with me I assured her that nobody should be angry with her, and she gave me her little hand with the utmost innocent confidence. I took her home to her schoolmistress, and I was so pleased with the beginning of this acquaintance that I was determined to cultivate it. One good acquaintance, I have heard, always leads to another. Helena introduced me to her Aunt Delacour as her best friend. Mrs. Margaret Delacour has had the goodness to let her little niece spend the holidays and all her leisure time with me, so that our acquaintance has grown into friendship. Helena has become quite one of my family, and I am sure she has become quite a different creature since she has been so much with you, cried Mrs. Delacour. Her spirits were quite broken by her mother's neglect of her. Young as she is, she has a great deal of real sensibility, but as to her mother's sensibility— at the recollection of Lady Delacour's neglect of her child, Mrs. Delacour was going again to launch forth into indignant invective, but Lady Anne stopped her by whispering, "'Take care what you say of the mother, for here is the daughter coming, and she has indeed a great deal of sensibility.' Helena and her young companions now came into the room, bringing with them the sulphurs at which they had been looking. Mamma," said little Charles Percival, we have brought the sulphurs to you, because there are some of them that I don't know. Wonderful, said Lady Anne. And what is not quite so wonderful? There are some of them that I don't know. The children spread the sulphurs upon a little table, and all the company gathered round it. Here are all the nine muses for you, said the least of the boys, who had taken his seat by Clarence Hervey at dinner. 
Here are all the muses for you, Mr. Hurley. Which do you like best? Oh, that's the tragic muse you have chosen. You don't like the tragic better than the comic muse, do you? Clarence Hervey made no answer, for he was at that instant recollecting how Belinda looked in the character of the tragic muse. Has your ladyship ever happened to meet with the young lady who has spent this winter with Lady Delacour? said Clarence to Lady Anne. I sat near her one night at the opera, said Lady Anne. She has a charming countenance. Who? Belinda Portman, do you mean? said Mrs. Delacour. I am sure if I were a young man I would not trust to the charming countenance of a young lady who is a pupil of Mrs. Stanhope's, and a friend of— Helena, my dear, shut the door. The most dissipated woman in London. Indeed, said Lady Anne. Miss Portman is in a dangerous situation, but some young people learn prudence by being placed in dangerous situations, as some young horses, I have heard Mr. Percival say, learn to be sure-footed by being left to pick their own way on bad roads. Here Mr. Percival, Dr. X, and some other gentlemen came upstairs to tea, and the conversation took another turn. Clarence Hervey endeavoured to take his share in it with his usual vivacity, but he was thinking of Belinda Portman dangerous situations, stumbling horses, etc., and he made several blunders which showed his absence of mind. "'What have you there, Mr. Hervey?' said Dr. X, looking over his shoulder. "'The tragic muse. This tragic muse seems to rival Lady Delacour in your admiration.' "'Oh,' said Clarence, smiling, "'you know I was always a votary of the muses.' "'And a favoured votary,' said Dr. X. I wish for the interests of literature that poets may always be lovers, though I cannot say that I desire lovers should always be poets. <laughs> but, Mr. Hervey, you must never marry, remember, continued Dr. X. Never, for your true poet must always be miserable. You know Petrarch tells us he would not have been happy if he could. He would not have married his mistress if it had been in his power, because then there would have been an end of his beautiful sonnets. Every one to his taste, said Clarence, for my part, I have even less ambition to imitate the heroism than hope of being inspired with the poetic genius of Petrarch. I have no wish to pass whole nights composing sonnets. I would, am I not right, Mr. Percival, infinitely rather be a slave of the ring than a slave of the lamp. Here the conversation ended. Clarence took his leave, and Mrs. Margaret Delacour said the moment he had left the room, "'Quite a different sort of young man from what I had expected to see.' End of section 9, chapter 8, recorded by Tara Mendoza, Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011. Section 10, chapter 9, of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth Section 10 Chapter 9 Advice The next morning Mr. Hervey called on Dr. X and begged that he would accompany him to Lady Delacour's. "'To be introduced to your tragic muse,' said the doctor. "'Yes,' said Mr. Hervey. I must have your opinion of her before I devote myself. My opinion? But of whom? Of Lady Delacour? No, but of a young lady whom you will see with her. Is she handsome, beautiful, and young, and young, and graceful? The most graceful person you have ever beheld. Young, beautiful, graceful. Hmm. Then the deuce take me, said Dr. X. If I give you my opinion of her, for the odds are that she has a thousand faults at least to balance these perfections. A thousand faults, a charitable allowance, said Clarence, smiling. There now, said Dr. X, touch him, and no minister so sore. To punish you for wincing at my first setting out, I promise you that if the lady have a million of faults, each of them high as huge Olympus, I will see them as with the eye of a flatterer not of a friend. "'I defy you to be so good, or so bad as your word, doctor,' said Hervey. "'You have too much wit to make a good flatterer.' 
"'And perhaps you think too much to make a good friend,' said Dr. X. "'Not so,' said Clarence. "'I would at any time rather be cut by a sharp knife than by a blunt one. "'But, my dear doctor, I hope you will not be prejudiced against Belinda, "'merely because she is with Lady Delacour, for to my certain knowledge she is not under her ladyship's influence. She judges and acts for herself, of which I have had an instance. Very possibly, interrupted Dr. X, but before we go any farther, will you please to tell me of what Belinda you are talking? Belinda Portman. I forgot that I had not told you. Miss Portman, a niece of Mrs. Stanhope's? Yes, but do not be prejudiced against her on that account, said Clarence eagerly though I was at first myself. Then you will excuse my following your example instead of your precepts. No, said Clarence, for my precepts are far better than my example. Lady Delacour received Dr. X most courteously, and thanked Mr. Hervey for introducing to her a gentleman with whom she had long desired to converse. Dr. X had a great literary reputation, and she saw that he was a perfectly well-bred man, Consequently, she was ambitious of winning his admiration. She perceived also that he had considerable influence with Clarence Hervey, and this was a sufficient reason to make her wish for his good opinion. Belinda was particularly pleased with his manners and conversation. She saw that he paid her much attention, and she was desirous that he should think favorably of her, but she had the good sense and good taste to avoid a display of her abilities and accomplishments. A sensible man, who has any knowledge of the world and talents for conversation, can easily draw out the knowledge of those with whom he converses. Dr. X possessed this power in a superior degree. Well, cried Clarence when their visit was over, what is your opinion of Lady Delacour? I am blasted with excess of light, said the doctor. Her ladyship is certainly very brilliant, said Clarence. But I hope that Miss Portman did not overpower you. No. I turned my eyes from Lady Delacour upon Miss Portman, as a painter turns his eyes upon mild green to rest them, when they have been dazzled by glaring colours. She yields her charms of mind with sweet delay. I was afraid, said Hervey, that you might think her manners too reserved and cold. They are certainly become more so than they used to be. But so much the better. By and by we shall find beautiful flowers spring up from beneath the snow. "'A very poetical hope,' said Dr. X. "'But in judging of the human character, "'we must not entirely trust to analogies and illusions "'taken from the vegetable creation.' "'What?' cried Clarence Hervey, "'looking eagerly in the doctor's eyes. "'What do you mean? "'I am afraid you do not approve of Belinda. "'Your fears are almost as precipitate as your hopes. "'My good sir, but to put you out of pain—' I will tell you that I approve of all I have seen of this young lady, but that it is absolutely out of my power to form a decisive judgment of a woman's temper and character in the course of a single morning visit. Women, you know, as well as men, often speak with one species of enthusiasm, and act with another. I must see your Belinda act. I must study her, before I can give you any final judgment. Lady Delacour has honoured me with her commands to go to her as often as possible— for your sake, my dear Hervey, I shall obey your ladyship most punctually, that I may have frequent opportunities of seeing your Miss Portman. Clarence expressed his gratitude with much energy. For this instance of the doctor's friendship, Belinda, who had been entertained by Dr. X's conversation during this first visit, was more and more delighted with his company as she became more and more acquainted with his understanding and character. She felt that he unfolded her powers, and that with the greatest politeness and address he raised her confidence in herself, without ever descending to flattery. By degrees she learned to look upon him as a friend. She imparted to him with great ingenuousness her opinions on various subjects, and was both amused and instructed by his observations on the characters and manners of the company who frequented Lady Delacour's assemblies. She did not judge of the doctor's sincerity merely by the kindness he showed her, but by his conduct toward others. One night, at a select party at Lady Delacour's, a Spanish gentleman was amusing the company with some anecdotes to prove the extraordinary passion which some of his countrymen formerly showed for the game of chess. He mentioned families in which unfinished games bequeathed by will had descended from father to son, and where victory was doubtful for upwards of a century. 
Mr. Hervey observed that gaining a battle was, at that time, so common to the court of Spain, that a victory at chess seemed to confer more eclat for that an abbe, by losing adroitly a game at chess to the Spanish minister, obtained a cardinal's hat. The foreigner was flattered by the manner in which Hervey introduced this slight circumstance, and he directed to him his conversation, speaking in French and Italian successively. He was sufficiently skilled in both languages, but Clarence spoke them better. Till he appeared, the foreigner was the principal object of attention, but he was soon eclipsed by Mr. Hervey. Nothing amusing or instructive that could be said upon the game of chess escaped him, and the literary ground which the slow dawn would have taken some hours to go regularly over, our hero traversed in a few minutes. From Twist to Vida, from Irwin to Sir William Jones, from Spain to India, he passed with admirable celerity, and seized all that could adorn his course from Indian antiquities or Asiatic researches. By this display of knowledge, he surprised even his friend Dr. X. The ladies admired his taste as a poet, the gentlemen his accuracy as a critic. Lady Delacour loudly applauded, and Belinda silently approved. Clarence was elated. The Spanish gentleman, to whom he had just quoted a case in point from Vida's Scacchia, asked him if he were as perfect in the practice as in the theory of the game. Clarence was too proud of excelling in everything to decline the Spaniard's challenge. They sat down to chess. Lady Delacour, as they ranged the pieces on the board, cried, "'Whoever wins shall be my knight, and a silver chessman shall be his prize. Was it not Queen Elizabeth who gave a silver chessman to one of her courtiers as a mark of her royal favour? I am ashamed to imitate such a pedantic coquette, but since I have said it, how can I retract?' "'Impossible, impossible!' cried Clarence Hervey. "'A silver chessman be our prize, and if I win it, like the gallant Raleigh, I will wear it in my cap, and what proud Essex shall dare to challenge it!' The combat now began. The spectators were silent. Clarence made an error in his first move, for his attention was distracted by seeing Belinda behind his adversary's chair. The Spaniard was deceived by this mistake into a contemptuous opinion of his opponent. Belinda changed her place. Clarence recovered his presence of mind, and convinced him that he was not a man to be despised. The combat was long doubtful, but at length, to the surprise of all present, Clarence Hervey was victorious. Exulting in his success, he looked round for Lady Delacour, from whom he expected the honours of his triumph. She had left the room but soon she returned, dressed in the character of Queen Elizabeth, in which she had once appeared at a masquerade, with a large ruff and all the costume of the times. Clarence Hervey, throwing himself at her feet, addressed her in that high-flown style which Her Majesty was wont to hear from the gallant Raleigh, or the accomplished Essex. Soon the coquetry of the Queen entirely conquered her prudery, and the favoured courtier, evidently elated by his situation, was as enthusiastic as Her Majesty's most insatiable vanity could desire. The characters were well supported, both the actor and actress were highly animated, and seemed so fully possessed by their parts as to be insensible to the comments that were made upon the scene. Clarence Hervey was first recalled to himself by the deep blush which he saw on Belinda's cheek, when Queen Elizabeth addressed her as one of her maids of honour, of whom she affected to be jealous. He was conscious that he had been hurried by the enthusiasm of the moment farther than he either wished or intended. It was difficult to recede when Her Majesty seemed disposed to advance, but Sir Walter Raleigh, with much presence of mind, turned to the foreigner whom he accosted as the Spanish ambassador. "'Your Excellency sees,' said he, "'how this great queen turns the heads of her faithful subjects, and afterwards has the art of paying them with nothing but words.' Has the new world afforded you any coin half so valuable? The Spanish gentleman's grave replies to this playful question gave a new turn to the conversation, and relieved Clarence Hervey from his embarrassment. Lady Delacour, though still in high spirits, was easily diverted to other objects. She took the Spaniard with her to the next room, to show him a picture of Mary, Queen of Scots. Pause. 
The company followed her. Clarence Hervey remained with Dr. X and Belinda, who had just asked the doctor to teach her the moves at chess. "'Lady Delacour has charming spirits,' said Clarence Hervey. "'They inspire everybody with gaiety.' "'Everybody! They incline me more to melancholy than mirth,' said Dr. X. "'These high spirits do not seem quite natural. "'The vivacity of youth and of health, Miss Portman, always charms me. "'But this gaiety of Lady Delacour's does not appear to me "'that of a sound mind in a sound body. "'The doctor's penetration went so near the truth "'that Belinda, afraid of betraying her friend's secrets, "'never raised her eyes from the chessboard whilst he spoke, "'but went on setting up the fallen castles and bishops and kings "'with expeditious diligence.' "'You are putting the bishop into the place of the night,' said Clarence. "'Lady Delacour,' continued the doctor, "'seems to be in a perpetual fever, "'either of mind or body, I cannot tell which. "'And as a professional man, "'I really have some curiosity to determine the question. "'If I could feel her pulse, I could instantly decide. "'But I have heard her say that she has a horror "'against having her pulse felt, "'and a lady's horror is invincible.' "'By reason, but not by address,' said Clarence. And "'I can tell you a method of counting her pulse without her knowing it, "'without her seeing it, without your seeing her.' "'Indeed,' said Dr. X, smiling, "'that may be a useful secret in my profession. "'Pray, impart it to me, you who excel in everything.' "'Are you in earnest, Mr. Hervey?' said Belinda. "'Perfectly in earnest. "'My secret is quite simple.' Look through the door at the shadow of Queen Elizabeth's ruff. Observe how it vibrates. The motion, as well as the figure, is magnified in the shadow. Cannot you count every pulsation distinctly? I can, said Dr. X, and I give you credit for making an ingenious use of a trifling observation. The doctor paused and looked round. Those people cannot hear what we are saying, I believe. Oh, no, said Belinda. They are intent upon themselves. Dr. X fixed his eyes mildly upon Clarence Hervey, and exclaimed in an earnest, friendly tone, "'What a pity, Mr. Hervey, that a young man of your talent and acquirements, a man who might be anything, should pardon the expression, choose to be nothing, should waste upon petty objects powers suited to the greatest, should lend his soul to every contest for frivolous superiority.' when the same energy concentrated might ensure honourable pre-eminence among the first men in his country. Shall he, who might not only distinguish himself in any science or situation, who might not only acquire personal fame, but, oh, far more noble motive, who might be permanently useful to his fellow-creatures, content himself with being the evanescent amusement of a drawing-room? Shall one who might be great in public, or happy in private life, waste in this deplorable manner the best years of his existence? Time that can never be recalled? This is declamation. No, it is truth put into the strongest language that I have power to use. In the hope of making some impression, I speak from my heart, for I have a sincere regard for you, Mr. Hervey, and if I have been impertinent, you must forgive me. Forgive you? cried Clarence Hervey, taking Dr. X by the hand. I think you a real friend. You shall have the best thanks, not in words, but in actions. You have roused my ambition, and I will pursue noble ends by noble means. A few years have been sacrificed, but the lessons that they have taught me remain. I cannot, presumptuous as I am, flatter myself that my exertions can be of any material utility to my fellow creatures. But what I can do, I will, my excellent friend, if I be hereafter either successful in public or happy in private life, it is to you I shall owe it. Belinda was touched by the candour and good sense with which Clarence Hervey spoke. His character appeared in a new light. She was proud of her own judgment in having discerned his merit, and for a moment she permitted herself to feel unreproved pleasure in his company. The next morning, Sir Philip Badley and Mr. Roquefort called at Lady Delacour's. Mr. Hervey was present. Her ladyship was summoned to Mrs. Frank's, and Belinda was left with these gentlemen. "'Why, damn, Clary, 
"'You have been a lost man,' cried Sir Philip, "'never since you were drowned. Damn me! Why did you not come to dine with us that day? Now I recollect it. We were all famously merry, but for your comfort. Clarence, we missed you cursedly, and were damned sorry you ever took that unlucky jump into the Serpentine River. Damned sorry, were not we, Roquefort?' "'Oh,' said Clarence, in an ironical tone, "'you need no vouchers to convince me of the reality of your sorrow. "'You know I can never forget your jumping so courageously into the river to save the life of your friend.' "'No, oh, pooh, damn it,' said Sir Philip. "'What signifies who pulled you out? Now you are safe and sound? "'By the by, Clary, did you ever quiz that doctor as I desired you? "'No.' "'That I'm sure you didn't. "'But I think he has made a quiz of you. "'For damn me, I believe you have taken such a fancy to the old quizzical fellow "'that you can't live without him. "'Miss Portman, don't you admire Hervey's taste?' "'In this instance, I certainly do admire Mr. Hervey's taste,' said Belinda, "'for the best of all possible reasons, because it entirely agrees with my own.' "'Very extraordinary. Faith!' said Sir Philip. "'And what the devil can you find to like in him, Clary?' continued Mr. Roquefort. "'For one wouldn't be so rude to put that question to a lady. Ladies, you know, are never to be questions about their likings and dislikings. Some have pet dogs, some have pet cats. Then why not a pet quiz?' "'Ha, ha, 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 that's a good one, Roquefort. A pet quiz. <laughs> Dr. X. "'Shall be Miss Portman's pet quiz. "'Put it about, put it about, Roquefort,' continued the witty baronet, "'and he and his facetious companion continued to laugh "'as long as they possibly could at this happy hit. "'Belinda, without being in the least discomposed by their insolent folly, "'as soon as they had finished laughing, "'very coolly observed that she could have no objection "'to give her reasons for preferring Dr. X's company, "'but for fear they might give offence to Sir Philip and his friends.' She then defended the doctor with so much firmness, and yet with so much propriety, that Clarence Hervey was absolutely enchanted with her, and with his own penetration in having discovered her real character, notwithstanding her being Mrs. Stanhope's niece. "'I never argue for my part,' cried Roquefort. "'Pon honour, tis a deal too much trouble. A lady, a handsome lady, I mean, is always in the right with me. But, as to you, Hervey—' said Sir Philip. "'Damn me! Do you know, my boy, that our club has come to a determination to blackball you, if you keep company with that famous doctor? Your club, Sir Philip, will do me an honour by such an ostracism.' "'Ostracism?' repeated Sir Philip. "'In plain English, does that mean that you choose to be blackballed by us? Why, damn it, Clary, you'll be nobody.' "'But follow your own genius. Damn me if I take it upon me to understand your men of genius. "'They are in the Serpentine River one day, and in the clouds the next. "'So fare ye well, Clary. I expect to see you a doctor of physic, or a Methodist parson, soon. "'Damn me if I don't. So fare ye well, Clary. Is Black Bar your last word, or will you think better on it, and give up the doctor?' I can never give up Dr. X's friendship. I would sooner be blackballed by every club in London. The good lesson you gave me, Sir Philip, the day I was fool enough to jump into the Serpentine River, has made me wiser for life. I know, for I have felt the difference between real friends and fashionable acquaintance. Give up Dr. X? Never, never. Then fare you well, Clary, said Sir Philip. You're no longer one of us. "'Then fare ye well, Clary. You're no longer the man for me,' said Roquefort. "'Don't be sin don't move,' said Clarence, and so they parted. As they left the room, Clarence Hervey involuntarily turned to Belinda, and he thought that he read, in her ingenuous animated countenance, full approbation of his conduct. "'Psst! Are they gone? Quite gone?' said Lady Delacour, entering the room from an adjoining apartment. "'They have stayed an inconscionable time. "'How much I am obliged to Mrs. Franks for detaining me. "'I have escaped their vapid impertinence, and in truth, "'this morning I have such a multiplicity of business "'that I have scarcely a moment even for wit and Clarence Hervey.' 
Belinda, my dear, will you have the charity to look over some of these letters for me, which, as Mariette tells me, have been lying in my writing-table this week, expecting most unreasonably that I should have the grace to open them? We are always punished for our indolence, as your friend Dr. X said the other day. If we suffer business to accumulate, it drifts with every ill wind like snow, till at last an avalanche of it comes down at once, and quite overwhelms us. Excuse me, Clarence, continued her ladyship, as she opened her letters. This is very rude, but I know I have secured my pardon from you by remembering your friend's wit. Wisdom, I should say. How seldom are wit and wisdom joined. They might have been joined in Lady Delacour, perhaps. There's vanity, if she had early met with such a friend as Dr. X. But it's too late now, said she with a deep sigh. Clarence Hervey heard it, and it made a great impression upon his benevolent imagination. Why too late? said he to himself. Mrs. Margaret Delacour is mistaken, if she thinks this woman wants sensibility. What have you got there, Miss Portman? said Lady Delacour taking from Belinda's hand one of the letters which she had begged her to look over. "'Something wondrous pathetic, I should guess, by your countenance. Helena Delacour! Oh, read it to yourself, my dear. A schoolgirl's letters is a thing I abominate. I make it a rule never to read Helena's epistles. "'Let me prevail upon your ladyship to make an exception to the general rule, then,' said Belinda. "'I can assure you—' This is not a common schoolgirl's letter. Miss Delacour seems to inherit her mother's eloquence de billet. Miss Portman seems to possess by inheritance, by instinct, by magic or otherwise, powers of persuasion which no one can resist. There's compliment for compliment, my dear. Is there anything half so well turned in Helena's letter? Really, tis vastly well, continued her ladyship as she read the letter. Where did the little gypsy learn to write so charmingly? I protest I should like, of all things, to have her at home with me this summer. The 21st of June. Well, after the birthday, I shall have time to think about it. But then, we shall be going out of town, and at Harrogate I should not know what to do with her. She had better, much better, go to her humdrum Aunt Margaret's, as she always does. She is a fixture in Grosvenor Square. These stationary good people, these zoophyte friends, are sometimes very convenient, and Mrs. Margaret Delacour is the most unexceptionable zoophyte in the creation. She has, it is true, an antipathy to me, because I am of such a different nature from herself, but then her antipathy does not extend to my offspring. She is kind beyond measure to Helena, on purpose, I believe, to provoke me. Now I provoke her, in my turn, by never being provoked, and she saves me a vast deal of trouble, for which she is overpaid by the pleasure of abusing me. This is the way of the world, Clarence. Don't look so serious. You are not come yet to daughters and sons, and schools and holidays, and all the evils of domestic life. Evils? repeated Clarence Hervey in a tone which surprised her ladyship. She looked immediately with a significant smile at Belinda. "'Why do you not echo evils, Miss Portman?' "'Pray, Lady Delacour,' interrupted Clarence Hervey, "'when do you go to Harrogate?' "'What a sudden transition!' said Lady Delacour. "'What association of ideas could just at that instant take you to Harrogate? "'When do I go to Harrogate? "'Immediately after the birthday, I believe we shall. "'I advise you to be of the party.' "'Your ladyship does me a great deal of honour," said Hervey. "'I shall, if it be possible, do myself the honour of attending you.' And soon after this arrangement was made, Mr. Hervey took his leave. "'Well, my dear, are you still poring over that letter of Helena's?' said Lady Delacour to Miss Portman. "'I fancy your ladyship did not quite finish it,' said Belinda. "'No. I saw something about the Laverian Museum.' and a swallow's nest in a pair of garden shears, and I was afraid I was to have a catalogue of curiosities, for which I have little taste and less time. You did not see, then, what Miss Delacour says of the lady who took her to the museum? Not I. What lady? Her Aunt Margaret. No. Mrs. Margaret Delacour, she says, has been so ill for some time past that she goes nowhere but to Lady Anne Percival's. Poor woman, said Lady Delacour. She will die soon and then I shall have Elena upon my hands, 
unless some other kind friend takes a fancy to her. Who is this lady that has carried her to the Leverian Museum? Lady Anne Percival, of whom she speaks with so much gratitude and affection, that I quite long— Lord bless me, interrupted Lady Delacour. Lady Anne Percival! Helena has mentioned this Lady Anne Percival to me before. I recollect in some of her letters. Then you did read some of her letters? Half! I never read more than half upon my word, said Lady Delacour, laughing. "'Why will you delight in making yourself appear less good than you are, my dear Lady Delacour?' said Belinda, taking her hand. "'Because I hate to be like other people,' said her ladyship, "'who delight in making themselves appear better than they are. "'But I was going to tell you that I do believe I did provoke Percival by marrying Lord Delacour. "'I cannot tell you how much this Mia delights me.' I was sure that the man has a lively remembrance of me, or else he would never make his wife take so much notice of my daughter. Surely your ladyship does not think, said Belinda, that a wife is a being whose actions are necessarily governed by a husband. Not necessarily, but accidentally. When a lady accidentally sets up for being a good wife, she must, of course, love, honour, and obey. Now you understand— I am not in the least obliged to Lady Anne for her kindness to Helena, because it all goes under the head of obedience in my imagination, and her ladyship is paid for it by an ascension of character. She has the reward of having it said, Oh, Lady Anne Percival is the best wife in the world. Oh, Lady Anne Percival is quite a pattern woman. I hate pattern women. I hope I may never see Lady Anne, for I'm sure I should detest her beyond all things living. Mrs. Luttridge not excepted. Belinda was surprised, and shocked at the malignant vehemence with which her ladyship uttered these words. It was in vain, however, that she remonstrated on the injustice of predetermining to detest Lady Anne, merely because she had shown kindness to Helena, and because she bore a high character. Lady Delacour was a woman who never listened to reason, or who listened to it only that she might parry it by wit. Upon this occasion her wit had not its usual effect upon Miss Portman. Instead of entertaining, it disgusted her. "'You have called me your friend, Lady Delacour,' said she. "'I should but ill deserve that name, if I had not the courage to speak the truth to you, if I had not the courage to tell you when I think you are wrong. "'But I have not the courage to hear you, my dear.' said Lady Delacour, stopping her ears. "'So your conscience may be at ease. You may suppose that you have said everything that is wise and good, and proper and sublime, and that you deserve to be called the best of friends. You shall enjoy the office of censor to Lady Delacour, and welcome. But remember, it is a sinecure place, though I will pay you with my love and esteem to any extent you please. You sigh for my folly. Alas, my dear, tis hardly worth while. My follies will soon be at an end. Of what use could even the wisdom of Solomon be to me now? If you have had any humanity, you will not force me to reflect, whilst I yet live. I must keep it up, with incessant dissipation. The teetotum keeps upright only while it spins. So let us talk of the birth-night, or the new play that we are to see to-night, or the ridiculous figure Lady H. made at the concert, or let us talk of Harrogate, or what you will." Pity succeeded to disgust, and displeasure in Belinda's mind, and she could hardly refrain from tears, whilst she saw this unhappy creature, with forced smiles, endeavour to hide the real anguish of her soul. She could only say, "'But, my dear Lady Delacour, do not you think that your little Helena, who seems to have a most affectionate disposition, would add to your happiness at home?' "'Her affectionate disposition can be nothing to me,' said Lady Delacour. Belinda felt a hot tear drop upon her hand, which lay upon Lady Delacour's lap. "'Can you wonder,' continued her ladyship, hastily wiping away the tear which she had let fall, "'can you wonder that I should talk of detesting Lady Anne Percival? You see she has robbed me of the affections of my child. Helena asks to come home, yes, but how does she ask it? Coldly, formally, as a duty. But look at the end of her letter. I have read it all, every bitter word of it. I have tasted how differently she writes. Look, even at the flowing hand, the moment she begins to speak of Lady Anne Percival, then her soul breaks out. 
Lady Anne has offered to take her to Oakley Park. She should be extremely happy to go, if I please. Yes, let her go. Let her go as far from me as possible. Let her never, never see her wretched mother more. Write, said Lady Delacour, turning hastily to Belinda. Write in my name, and tell her to go to Oakley Park, and to be happy. But why should you take it for granted that she cannot be happy with you? said Belinda. Let us see her. Let us try the experiment. No, said Lady Delacour. No, it is too late. I will never condescend in my last moments to beg for that affection to which it may be thought I have forfeited my natural claim. Pride, anger, and sorrow struggled in her countenance as she spoke. She turned her face from Belinda and walked out of the room with dignity. Nothing remains for me to do, thought Belinda, but to soothe this haughty spirit. All other hope I see is vain. At this moment, Clarence Hervey, who had no suspicion that the gay, brilliant Lady Delacour was sinking into the grave, had formed a design worthy of his ardent and benevolent character. The manner in which her ladyship had spoken of his friend Dr. X, the sigh which she gave at the reflection that she might have been a very different character if she had early had a sensible friend, made a great impression upon Mr. Hervey. Till then he had merely considered her ladyship as an object of amusement, and an introduction to high life, but he now felt so much interested for her that he determined to exert all his influence to promote her happiness. He knew that influence to be considerable, not that he was either coxcomb or dupe enough to imagine that Lady Delacour was in love with him. He was perfectly sensible that her only wish was to obtain his admiration, and he resolved to show her that it could no longer be secured without deserving his esteem. Clarence Hervey was a thoroughly generous young man, capable of making the greatest sacrifices when encouraged by the hope of doing good. He determined to postpone the declaration of his attachment to Belinda, that he might devote himself entirely to his new project. His plan was to wean Lady Delacour by degrees from dissipation, by attaching her to her daughter, and to Lady Anne Percival. He was sanguine in all his hopes, and rapid but not unthinking in all his decisions. From Lady Delacour he went immediately to Dr. X, to whom he communicated his designs. "'I applaud your benevolent intentions,' said the doctor. "'But have you really the presumption to hope that an ingenuous young man of four-and-twenty can reform a veteran coquette of four-and-thirty?' "'Lady Delacour is not yet thirty, said Clarence. "'But the older she is, the better the chance of her giving up a losing game. She has an admirable understanding.' and she will soon, I mean, as soon as she is acquainted with Lady Anne Percival, discover that she has mistaken the road to happiness. All the difficulty will be to make them fairly acquainted with each other, for this, my dear doctor, I must trust to you. Do you prepare Lady Anne to tolerate Lady Delacour's faults, and I will prepare Lady Delacour to tolerate Lady Anne's virtues? You have generously taken the more difficult task of the two, replied Dr. X. Well, we shall see what can be done. After the birthday, Lady Delacour talks of going to Harrogate, you know. Oakley Park is not far from Harrogate, so they will have frequent opportunities of meeting. But take my word for it, nothing can be done till after the birthday, for Lady Delacour's head is at present full of crape petticoats and horses and carriages, and a certain Mrs. Luttridge, whom she hates, with a hatred passing that of women. End of Section 10 Chapter 9 Recording by Tara Mendoza Phoenix, Arizona, September 2011. Chapter 10 of Belinda. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Belinda by Maria Edgeworth. CHAPTER Ten, THE MYSTERIOUS BOUDOIR Accustomed to study human nature, Dr. X had acquired peculiar sagacity in judging of character. Notwithstanding the address with which Lady Delacour concealed the real motives for her apparently thoughtless conduct, he quickly discovered that the hatred of Mrs. Lettridge was her ruling passion. Above nine years of continual warfare had exasperated the tempers of both parties, and no opportunities of manifesting their mutual antipathy were ever neglected. 
extravagantly as Lady Delacour loved admiration, the highest possible degree of positive praise was insipid to her taste if it did not imply some superiority over the woman whom she considered as a perpetual rival. Now it had been said by the coachmaker that Mrs. Luttridge would sport a most elegant new vis-a-vis -vis on the king's birthday. Lady Delacour was immediately ambitious to outshine her in equipage, and it was this paltry ambition which made her condescend to all the meanness of the transaction by which she obtained Miss Portman's draft and Clarence Hervey's two hundred guineas. The great, the important day, at length arrived. Her ladyship's triumph in the morning at the drawing-room was complete. Mrs. Lettridge's dress, Mrs. Lettridge's vis-a-vis, Mrs. Lettridge's horses were nothing, absolutely nothing, in comparison with Lady Delacour's. Her ladyship enjoyed the full exultation of vanity, and at night she went in high spirits to the ball. "'Oh, my dearest Belinda,' said she, as she left her dressing-room, "'how terrible a thing it is that you cannot go with me. None of the joys of this life are without alloy. T'would be too much to see in one night Mrs. Lettridge's mortification and my Belinda's triumph. Adieu, my love. We shall live to see another birthday. It is to be hoped. Marriott, my drops. Oh, I have taken them. Belinda, after her ladyship's departure, retired to the library. Her time passed so agreeably during Lady Delacour's absence that she was surprised when she heard the clock strike twelve. "'Is it possible,' thought she, "'that I have spent two hours by myself in a library "'without being tired of my existence? "'How different are my feelings now "'from what they would have been in the same circumstances six months ago? "'I should then have thought the loss of a birthnight ball "'a mighty trial of temper. "'It is singular that my having spent a winter "'with one of the most dissipated women in England "'should have sobered my mind so completely.' If I had never seen the utmost extent of the pleasures of the world, as they are called, my imagination might have misled me to the end of my life. But now I can judge from my own experience, and I am convinced that the life of a fine lady would never make me happy. Dr. X told me the other day that he thinks me formed for something better, and he is incapable of flattery. The idea of Clarence Hervey was so intimately connected with that of his friend, that Miss Portman could seldom separate them in her imagination, and she was just beginning to reflect upon the manner in which Clarence looked, whilst he declared to Sir Philip Baddeley that he would never give up Dr. X, when she was startled by the entrance of Marriott. "'Oh, Miss Portman, what shall we do? What shall we do? My lady, my poor lady!' cried she. "'What is the matter?' said Belinda. "'The horses, the young horses!' Oh, I wish my lady had never seen them. Oh, my lady, my poor lady, what will become of her? It was some minutes before Belinda could obtain from Marriott any intelligible account of what had happened. All I know, ma'am, is what James has just told me, said Marriott. My lady gave the coachman orders upon no account to let Mrs. Luttridge's carriage get before hers. Mrs. Luttridge's coachman would not give up the point either. My lady's horses were young and ill-broke, they tell me, and there was no managing of them no ways. The carriages got somehow across one another, and my lady was overturned and all smashed to atoms. Oh, ma'am, continued Marriott, if it had not been for Mr. Hervey, they say, my lady would never have got out of the crowd alive. He's bringing her home in his own carriage, God bless him. But is Lady Delacour hurt? cried Belinda. "'She must, to be sure she must, ma'am,' cried Marriott, putting her hand upon her bosom. "'But let her be ever so much hurt. My lady will keep it to herself. The footmen swear she did not give a scream, not a single scream. So it's their opinion she was no ways hurt. But that, I know, can't be. And indeed, they are thinking so much about the carriage that they can't give one rational account of anything. And as for myself... I'm sure I'm in such a flutter. Lord knows I advised my lady not to go with the young horses no later than— Hark! cried Belinda. Here they are. She ran downstairs instantly. The first object that she saw was Lady Delacour in convulsions. 
The street door was open, the hall was crowded with servants. Belinda made her way through them, and in a calm voice requested that Lady Delacour might immediately be brought to her own dressing-room, and that she should there be left to Marriott's care and hers. Mr. Hervey assisted in carrying Lady Delacour. She came to her senses as they were taking her upstairs. "'Set me down, set me down,' she exclaimed. "'I am not hurt. I am quite well. Where's Marriott? Where's Miss Portman?' "'Here we are. You shall be carried quite safely. Trust to me,' said Belinda, in a firm tone, "'and do not struggle.' Lady Delacour submitted. She was in agonizing pain, but her fortitude was so great that she never uttered a groan. It was the constraint which she had put upon herself by endeavouring not to scream which threw her into convulsions. "'She is hurt. I am sure she is hurt, though she will not acknowledge it,' cried Clarence Hervey. "'My ankle is sprained, that's all,' said Lady Delacour. "'Lay me on this sofa, and leave me to Belinda.' "'What's all this?' cried Lord Delacour, staggering into the room. He was much intoxicated, and in this condition had just come home, as they were carrying Lady Delacour upstairs. He could not be made to understand the truth, but as soon as he heard Clarence Hervey's voice, he insisted upon going up to his wife's dressing-room. It was a very unusual thing, but neither Champfort nor any one else could restrain him the moment that he had formed this idea. He forced his way into the room. "'What's all this? Colonel Lawless?' said he, addressing himself to Clarence Hervey, whom, in the confusion of his mind, he mistook for the colonel, the first object of his jealousy. "'Colonel Lawless,' cried his lordship, "'you are a villain. I always knew it.' "'Softly, she is in great pain, my lord,' said Belinda, catching Lord Delacour's arm just as he was going to strike Clarence Hervey. She led him to the sofa where Lady Delacour lay, and uncovering her ankle, which was much swelled, showed it to him. His lordship, who was a humane man, was somewhat moved by this appeal to his remaining senses, and he began roaring as loud as he possibly could for arquebusade. Lady Delacour rested her head upon the back of the sofa. Her hands moved with convulsive twitches. She was perfectly silent. Marriott was in a great bustle, running backwards and forwards for she knew not what, and continually repeating, "'I wish nobody would come in here but Miss Portman and me. My lady says nobody must come in. Lord bless me, my lord here, too!' "'Have you any arquebusade, Marriott?' "'Arquebusade for your lady directly,' cried his lordship, following her to the door of the boudoir, where she was going for some drops. "'Oh, my lord, you can't come in, I assure you, my lord. There's nothing here, my lord, nothing of the sort,' said Marriott, setting her back against the door. Her terror and embarrassment instantly recalled all the jealous suspicions of Lord Delacour. "'Woman,' cried he, "'I will see whom you have in this room.' You have someone concealed there, and I will go in. Then, with brutal oaths, he dragged Marriott from the door, and snatched the key from her struggling hand. Lady Delacour started up, and gave a scream of agony. My lord! Lord Delacour! cried Belinda, springing forward. Hear me! Lord Delacour stopped short. Tell me, then, cried Lord Delacour. Is not a lover of Lady Delacour's concealed there? "'No, no, no,' answered Belinda. "'Then a lover of Miss Portman,' said Lord Delacour. "'Gad, we have hit it now, I believe.' "'Believe whatever you please, my lord,' said Belinda hastily. "'But give me the key.' Clarence Hervey drew the key from Lord Delacour's hand, gave it to Miss Portman without looking at her, and immediately withdrew. Lord Delacour followed him with a sort of drunken laugh and no one remained in the room but Marriott, Belinda, and Lady Delacour. Marriott was so much fluttered, as she said, that she could do nothing. Miss Portman locked the room door and began to undress Lady Delacour, who lay motionless. "'Are we by ourselves?' said Lady Delacour, opening her eyes. "'Yes. Are you much hurt?' said Belinda. "'Oh, you are a charming girl,' said Lady Delacour. Who would have thought you had so much presence of mind and courage? Have you the key safe? Here it is, said Belinda, producing it, and she repeated her question. Are you much hurt? 
"'I am not in pain now,' said Lady Delacour, "'but I have suffered terribly. "'If I could get rid of all this finery, "'if you could put me to bed, I could sleep, perhaps.' Whilst Belinda was undressing Lady Delacour, she shrieked several times, but between every interval of pain she repeated, "'I shall be better to-morrow.' As soon as she was in bed, she desired Marriott to give her double her usual quantity of laudanum, for that all the inclination which she had felt to sleep was gone, and that she could not endure the shooting pains that she felt in her breast. "'Leave me alone with your lady, Marriott,' said Miss Portman, taking the bottle of laudanum from her trembling hand, and go to bed, for I am sure you are not able to sit up any longer. As she spoke, she took Marriott into the adjoining dressing-room. Oh, dear Miss Portman, said Marriott, who was sincerely attached to her lady, and who at this instant forgot all her jealousies and all her love of power. I'll do anything you ask me, but pray let me stay in the room, though I know I'm quite helpless. It will be too much for you to be here all night by yourself. The convulsions may take my lady. What shrieks she gives every now and then! And nobody knows what's the matter but ourselves, and everybody in the house is asking me why a surgeon is not sent for if my lady is so much hurt. Oh, I can't answer for it to my conscience to have kept the matter secret so long. For to be sure, a physician, if had in time, might have saved my lady. But now nothing can save her and here Marriott burst into tears. "'Why don't you give me the laudanum?' cried Lady Delacour, in a loud, peremptory voice. "'Give it to me instantly!' "'No,' said Miss Portman firmly. "'Hear me, Lady Delacour. You must allow me to judge, for you know that you are not in a condition to judge for yourself. Or rather you must allow me to send for a physician who may judge for both of us.' "'A physician!' cried Lady Delacour. "'Never, never! I charge you, let no physician be sent for. Remember your promise. You cannot betray me. You will not betray me.' "'No,' said Belinda. "'Of that I have given sufficient proof. But you will betray yourself. It is already known by your servants that you have been hurt by the overturn of your carriage.' If you do not let either a surgeon or physician see you, it will excite surprise and suspicion. It is not in your power when violent pain seizes you to refrain from— It is, interrupted Lady Delacour. Not another scream shall you hear. Only do not, do not, my dear Belinda, send for a physician. You will throw yourself again into convulsions, said Belinda. Marriott, you see, has lost all command of herself. I shall not have strength to manage you. Perhaps I may lose my presence of mind. I cannot answer for myself. Your husband may desire to see you. No danger of that, said Lady Delacour. Tell him my ankle is sprained. Tell him I am bruised all over. Tell him anything you will. He will not trouble himself any more about me. He will forget all that past tonight by the time he is sober. "'Oh, give me the laudanum, dearest Belinda, and say no more about physicians.' It was in vain to reason with Lady Delacour. Belinda attempted to persuade her. "'For my sake, dear Lady Delacour,' said she, "'let me send for Dr. X. He is a man of honour. Your secret will be perfectly safe with him.' "'He will tell it to Clarence Hervey,' said Lady Delacour. "'Of all men living, I would not send for Dr. X.' I will not see him if he comes. Then, said Belinda, calmly, but with a fixed determination of countenance, I must leave you to-morrow morning. I must return to Bath. Leave me? Remember your promise. Circumstances have occurred about which I have made no promise, said Belinda. I must leave you unless you will now give me your permission to send for Dr. X. Lady Delacour hesitated. You see, continued Belinda, that I am in earnest. When I am gone, you will have no friend left. When I am gone, your secret will inevitably be discovered, for without me, Marriott will not have sufficient strength of mind to keep it. Do you think we might trust Dr. X? said Lady Delacour. I am sure you may trust him, said Belinda with energy. I will pledge my life upon his honour. "'Then send for him, since it must be so,' said Lady Delacour. No sooner had the words passed Lady Delacour's lips 
than Belinda flew to execute her orders. Marriott recovered her senses when she heard that her ladyship had consented to send for a physician, but she declared that she could not conceive how anything less than the power of magic could have brought her lady to such a determination. Belinda had scarcely dispatched a servant for Dr. X, when Lady Delacour repented of the permission she had given, and all that could be said to pacify only irritated her temper. She became delirious. Belinda's presence of mind never forsook her. She remained quietly beside the bed, waiting for the arrival of Dr. X, and she absolutely refused admittance to the servants, who, drawn by their lady's outrageous cries, continually came to her door with offers of assistance. About four o'clock the doctor arrived, and Miss Portman was relieved from some of her anxiety. He assured her that there was no immediate danger, and he promised that the secret which she had entrusted to him should be faithfully kept. He remained with her some hours till Lady Delacour became more quiet and fell asleep, exhausted with delirious exertions. "'I think I may leave you now,' said Dr. X. But as he was going through the dressing-room, Belinda stopped him. "'Now that I have time to think of myself,' said she, "'let me consult you as my friend. "'I am not used to act entirely for myself, "'and I shall be most grateful if you will assist me with your advice. "'I hate all mysteries, "'but I feel myself bound in honour to keep the secret "'with which Lady Delacour has entrusted me. "'Last night I was so circumstanced "'that I could not extricate her ladyship "'without exposing myself to—' to suspicion. Miss Portman then related all that had passed about the mysterious door, which Lord Delacour, in his fit of drunken jealousy, had insisted upon breaking open. Mr. Hervey, continued Belinda, was present when all this happened. He seemed much surprised. I should be sorry that he should remain in an error which might be fatal to my reputation. You know a woman ought never even to be suspected. Yet how to remove this suspicion I know not, because I cannot enter into any explanation without betraying Lady Delacour. She has, I know, a peculiar dread of Mr. Hervey's discovering the truth. "'And is it possible,' cried Dr. X, "'that any woman should be so meanly selfish as thus to expose the reputation of her friend merely to preserve her own vanity from mortification?' "'Hush, don't speak so loud,' said Belinda. "'You will awaken her, and at present she is certainly more an object of pity than of indignation. "'If you will have the goodness to come with me, I will take you by a back staircase up to the mysterious boudoir. "'I am not too proud to give positive proofs of my speaking truth. "'The key of that room now lies on Lady Delacour's bed. "'It was that which she grasped in her hand during her delirium. "'She has now let it fall.' It opens both the doors of the boudoir. You shall see, added Miss Portman with a smile, that I am not afraid to let you unlock either of them. As a polite man, said Dr. X, I believe that I should absolutely refuse to take any external evidence of a lady's truth. But demonstration is unanswerable even by enemies, and I will not sacrifice your interests to the foppery of my politeness. So I am ready to follow you. The curiosity of the servants may have been excited by last night's disturbance, and I see no method so certain as that which you propose of preventing busy rumour. That goddess, let Ovid say what he pleases, was born and bred in a kitchen or a servant's hall. But, continued Dr. X, my dear Miss Portman, you will put a stop to a number of charming stories by this prudence of yours. A romance called The Mysterious Boudoir, of nine volumes at least, might be written on this subject, if you would only condescend to act like almost all other heroines, that is to say, without common sense. The doctor now followed Belinda, and satisfied himself by ocular demonstration that this cabinet was the retirement of disease and not of pleasure. It was about eight o'clock in the morning when Dr. X got home. He found Clarence Hervey waiting for him. Clarence seemed to be in great agitation, though he endeavoured, with all the power which he possessed over himself, to suppress his emotion. "'You have been to see Lady Delacour,' said he calmly. "'Is she much hurt? It was a terrible accident.' "'She has been much hurt,' said Dr. X, "'and she has been for some hours delirious. 
but ask me no more questions now, for I am asleep, and must go to bed, unless you have anything to say that can awaken me. You look as if some great misfortune has befallen you. What is the matter? Oh, my dear friend, said Hervey, taking his hand, do not jest with me. I am not able to bear your raillery in my present temper. In one word, I fear that Belinda is unworthy of my esteem. I can tell you no more, except that I am more miserable than I thought any woman could make me. You are in a prodigious hurry to be miserable, said Dr. X. Upon my word, I think you would make a mighty pretty hero in a novel. You take things very properly for granted, and, stretched out upon that sofa, you act the distracted lover vastly well. And to complete the matter, you cannot tell me why you are more miserable than ever man or hero was before. I must tell you, then, that you have still more cause for jealousy than you suspect. Aye, start. Every jealous man starts at the sound of the word jealousy. A certain symptom this of the disease. You mistake me, cried Clarence Hervey. No man is less disposed to jealousy than I am. But— But your mistress, no, not your mistress, for you have never yet declared to her your attachment. But the lady you admire will not let a drunken man unlock a door, and you immediately suppose— She has mentioned the circumstance to you, exclaimed Hervey, in a joyful tone. Then she must be innocent. Admirable reasoning. I was going to have told you just now, if you would have suffered me to speak connectedly, that you have more reason for jealousy than you suspect, for Miss Portman has actually unlocked for me, for me, look at me, the door, the mysterious door, and whilst I live, and whilst she lives, we can neither of us ever tell you the cause of the mystery. All I can tell you is that no lover is in the case, upon my honour. And now, if you should ever mistake curiosity in your own mind for jealousy, expect no pity from me. I should deserve none, said Clarence Hervey. You have made me the happiest of men. The happiest of men? No, no, keep that superlative exclamation for a future occasion. But now you behave like a reasonable creature. You deserve to hear the praises of your Belinda. I am so much charmed with her that I wish— When can I see her? interrupted Hervey. I'll go to her this instant. Gently, said Dr. X, you forget what time of the day it is. You forget that Miss Portman has been up all night, that Lady Delacour is extremely ill, and that this would be the most unseasonable opportunity you could possibly choose for your visit. To this observation Clarence Hervey assented, but he immediately seized a pen from the doctor's writing-table, and began a letter to Belinda. The doctor threw himself upon the sofa, saying, "'Waken me when you want me.' and in a few minutes he was fast asleep. "'Doctor, upon second thoughts,' said Clarence, rising suddenly, and tearing his letter down the middle, "'I cannot write to her yet. I forgot the reformation of Lady Delacour. How soon do you think she will be well? Besides, I have another reason for not writing to Belinda at present. You must know, my dear doctor, that I have, or had, another mistress.' "'Another mistress, indeed!' cried Dr. X, trying to waken himself. "'Good heavens, I do believe you've been asleep. "'I do believe I have. "'But is it possible that you could fall sound asleep in that time?' "'Very possible,' said the doctor. "'What is there so extraordinary in a man's falling asleep? "'Men are apt to sleep some time within the four-and-twenty hours, "'unless they have half a dozen mistresses to keep them awake, "'as you seem to have, my good friend.' A servant now came into the room with a letter that had just arrived expressed from the country for Dr. X. "'This is another affair,' cried he, rousing himself. The letter required the doctor's immediate attendance. He shook hands with Clarence Hervey. "'My dear friend, I am really concerned that I cannot stay to hear the history of your six mistresses, but you see that this is an affair of life and death.' "'Farewell,' said Clarence. "'I have not six. I have only three goddesses, even if you count Lady Delacour for one. But I really wanted your advice in good earnest. If your case be desperate, you can write, cannot you? Direct to me at Horton Hall, Cambridge. In the meantime, as far as general rules go, I can give you my advice gratis, in the formula of an old Scotch song. Tis good to be merry and wise, tis good to be honest and true. "'Tis good to be off with the old love before you be on with the new. End of chapter 10 
Recording by Mimi Wong.